a very great pleasure to welcome everybody to this two-day online event. Uh, I've incorporated plenty of pauses and uh, comfort breaks, as they say, so hopefully it won't be too arduous and uh, demanding on the eyes and the back. Um, I notice a lot of unfamiliar faces in the audience, or other names, I should say, at this point in time. Um, so I would like, if I may, to start with a brief introduction to the organization under whose aegis this event is taking place. As you will know, it's called Insiders Outsiders. The subtitle of the project was Refugees from Nazi Europe and their contribution to British culture. I, it was my baby, my idea, uh, way back in late uh, 2017, I think is when I first had a little a, a, a germ of an idea, as it were, that this could become a really, you know, sort of fruitful cultural project. And so and so it was. Um, it took the form of a nationwide in-person event, this was pre-COVID, of course, that took place between March 2019 and March 2020. And for those of you who'd like to know more about the events that took place right across the UK, big and small, across all the different media, um, I would urge you to look at the Insiders Outsiders website, and there is a link to that on the um, uh, in the document that I uh, have had circulated to all attendees. Um, then, of course, COVID struck and everything ground or rather sort of quickly came to a halt. Uh, but one of the surprisingly positive sort of, that's the word, offshoots of COVID, of course, is the uh, emergence of a lively Zoom culture. And we did indeed go online. And again, as some of you will know, uh, this event actually takes part as, 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 as sort of under the aegis of the ongoing online events program of Insiders Outsiders, which, um, yeah, sort of runs and runs because it's such a very rich subject, though I say it myself. Um, I'd like to also just mention that actually Dartington has been in my sights, as it were, right from the very beginning. In fact, I do remember, it must have been, I think, in the spring of 2018, before the um, festival actually took place, that I visited Dartington. I happened to be in Devon anyway, and I remember going to see the then artistic uh, director, Amy Beer, and mentioned my interest in Dartington as a place of refuge. And she was interested, but you know how it is, some things happen, some things don't, and nothing actually came out of that first encounter. But just to prove that, you know, this is wonderful for me personally, because Dartington has been something I've been intrigued by for many a long year. So good. So it's wonderful to know that we've got a good audience, that uh, we have such a rich programme ahead of us. Before carrying on, I'd like to thank a few key players, as it were. On the financial side of things, I'd like to offer my thanks to the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art, to the Shorish Charitable Trust, to the Elm Grant Trust, and also to Counterpoints Arts. And I'd like to say a little word about that, if I may. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It's a wonderful organization responsible for Refugee Week, the annual event in the UK every year. Um, and what's rather wonderful is that this, in terms of when this our event is happening, is it is actually happening at the time of the so-called Platformer Festival, which is a kind of offshoot of Counterpoints Arts, which takes place every two years in different parts of the country. And lo and behold, by serendipity, this year it's focusing on the southwest of England. And I will say that my original intention was to have this as an in situ event. How wonderful that would have been to hold it in the beautiful environment of Dartington itself. But financially and in practical terms, it was not to be. So here we are instead. But nevertheless, I do thank uh, Platforma very much for their support. And I'm proud to be part of a project which is very much about creativity uh, in relation to refugees in the present. Terribly important to me. I'd also like to thank Kevin Mount, the archivist at Dartington, who I think is, in fact, I know is in the audience today. Also Jane Fitzgerald and Rose Sorkins, who've offered initial, you know, very important moral and practical support. Tom Green of Platforma, I've already mentioned. And also Anna Nyberg, who's not only giving a talk uh, today, later today, but also has been a wonderfully supportive uh, trustee of the Insiders Outsiders Foundation, of which, which was set up to, to sort of uh, offer financial sort of backing to the Insiders Outsiders project. Um, and last but not least to Rachel Adams, who has been my wonderful IT helpmeet from the very beginning. Now, the practicalities, I'm sure you all are more than familiar with Zoom, but I would urge everybody now perhaps to turn off their cameras, if you wouldn't mind, and also to stay muted throughout. Um, the symposium is being recorded and the recording will be uploaded fairly soon, courtesy of Rachel, who I've mentioned, onto our YouTube channel. And again, I would urge those of you who are not familiar with it to have a look at past recordings of relevant events. 
Um, I suggest that you say just for purely logistical reasons that you stay logged in during the breaks. You can obviously, you know, disappear, but if you keep yourself, um, if you, sorry, I'm just looking, somebody's asking me something. Um, uh, yes, if you if you keep yourself muted and invisible um, and then simply come back uh, when we resume, I think that will be the best. Now, um, regarding questions and, and comments, and I do hope this will be a fully interactive event as far as is possible on Zoom, um, I would suggest that in the first instance, you do um, write any questions or comments you may have in the chat you all know i'm sure how to do that and then we'll see how it goes um in the first instance i or somebody else will um moderate the q and a but if it seems uh, a good idea i will ask you to unmute yourself and actually ask the question or make the comment yourselves okay um what else speakers biographies well as you will have appreciated this is a packed densely packed rich two days ahead of us so i'm not going to do the usual rather protracted introduction to each speaker but simply uh mention briefly their affiliation if you want to know more about each speaker then you go to that document that's been supplied online um and similarly for the abstracts of each uh, each paper Right. Um, I should just perhaps conclude here by saying that I'm absolutely delighted, not only that this is taking place at all, but also that we have such a range of speakers in terms of their academic, um, I wouldn't say credentials, but the sort of stages of their academic career. So we have at least two what you might call early career uh, scholars and um, some very established and uh, eminent ones as, as well. And also that the lineup is so very international again wonderful advantage of Zoom. So we have, of course, many from the UK, but also from Germany and indeed from as far away as Australia. Good. So I think now without further ado, um, let me just uh, close the list that's distracting me. And I would like Anna Naima. I'm going to uh, to unmute and make herself visible. I'm going to add a spotlight. Here she is. Um, so it's my very, very great pleasure to kick off the proceedings with a talk by Anna Naima. Now, for those of you who've done your homework and know something about Dartington, I'm sure her name will be familiar to you. Um, I can't think of a better person, Anna, than you to give us a broad contextualizing sort of introduction uh, prior to us focusing in on the refugee experience and contribution to Dartington. Uh, so Anna, I will simply say, is the, um, the author of two books that feature Dartington, but I'll mention now for reasons of, of, of time, just one in particular, which I would absolutely urge everybody to read if they haven't yet done so. It has the wonderful title of Practical Utopia, The Many Lives of Dartington Hall. So over to you, Anna. And you do, you'd like me to uh, to do the screen share, wouldn't you? So I'm going to do that. Um, sorry, yes. My yes, yes, technology that's fine. Failed. I'm going to make myself invisible and I will start screen sharing. Okay, we can. going full screen yes there, there it is okay brilliant okay. okay hello um i'm going to begin with a talk which i hope will just give a general overview of the story behind dartington um i know there are many experts here including people who um have lived on the estate so apologies if i'm saying what you already know but i hope that there'll be something new in there um uh, I thought it would be useful to start with an overview because I think that a lot of speakers are going to speak about uh, particular people who um, were at Dartington for a shorter period or they're going to talk about sort of later later parts of the estate and I hope there'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards. So Monica can we have the first uh, the next slide? So one of the two founders of Dartington was an heiress born in 1887 in New York. She was called Dorothy um, Whitney, daughter of William Collins Whitney. Dorothy's father was one of the so-called rubber barons in America. Um, think of the likes of J.D. Rockefeller or J.P. Morgan. He got incredibly rich at the turn of the century on the back of the explosive growth of the American industrial economy. One of his most lucrative ventures was a monopoly over New York's rail cars, which involved pocketing a large share of the dividends that were due to shareholders. Dorothy's mother, Flora, died when she was six and her father when she was 17 leaving her an orphan and one of the wealthiest women in New York. It's calculated that her fortune uh, today would be well worth over $200 million. Rather than settling down though to the usual round of pleasure seeking, um, Dorothy began to consider how she could use her money and her energy in a way that contributed towards the public good. Several scandals about her father's uh, corrupt practices had broken in the newspapers when she was growing up and these influenced her deeply. She would always be, always be driven in part by a sense of guilt. 
So her reforming began as um, quite traditional philanthropic work. She started volunteering at settlement houses. Um, these were sort of buildings in deprived neighborhoods where rich people would go and stay and try and improve the living conditions for the poor. Her ambitions grew bigger when she met her first husband, an American called Willard Stray Willard. Um, the two of them founded a journal called The New Republic, which is still running today. It aimed to inspire the elite to devote themselves to turning America into a more equal, united and democratic nation. Then the First World War broke out. Broke out. Willard uh, enlisted and then he died in 1918 in the influenza pandemic, which uh, killed 3% of the world's population. He was attending the Paris Peace Conference at the time. Dorothy was left at the end of the war with three young children to care for. Even so, she tried to improve society still. She helped set up the New School for Social Research, a university which again is still running today. It aimed to offer ordinary labourers a high level of education and also to harness the social sciences to social reform. But neither this nor any other of the reforming endeavours that she started felt like it was enough. Can we have the next slide? In 1921, Dorothy was visiting Cornell University. She was organizing for the construction of a hall to commemorate the, her husband. There was a knock on the door and in came an unkempt 27 year old undergraduate, postgraduate rather, from England. He was there to try to persuade her to donate, donate money to the Cosmopolitan Club, a club for international students. This was Leonard Elmhurst. He had grown up in um, Yorkshire, the second of nine children of a squire and parson. He had spent much of his life expecting to become a vicar. He studied theology at Cambridge and then he volunteered with the Young Men's Christian Association. But two of his brothers had been killed on the front line during the war and he had lost faith in a God that he felt had done nothing to stop the slaughter of his generation and in fact perhaps had perpetuated it. Like Dorothy, he had begun to grow highly critical of a damaging status quo that focused on material gains and on the pursuit of individual power. Leonard had come to Cornell to study agricultural economics, which he hoped would provide a way for him to help humanity on a more practical level than by becoming a clergyman. When he met Dorothy, he fell in love with her almost instantly. He believed he'd discovered an ideal partner, someone who was also dedicating her life to seeking ways to help improve the world, probably also someone who had enough money to help him to um, achieve his own ambitions. Dorothy was six years older than him, the mother of three children, and still grieving for her husband who had died only three years earlier. Unsurprisingly, she didn't see Leonard immediately in a romantic light, but she still warmed to his idealism. Before I go on, I'd like to bring in one more character into the story. Uh, that's in slide four, um, Rabbanandrath Tagore. He only visited Dartington once. Monica, can we have slide four? Um, but he was essential to the project's creation. Tagore was an idealistic Indian writer and poet. He's probably best known as the first non-Western winner for the Nobel Prize for Literature but he had another very important string to his bow. Like Dorothy and like Leonard, he believed that society need reforming radically in the wake of the First World War. To this end, he founded what he hoped would be a model community in Bengal called Shantinikatan. There could be a whole other symposium dedicated to um, this project, but uh, in short summary, it included a university that was intended to encourage uh, international unity, an institute for rural regeneration, and an experimental school that encouraged students to combine academic learning with practical skills and contributing to the social good. So you can see Tagore here, and you can also see students from his school going out into one of the local villages and helping administer quinine against malaria. Tagore wanted his community to demonstrate an alternative to nationalism, individualism, and material greed. His vision of a transformed society was one where people's daily lives were interwoven with communality, creativity, education, spirituality, and economic work. He called this a life of altogetherness. In 1921, soon after meeting Leonard, Dorothy agreed to give him funds to travel to India and work in Tagore's community in the Center for Rural Regeneration. It was a first step for the pair of them in learning how to create a new social model for themselves. Leonard was in India for nearly two years. He wrote to Dorothy regularly, and there are these wonderful letters in the archives with uh, jubilant descriptions of his work. Shantinikatan was refuge from the world of economic competition they had both been longing for, he said, a place where sp the spiritual and creative values were just as important as material ones. Dorothy responded with rising enthusiasm and also with a degree of envy. She called her own life passive and unexpressed, ironically, given how much she was actually doing in New York. She said she wished that she was doing equally useful work. In yet another letter, 
Leonard proposed. He told Dorothy that it was, it was time for them to turn their dreams into reality, to start a community of our, their own. We've played with our dreams long enough, he wrote. At first, Dorothy said she was too old for him. Their different nationalities and her three children would make a marriage unworkable. She did, went so far as to persuade an American nurse called Gretchen Green to go out to Shantinikatan as a potential wife for Leonard, but uh, Leonard rejected her. He wouldn't be put off, and finally Dorothy was convinced. In 1925, they married in the garden of Dorothy's grand house in Long Island. Dorothy by this time was 38 and Leonard was 32. Before I get onto the foundation of Dartington, I wanted just quickly to pan out to the wider zeitgeist. Um, Dartington was a form of utopian community and uh, all such communities are the products of their time. They're responding to the perceived shortcomings of the status quo. So it's difficult to understand a place like Dartington, I think, without a sense of this kind of uh, wider general history. So in the 1920s, the world's population had just been through the worst war in modern history. 60 million troops had been mobilized and these uh, one in six had been killed, one in three injured. And these mortality figures don't take into account all the wider damage um, the broken families, uh, millions blinded or maimed or mentally scarred, or what it would be like to be stuck on the home front. And then in the final year of the war, the world had been swept with an influenza pandemic. The death toll of this pandemic was somewhere in the region of 50 to 100 million, a mortality rate that's probably only ever likely been exceeded by the bubonic plague in the 14th century. For comparison, uh, the death toll from COVID stands at the moment around 7 million, so much smaller. Some people were inclined to give way to despair in the wake of the war and the pandemic. D.H. Lawrence felt that 2,000 years of civilization were collapsing before his eyes. So much beauty and pathos of old things passing away and no new things coming, he wrote. My God, it breaks my soul. But others saw this moment as offering a possibility for a radical rethink of how to live. I'd love to talk at length about the incredible range of reforming initiatives that people tried to use to transform society, since many of these reforms informed the Elmhurst thinking. Since there isn't going to be time for that, I'll just mention a scattering to give a sense of context. So there were big revolutions. There was the communist revolution in Russia in 1917, a socialist revolution in Germany in 1918, which set the Kaiser out of power. There were a huge number of new international uh, organizations which were founded, including the League of Nations, uh, which is in a sense the forerunner of the United mm -hmm. Nations now. And all of them aimed in some ways to promote mm -hmm. some form of international unity. Some people tried more niche, uh, peculiar routes, like there was a huge upsurge of enthusiasm for spiritualism and uh, different forms of psychology, some of them very colourful. And then there was uh, the popularity of the international language of Esperanto, which had been created in the 19th century, but got a new bout of popularity around this period because people thought if everyone spoke the same language, they wouldn't go to war. For some people, no, all of these things were half measures. These people felt that the only proper response to war and pandemic was to reinvent the social model completely, to build a utopia, a settlement where a group of idealists worked to embody their particular social dream in a real community which might convert the rest of the world. Hundreds of such places were started around the globe in between the two world wars. Um, some were very big, some were small. Dartington is on the larger side. And they all varied wildly in their ideologies, but um, most of them tried to enact a new vision of society that promoted some form of communality into international cooperation and self-fulfillment, self-actualization. So what the Elmhurst were up to at Dartington was part of a much wider phenomenon, one that makes Dartington so well, interesting is how it was connected to a lot of these other projects. There wasn't an isolated community. There was a hub of idealism, a refuge from the status quo. And to some extent, it's remained so almost up to the present day. So what was the vision that Dorothy and Leonard had for Dartington? Compared to some other utopias, which have often had clear written manifestos or blueprints, the Elmhurst were notably vague in their vision for Dartington. It's been a strength and a weakness for the community, I would say, throughout its history, because it's been able to change uh, with time, but it's also sometimes been uncertain of its way, uh, particularly since the founders died, and particularly, in fact, in recent periods since the estate's fallen into quite severe debt. Um, the Elmhurst decided that the experiment would take place in Devon, mainly because Reverend Andrews Tagore had visited Devon once and said it was very beautiful. Uh, they decided that the first thing they would do would be to start a school, um, which would be the centre of the community. In part, that was ideological, um, the notion that children would be sort of pioneers of some uh, brave new world. But it was also because Leonard had her, uh, Dorothy had her three children um, coming over from America and he, she wanted to continue to educate them in a progressive way. 
um, she and uh, she and Leonard had two more children uh, who also would go to Dartington School. Finally, instead of a race for material gain, the Elmhurst wanted their community to be about democratic living and about an existence that treasured all the parts that made up humanity. So the spiritual, the creative, the social and the practical, uh, the need to earn a daily wage. Um, in their focus on all round holistic life, their vision was very similar to that of Tagore. It was back to the all togetherness of everything. So while Dorothy said her goodbyes in America, Leonard sat through the only driving lesson of his life. He bought a car and he started to visit a list of the properties recommended to him by an estate agent. Can we have the next slide? Um, the second place on his list of properties was Dartington. The estate had once been very grand. It was given by Richard II to his half-brother John Holland in 1388. Later, it remained in the wealthy Champenowne family for nearly four centuries, uh, during which time it acquired uh, a medieval hall, uh, elaborate gardens and a large deer park. But the Champenowne fortune uh, dwindled through the 19th century and into the 20th. And by the time Leonard came across the estate in 1925, the hall was roofless and ivy covered. Uh, pigs and chickens were rootling around in the yard. And I think there were only around 17 people living on the estate, just barely enough uh, to run a farm, let alone uh, to create a well-changing model community. You can see here on the left, um, a photo from 1925 of the Elmhurst, one of the Elmhurst first visits. Still, Leonard saw a great deal of potential in the place. Um, he told Dorothy in a letter that he'd discovered a veritable fairyland. He immediately bought it with her money. And this money would underpin the whole utopian adventure. Uh, it meant that the Elmhurst could enact their social vision on a far larger scale than most idealists have ma managed throughout history. Over the next decades, the Elmhurst launched hundreds and hundreds of projects in education, the arts, agriculture, industry, and cooperative living. By the 1930s, nearly a thousand people were living or working or living and working on the estate. Their weeks were a unique mix. Economic labour and amateur dramatics, dance, mime lessons and spiritual study, participation in weekly meeting where Dartington's direction was debated and in the informal conversations that rambled on in the main courtyard late into the evening. The community became fated uh, nationally and internationally, attracting crowds of visitors that included writers Aldous Huxley and W. H. Auden, uh, Vita Sackville West, the econ economist John Maynard Keynes, and the playwright Bernard Shaw. For Huxley, the social experiment that was being undertaken at Dartington was proof that his age wasn't one that was infinitely exhilarating. Can we have the next slide? At the heart of the estate was Dartington Hall School, which promoted freedom, a rounded life, and social responsibility. The Elmhurst wanted to show how children could become pioneers of a brave new world of cooperation and self-fulfillment, rather than being trained up as the foot soldiers of capitalism. Children were encouraged to direct their own days as much as possible. They could choose which lessons to attend or spend their time swimming in the dirt. Early on, the school was run as a democracy, but it proved a little bit too, too chaotic, even for all the idealists who were involved. So by the, by the mid 1930s, it had a flamboyantly charismatic headmaster, W.B. W. Curry. It had modernist buildings designed by William Lascars and over 200 students, ranging from the children of estate laborers to those of philosopher Bertrand Russell, Ernest Freud, son of Frig Sigmund, and artists Barbara Hepworth and Ben Nicholson. Um, the school would last for over 60 years um, until a combination of debt and uh, a little bit of tabloid scandal closed it down in 1987. Can we have the next slide? This is just, well, I mean, we're going to have a lot more on the architecture, but here's one of the modernist boarding houses of Dartington. And in the next slide again, <clears throat> The Elmhurst wanted Dartington to demonstrate a life that was economically sustainable as well and fulfilling, as well as fulfilling. Um, they started a quite dizzying array of uh, experimental enterprises on the estate, ranging from farms to farms, orchards and forestry to a sawmill, a textile department and a cider factory and then many other things. Leonard was extraordinarily passionate about uh, trying out new scientific techniques. Um, the estate became a leader in trialing uh, intensive agriculture, uh, including factory farming poultry and ripping out all the hedges to make way for tractors and also establishing the first uh, cattle breeding center in Britain to use artificial insemination, which was a technique which he had observed in Russia. 
Often these experiments were very unsuccessful in terms of making a profit. The flock of factory farm chickens was decimated again and again by disease. Um, there's a good picture here of Leonard Elmhurst and one of his brothers admiring uh, one of the surviving chickens. Um, I particularly love their trousers. No one wanted to um, buy the cider from the cider press. It was too unfashionable to bother exporting and local farmers made their own. And then uh, many of the craftsmen and artists, including the potter Bernard Leach, who you can see here, uh, proved much more interested in pursuing their own crafts rather than creating commercially viable units of production. But the Elmhurst, for the Elmhurst, Dartington wasn't uh, or not only uh, meant to be a success in the conventional economic sense, rather it was an attempt to try a different way of life. One of Leonard's mottos, which he repeated often and which I love, is that there's no such thing as a failed experiment. Um, can we have the next slide? Dorothy and Leonard, uh, but particularly Dorothy, believed that creativity was central to individual fulfillment and to a thriving society. They invited hundreds of dancers, musicians, potters, painters, mime artists, and sculptors to Dartington over the years, encouraging them to practice their professions and also to make art uh, part of the daily life of the community, including for people who weren't artists. The result was a place that hummed with creativity. Strong efforts were made to include everybody. Early on, there were exhibitions on the estate featuring all the products that were being made across Dartington. So that might include a well-turned pot, but it also might include a well-polished boot or a well-typed letter. By the 1930s, uh, American art painter Mark Toby was offering art classes that were open to all. Uh, the weaver Elizabeth Peacock visited to design the eight banners, which now still hang in the hall, representing the different departments of Dartington. The Indian choreographer Uday Shankar's dance troupe stayed at Dartington for several months uh, and included his 14-year-old brother Ravi Shankar, who would later return to the estate as a famous musician. As the, 1930, uh, as the 1930s progressed, the estate became a refuge from totalitarianism. As I said, I'm not going to talk a great deal about um, all of the extraordinary refugees who visited or joined the estate in this period because they're going to come up in other people's talks. Uh, but I'll mention just a few. Um, there was the director, Michael Chekhov, a son, uh, nephew of Anton Chekhov, um, who fled to Dartington from communist Russia and set up a dance studio. You can see him here um, in the photo on the left uh, teaching at Dartington. On the right is uh, Austrian sculptor Willy Sukop. Among the many other refugees from uh, Nazism were Kurt Jus and Sigurd Lieder, who were accompanied by the dancers, musicians, and designers at the ballet school, their ballet school and touring company, um, and also by Rudolf Leban, a, a teacher of uh, modern expressive dance. So Dartington had countless lives as a place of, oh, can we have the last slide as well, or the next slide, um, as a place of learning, um, creativity, and very importantly, as a place of safety uh, for political refugees, convalescent pilots during the Second World War, school children fleeing the Blitz, gay people whose sexuality wasn't accepted in wider society. Um, it's been home to hundreds and hundreds of experiments. Some of them have gone on to influence the wider world, um, whether that's in the realm of education, progressive education, promoting access to the arts or artificial insemination of cows or soil survey. Um, others have been, other experiments have been quieter and odder and shorter lived. This is one of my favorite photos from the incredibly rich uh, photo archives of Dartington. Um, <clears throat> You can see Dorothy experimenting with the art of acupuncture. Dorothy's uh, standing up on the left, um, along uh, with Julian Huxley, the eminent biologist and social reformer and brother of uh, novelist Aldous. Um, I think it gives a, a good idea of the sort of astonishingly strange, uh, vibrant nature of day-to-day -day life at Dartington. Um, in its rich tapestry of successes and failures and its role as a refuge, Dartington seems to me to illustrate how small-ish idealistic experiments um, can infuse the world with a new and more optimistic energy. Um, that's the end of my talk. So if anyone has any uh, questions, then I'd love to talk about one thing I was actually going to mention just for the sort of general context of everyone's everyone else's talks was that when the Elmhurst died, so Dorothy died in 1968 and Leonard died in 1974.
very much indeed, Anna. That was indeed extremely useful by way of introduction. I note that you haven't actually used up the full allocation of time that I... Uh, I oh, well, I was trying to be disciplined. It's absolutely fine. So I think in view of that, and it's good, I think, actually online, you know, one has to be careful about uh, wearying people uh, with overlong presentations. But I think rather than waiting until after Charlie's talk um, for a and a let's indeed throw things open to the audience and see if anybody has any, any questions to ask. And while they're thinking about what they might contribute. Um, I've got a few uh, just very, you know, very direct questions for you. Obviously, it was a very short presentation you gave um, and much had to be left out. Um, could yes. you perhaps start by saying something about Michael Chekhov? Because one thing, well, indeed, there are quite a few gaps in, in the symposium as it stands at the moment, and I'm hoping to fill them in in due course by way of a, a, an anthology of essays, a, a publication, but that's that's for the future. But Michael Chekhov is somebody I'm very intrigued by. I hadn't found anybody who seemed to be the right person to give a talk about him. Um, could you just tell us a little bit more about him and his role at Dartington? I know he wasn't strictly speaking a refugee. He had indeed fled originally from communist Russia, but I think went elsewhere First, yeah, so, so Dorothy's um, daughter, one of Dorothy's daughters, met him in America and um, found him incredibly charismatic, um, at which point he could barely speak English. And um, she invited him to the estate uh, where Dorothy welcomed him with open arms. He learned a certain form of English quite quickly. And um, I think maybe the most interesting thing about him in terms of sort of wider Dartington story, um, apart from the fact that he was this incredible charismatic teacher, is that Dar uh, Dorothy... Um, well, some people say Dorothy fell in love with him. Dorothy was certainly very magnetized by his uh, his particular form of charisma and um, became one of his students and uh, would work with him for sort of six hours a day and almost uh, uh, gave up her responsibilities for the wider estate in order to focus on this sort of private form of self-actualization. And when the Second World War started and Chekhov, who um, understandably was very... Um, politically anxious fled to America or moved to America Dorothy actually went with him and there was a certain sort of anxiety about whether she would ever come back again um, but there's a very lovely letter um, that Leonard wrote to her sort of being supportive of supportive of her efforts at self-actualization she said that living in America was like being in a monastery and it was just so wonderful um, and yeah uh, that's you know short, short bits and pieces about him okay very good thank you thank you um Right. Um, somebody had their hand up. Was it Sigrid? Um, would you like to unmute yourself? I think we can we can keep this. Yes. Um, yes. In, OK. In the photo archives. OK. I, I also noticed a question from Robert Burster. Robert, if I may, we're going to hold back your question because we're going to focus on the visual arts this afternoon. He's asking, as I think all of you will be able to see about Hepworth and Nicholson. Can, can we hold that one back until later? But um, Sigrid, go, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for, for this interesting introduction, which was very, very helpful for me. I, I came late to the conference and to the whole subject via Hein Heckrud. I will talk about him later that day. But um, I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't get a clue on the archival situation from Germany or from doing this on the side most of the time. And you spoke of incredibly rich uh, photo archives at Dartington. Could you, um, or maybe this is the subject of another talk today or tomorrow, but could you elaborate? a bit on this, uh, on, on this photo archive and its, its, its accessibility. Yeah, so so the, it's kind of a slightly complicated situation, which is the archives all belong to Dartington and are officially controlled by the Dartington trustees who've put them in the southwest archives um, in an industrial state outside Exeter, so in, in Devon, but um, they used to be in a very in, in High Cross house, so a sort of beautiful, beautiful modernist house on the estate in Dartington, but unfortunately they've moved. And um, the photos, are, some of them are there. Um, some of them are digitized and controlled by, I guess at the moment, Kevin Mount, so the Dashington archivist. Um, and um, it's very irritating trying to get hold of them because it's sort of like, uh, you've got to, you have to sort of, uh you know straddle straddle these different places that they are and um flick through the actual ones in um the Darkington archive and then Kevin is very useful in providing other ones and then other photos just seem to sort of come to light here and there in other uh, other other places it's, it's I would say I would say slightly slightly disorganized and and um for somebody who's who's not around and doesn't have time to um uh you know a poodle around between these different places it can be it can be fairly annoying but the thing is that there are just so many really really wonderful photos so that um it's fairly easy to find great things 
Um, Sigrid, if I could just add to that, that Charlie Knight, who's our next speaker, we've talking, I think, not so much about the photographs specifically, but certainly very much about his researches in the archives, so you can fire questions at him um, as well. Does anybody else in the audience have anything they'd like to ask in direct response to Anna's introductory talk? Charlie, I think. Uh, Ch sorry, Charlie, yes, of course. Yeah, thank you very much, Anna, for your uh, talk. It's really fascinating to kind of hear, I don't know, a wider berth of what the Dartington project was, which... Um, uh, 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 which I found it really useful. Um, one of the things that um, the questions that I always get asked um when I say about like, Dartington Hall and this kind of like, utopian place in the kind of like, middle of like, rural at Devon, um, <laughs> is uh, firstly like, White Hotness, which is which uh, 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 which you answered in your in your talk, but that's something. Uh, uh, else which always comes up is how did the local community like respond to this um great this, great this question place. <laughs> yeah. so, so, place. Um, it, it, it was it was quite uh interesting that sort of a, a lot of other um experimental communities happened for instance in Essex or experimental you know projects um at the, of the time happened in Essex which was a much more uh, progressive place and uh Devon was extraordinarily conservative at the time that the Elmhurst settled down there and um the local community responded um unenthusiastically uh for for for, for a long time um there were lots of uh, hilarious rumours that um, actually one of the commercial directors of Dutchington sort of collated um, in order to uh, sort of explain to the Elmhurst the, prob the, prob the problems that, that he was having with um, marketing the D uh, Dutchington's goods, which has included that communism um, was, you know, there was an accusation of communism, there was an accusation that um, Leonard Elmhurst would be saying black masses in the Dartington Hall in front of an upside down cross, so really quite ridiculous things, and then slightly less ridiculous things like an absolutely fury about um, nudity and naked children um, sort of assailing people as they came into Dartington, throwing things at people's cars, um, and that gradually changed over time, um, I would say partly in consequence of the fact that Dartington attracted so many um, radical, progressive, experimental types who then later, particularly after going to the College of Arts at Dartington, settled in the surrounding community so that rather than um, Dartington necessarily sort of becoming more popular with the same conservative people, it's more that Dartington has kind of changed the local area and made this uh, TQ9 uh, quite a quite a quite a quite different a different place on the map of kind of hotspots of experimentation. Thank you. Um, I see Rose, Rose Sawkins. Do you want to unmute yourself, Rose? Hello. I was just writing, actually, what I was going to say, and I'll it's read. It's easier to talk. It is yeah, easier yeah. to say. It. Thank <laughs> you. That was absolutely wonderful. All of which, pretty much all of which, and none of which I'd seen, pretty much all of which I did not know. Okay. <laughs> I was and Rose at, was at Dartington. You should explain that you had first. I was at Dartington, 1985 to 89. Okay, cool. And uh, live just up the road from Monica. And uh, I'm just so grateful, Monica, that you've done this. I'm. It's so exciting. I, it, and it's very moving, actually, to, mm -hmm. to even hear this beginning. Um, and I just wanted to tell you a little story about when I was on my way up the hill on a reconnaissance mission to see if I wanted to go to Dartington. I was pretty sure I did, even before um, applying. Um, and I went on the day in autumn up the hill, you know, with those incredible views that if you've been there, if you haven't been there, you must go, um, were extraordinary. And I was on the bus up the hill and an elderly woman sat next to me. She was probably in her early nineties or maybe late eighties at the time. Her name was Paula Morell. And she was an actor with Michael Chekhov mm -hmm. when he was at the college. And so she told me a little bit about the place and, and, and assured me I should should apply. And it turned out that her grandson was in the theatre, little theatre, theatre and education troupe I was part of in Battersea in London, pure coincidence, at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and he ended up playing in a, in a show I did when I was at college. It's extraordinary, strange coincidences. Um, she probably would have told me a lot more about Chekhov had I even known who he was at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, had I had that kind of uh, curiosity, which of course was not something I was rich in at the time, but I'm just, I'm really looking forward to hearing the rest of the speakers in the next couple of days. Thank you for your really great opening. 
<laughs> Thanks, Rose. I'm just noticing, uh, I don't know if any, everybody's seen the, the chat, Harriet, who's going to be talking tomorrow on the music side of things. Is it actually true, Harriet? Are you talking about today? Because I was in Totnes recently and I failed to notice this. It says, the sign that as you enter Totnes from Darting says, Totnes twinned with Narnia. How wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe uh, country, for those of you who don't know, uh, classic English uh, C.S. Lewis, isn't it, uh, text. How fabulous. Um, perhaps a few more factual questions. Um, I'm intrigued and I haven't tried to include a paper on this because, as everybody will know, the focus is very much on the arts over the next two days. But François Lafitte, who I knew of in my researches through my researches on the internment of so-called enemy aliens in 1940, who indeed wrote a book called The Internment of Aliens, which helped sway the tide of public uh, opinion against that internment, um, seems to have been suggested by Leonard Elmhurst as the author of that book. And I wondered, Anna, maybe this is not something that you actually know anything about. And I noticed that Lafitte doesn't actually feature in the index of your wonderful book. But I wonder if you don't know anything about it, whether anybody in the audience does, because clearly, you know, what we're talking about is actually influences and networks that go well beyond the world of, of, of culture. Um, is Lafitte some, could, there's somebody who's not muted. Could everybody please, please make sure they're muted. We've got some rather distracting background noise. Uh, excuse me, everybody. Let's see if I can do it. Let's check who's uh, John. Yeah, I'm afraid I don't. I don't know anything about that. Um, although I was going to say, um, in, in response to the um previous speaker, was it is absolutely extraordinary the number of uh directions that a connection with Dartington can lead you in. I think that I sort of rarely meet people who d don't have some, you know, some some strange form of association with the estate. It's really um mm. quite extraordinary. But yeah, I don't have an answer to your question. No, I think that's right. I think, you know, one thing that comes out of events like this is precisely a sort of greater awareness of these extraordinarily rich and productive networks of person, you know, personal contacts. Indeed, um, there's a comment here from Lorraine Nicholas, who's a dance expert, will be talking to us tomorrow. Paula Morell, um, Ruth, um, uh, sorry, Rose, uh, was a dancer as well as a theatre student and wife of the orchard manager, <laughs> apparently. Um, good. Anybody else? Does anybody in the audience know anything about the Lafitte connection? Because I'd be really interested to know more. And internment, by the way, is something that will crop up its unpleasant head uh, later on, particularly, I think, uh, tomorrow, but also quite likely uh, today. Um, no? No. OK, so obviously more, more to be discovered on, on, on that front. The other thing, um, Anna, I discovered literally yesterday, it was actually through Rose, who's just uh, chipped in. Uh, she uh, belongs to a Facebook um, uh, group of alumni from Dartington, somebody called Ruth Kay, who I think is not yet in the audience with us, um, uh, mentioned that her grandfather had actually came as a, as a teenage refugee from Nazism and ended up in Dartington, not in the school as such, but actually as an ag agricultural apprentice, if that's the word, uh, as part of a scheme that in Hebrew is known as Hachshara, which was essentially agricultural training for later immigration to Palestine. Now, if that's true, that opens up a whole other realm of, of inquiry that I knew absolutely nothing about. And I wonder if that rings any bells to no, you. No, no, it, it doesn't. Um, apart from the fact that um, and my work on sort of uh, uh, utopias, like Dartington was just incredibly connected with like so many other different experiments. Mm -hmm. And I'm not at all surprised that, um, yeah, that there would be a connection like that. Interesting. Anyway, again, to, to be to be pursued. Um, Can I just say a quick word on that? Yes, of course, of course. Um, we had a tutor at uh, Dartington called Peter Kiddle, who's no longer around, and Jane Fitzgerald will probably may may know more about this. Mm. But Peter was Jewish, and his wife Kathy is still around, and she may she may know something relating to that. Interesting. But else doesn't. Yes. Yeah, so to be continued. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Um, Right, Rebecca Lukes, again, is one of our speakers, is offering uh, a very useful link there um, about Chekhov. Oh, right. OK, very good. All right. So for any future book, clearly, uh, that needs to be inserted, uh, Michael Chekhov. Um, just perhaps, sorry, Anna, did you want to? Oh, I just see that there's something, can Anna say something on the Arts Inquiry? So yes, of course. Um, the Arts Inquiry um, oh, yeah. was the most extraordinary, one of the most extraordinary kind of influential things that the Elmhurst sponsored. Um, and it was supposed to be uh, an investigation into all the forms of arts in England, the state of the arts in England. So um, actually only the visual arts inquiry went ahead um, or, or was only sort of substantially important. Um, and um, it was 
it wasn't it wasn't uh, directly sponsored by the government as well, but it was um, sort of done um, in collaboration with the government. Um, and um, there was this enormous survey that went on, um, which was sort of superintended from Dartington um, and uh, ended up influencing the uh, post Second World War uh, Labour government's sort of arts arts settlement and the creation of the Arts Council afterwards. Um, really, some really, really good things have been written about it uh, recently about sort of Dartington and the Arts Inquiry. So you can probably sort of like look that up and it's a, a, well, a well-researched area that I only touch on in, in my own book. Mm. And indeed, Alison, you're absolutely right. It was a PUEP, uh, Political and Economic Inquiry, is it? Um, uh, connection. That, that linked Lafitte to Elmhurst, but I'm you know curious curious to know to know more. There is actually something. There's an article I think by somebody called Deakin uh, that that touches on it. But yes, um, any other questions at all for for Anna before we move on to Charlie? I was just going to say one other thing myself, if no one else has any more questions, which is um, Dartington's uh, centenary is coming up. Mm. Uh, it was founded in 1925, and um, uh Dartington itself is in uh quite sort of you know certain certain straits in terms of its continuation but I've been thinking about doing a sort of uh collecting together the voices of people who've um been at Dartington because although the archive is very rich um in uh when you look at the 1920s 1930s into the 1940s actually sort of into the present day it's sort of harder to get a sense of people's experiences um so I'm thinking of doing either an oral history and or, or sort of a, a place where people can um leave their stories either written or um spoken um and I just thought I would mention that as a, as a sort of a sort of thing to commemorate the centenary. That's great because I notice actually from the list of attendees, quite a few people are local to, mm -hmm. to Dartington. So yes, there's, there's certainly potential there. And there are great <laughs> stories out there, I know. <laughs> For sure. Uh, talk about stories. I wanted perhaps before uh, introducing Charlie um, and moving on to him, just to mention that I've literally. I think it was late last night, finished reading a rather wonderful book by Eva Ibbotson, who's somebody who isn't, I think, going to be mentioned <laughs> directly, but she was the, oh, sorry, come in, come in. She was the daughter of the emigre writer, rather wonderful writer called Anya Anagamaina. Um, I said, Anna, yes, I think so, who wrote a wonderful novel called Manya, which I strongly rec recommend. It's, it's been published by um, uh, Persephone Press. But the reason I mention it is that Ava was indeed a pupil at Dartington, and she's the author of at least two books which directly allude, albeit not by name, to Dartington. And the one I just finished reading was A Song for Summer, which is meant for adults. There's another one for young or older children, I would say, called the Dragonfly Pool, which also um, is uh, is is worth looking at. But I think I would really recommend it. She's a very engaging novelist, and uh, uh, I think gives us insights into the kind of crazy mixture, if you like, of people who indeed ended up at, at Dartington. And then also you mentioned Julian Huxley, and indeed I think also Aldous um, very briefly. But um, I was interested again just very recently um, uh, to to note that. Um, Island, his his book Island was probably at least in part inspired by Dartington, and you mentioned mm -hmm. the term Brave New World, of course, which uh, is is clearly pertinent there. So so you know other avenues to pursue on on, on the uh, literary front as as well. Um, right, uh, good. So Rose just saying in response to what you were uh, mentioning your your project that yes, there are lots of lots of stories getting posted. Anyway, you can all be in touch with each other. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a big uh, project. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Lovely. Well, this is all really nicely interactive, which is, is exactly what I wanted. It's not always easy on Zoom to make that happen. But uh, thank you so much, Anna. I'm sure you'll be chipping in at later uh, moments. Mm -hmm. I'm going to not, I'm going to ask, I'm going to remove the spotlight from you for the moment and ask Charlie to, um, I'm going to spotlight Charlie and introduce them ever so briefly as I as I threatened earlier. Charlie is an absolute mine of information as you will soon discover. He's a uh, postgraduate student at the Parks Institute um, uh, uh, for the study of Jewish and non-Jewish relations at the University of Southampton that some of you may already know about and he's been doing some really fruitful hands-on research in the archives. So Charlie I very much look forward to what you're going to be saying. You're going to operate the um yes the yeah, yeah. yourself. So do uh, just start screen sharing. Uh, I thought I'd just um add to um what was just said about the agricultural training group and that there's there's one document which I found in one of the refugee files about the Cagran uh, group and the Society of Friends sent a letter to one of the Elmhurst saying that would you like to kind of host this agricultural training camp? Um and then they attached a leaflet uh, that saying, well, it was a about. Um, I'm not sure whether it actually ended up there, but um, 
it was at least uh, talked about i can confirm on that front um but i thought i'd just uh start firstly by sharing my screen um and then also i think it would be interesting to begin to well let, let me just get this up da, 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 da. i'm sharing my screen yes lovely um i very much believe in a kind of um uh, we're briefly uh, acknowledging the uh, historian's uh, journey in some way to discussing how you come at a, a certain topic, where it comes from. Um, and Dartington's are one of those that, unless you're interested in the arts necessarily uh, at first point or know someone that was there, it's quite difficult to uh, come across, I thought at least. Um, for context, I'm a historian of the Holocaust uh, mainly, and I look at uh, German Jewish refugees and their correspondence. And way back when when I was doing my masters at the uh, University of Exeter, um, I was asked to uh, to go to the German Heritage Centre as kind of like introduction to to the archive type uh, event. Um, and as uh, and I said. Um, it's on a like, industrial estate. Uh, it's not that necessarily like, inspiring a, 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 a building. But I went there and they asked um, if uh, uh, people could take could uh, say something that you're interested in. Um, and then uh, uh, they'd see what what the archive had. And there are various people that um, have had various things about medieval like, villages and... Uh, uh, taxes and other kind of institutional documents um that the that like the archive had and then then i said refugees um and they pulled out one file labeled refugees and it was from the uh, dartington uh, archive and this was the first time which i'd seen heard of this 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 place and at that point there was very little concretely published on on uh, Dartington. There were kind of yeah, books around uh, uh, dancing there, kind of early works, but nothing overly like, substantial, um, especially on the on the uh, refugees. I kind of used this during my master's a little bit, and it kind of like, took, a, uh, uh, took a back seat. I then went back. Exeter started to kind of sift through the archive more started to work out that the number of re refugees here was more substantial than I had perhaps first thought um and then I gradually started to get into contact with people and one of those people was uh, Monica hence the kind of in, uh, uh, my uh, involvement in the project so I thought it worth talking about perhaps well uh, firstly the overview of what um i'll talk about uh today so i briefly want to touch on the kind of establishment of the archive itself uh victor lebron carter uh, one of the first people to concretely write about it we're then going to have a look at how refugees were recorded during the, the 1930s and some individual stories from the archive I then want to touch upon something that's quite interesting, I think, uh, because throughout to all of this um, that symposia uh, over the next two days, we're going to be talking about people, uh, uh, eminent uh, artists and creatives that arrived at, at Dartington. I want to, to spend a fair amount of time in the middle talking about people that wanted to come to Dartington but couldn't. And I think that's important to recognise when we discuss refuge in general anyway, um, to highlight that it wasn't possible for everyone. We're then going to have a brief look at two individuals and this kind of allusion to a world outside. This um, Dartington is often described as like a haven or an a island, something something uh, separate uh, in many ways. Um, I want to discuss two instances in the archive from two letters which discuss a kind of world outside of Dartington Hall. And then we're going to finish with... Um, looking at some of the work that was done um from that we can uh, ascertain from the news of the day uh lists there so without further ado um 
Right. Victor Bonham Carter um, is the author uh, of one of the first books on like, Dartington. The early work had been done by like, Charles Madge, Adam Cole, uh, Maurice Ash. Um, and in the Dartington archive, there are numerous um, documents written by Victor Bonham Carter, uh, who was a kind of agricultural historian and you know, agricultural theorist, countryside uh uh, interested in the history of the uh, countryside and <clears throat> in the archive there are numerous uh, points which he discusses the kind of early process of beginning to research Dartington Hall um, for a let BBC uh, program of documentary that was due to take place and then once that was kind of um, once that project had uh, run its course he, he began to write his um, work on the early years of Dartington Hall. And it's in the introduction to, to this that Victor Bonham Carter talks about um, some of his early impressions, the funny stories about the, the school. That was a large estate somewhere in, in Devon, richly endowed with fine buildings and plenty of cash and people and, and peopled by a community of cranks. I thought it was an interesting phrase. Uh, I was not the only one to, to think this. In fact, I knew nothing at all about uh, uh, Dartington. I was curious to and keen to do the job. So Elmhurst, uh, sorry, so uh, uh, Bonham Carter was approached um, by the Elmhurst um, afterwards and asked to begin to create uh, a history of uh, the um, of the uh, uh, estate. He said. Um, at first, when they were discussing the BBC documentary, uh, Victor said, uh, we did not find that the Elmhurst very enthusiastic for the simple reason that Dartigan had not had a good press in the, in the, in the past, which uh, uh, Anna was briefly talking about earlier, neither in print nor on the air. Correspondents had tended to be either carping and malicious or ludicrously fulsome. Few had found out the full facts and the result had rarely been true or clear. So over the next few few years, uh, this is in the 1950s, uh, by the way, uh, over the next few years, uh, Victor, uh, 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 Victor starts taking things from uh, uh, Dartington and starts to create a fuller picture, as he sees it, of the uh, estate. I think it's worth... Um, here quoting uh, a section from Anna's uh, book where she discusses at the start um, uh, the archive and in it notes uh, in what it preserves and in how it is uh, arranged it presents a story uh, sanctioned by the by the the Elmhursts and at the same time often uh, inadvertently it silences other stories Although Dorothy and Leonard saw theirs as a democratic project, a common enterprise, the lives of the workers who, who made up the majority of the Dutton community are marginalised in the archives. There's numerous uh, documents on the ballet, on the dancers, on the arts, on all of this, this stuff. Many of the refugees, however, which turned up at, at Dartington, although they, they, they were creatives in uh, some sense, very little in the archive on new on many of the of the people themselves. In some cases, we have only one or two documents mentioning someone, and this kind of reminded me of a, a quote by Leonis Hubotic, um, where she says, "What can one piece of paper tell us without the story around it?" So, what I've tried to do in some of the parts of the following presentation is to highlight the individual people, most of whom actually, all of whom are not discussed elsewhere in this um, in this uh, symposium, because we have numerous artists on uh, various of the people here, and I'm not one of those. Um, so I, my aim has to been to trace some of the people who are less well studied in the archive. And to do this, what we've had to adopt is a personal in the institutional approach. And by that, I mean looking for personal details and personal stories within a arguably institutional archive. As uh, 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 Anna said in the quote on the screen, um, 
the archive is one that is that was ordered by the Elmhurst and arranged by the Elmhurst. So we have to take that into account when beginning to 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 talk about what is accessible and what is here. So let's briefly di discuss um, some of the documents in the archive and my experience of using them um, of how we can begin to trace some of the refugees that were at Dartington. I'm going to zoom in on one in particular, Heinz uh, Heran, um, and then briefly touch upon Ludwig Grosenberg. So there are numerous files in the uh, Devon Heritage Centre on the uh, Dartington archive, um, which can tell us about some of the individuals there. There are index uh, 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 files authored at some point in the pre-war period. It doesn't say on the documents it's difficult to, to date, but from the fact that some of the refugees were only there for a short amount of time, um, we... Um, and start to uh, estimate when these were written. The two documents which I've shown on screen are two of those uh, indexed files. There's about 50, I think, from memory um, of these files. The top one you can see is of Baron Ron, Ron Fritz, uh, also known as René Halkett. Um, and then at the uh, one just below that is of Fritz Cohen. Um, the the uh, musical director of the ballet uh, of the uh, ballet at uh, Dartington. Within this uh, refugee file, this kind of first file that was uh, given uh, at Dart um, at the uh, Heritage Centre, it also contains various correspondences regarding the refugees, regarding uh, their arrival at Dartington, and then various. Um, exchanges between the Elmhurst where they reference the people that are there. If you were to do a deep dive into the Elmhurst the correspondence, I'm sure you would find more of the people that are mentioned in these things. I have not done that because their extent, their correspondence is quite extensive. There is also internment uh, correspondence that Monica said um, about uh, internment, which will be mentioned a few points um, in my presentation, and I'm sure at other points in time, there is internment correspondence between uh, various uh, uh, refugees at Dardenton when they were interned in 1940. There are detailed uh, exchanges concerning uh, immigration to Dardenton, whether that occurred or not. One of the most notable ones is by Fritz Neumann. Fritz Neumann actually didn't uh, come to Darton. I believe he was an author um, from memory. Um, he does have a um, memoir, which you can uh, read, which is held uh, in the USA, where he eventually made it to. Um, he did come to Darton for, for a short point in time, but then didn't stay. There are also... Um, arguable references to like, humanitarian uh, uh, efforts within the archive, whether that was the saviour of uh, children during this point in time. And uh, as I said uh, uh, earlier, there we can begin to plot kind of uh, refugee activities in the uh, estate and uh, uh, placements through the newsletter news of the day. There are also various uh, registers, as it said, of the uh, arts department, of the staff, and of the students. This is something which I began to create, which I showed Monica on our first meeting a few, probably uh, about two years or so back, back now. Um, this is a beginning of a the database which I started to create based on the refugee index files, which I showed on the last screen. These these pages here. Uh, in those files, it tells you their date of birth, their reason for leaving, their occupation currently, the address that they were living at, and any remarks or family particulars that, for the historian now, gives us a uh, ability to start to trace them. You can see, for example, on the first line, that Marion Labardus, um, it's possible to um, 
uh, learn more about her because she was uh, interviewed by the uh, USC La Shoah Fa uh, Foundation in 1996. Uh, Marion was a dancer uh, and came to Dartington for, for a short time before moving on. And as you can see, there are probably some names on that list on the left that you uh, that you recognise. Um, uh, and as I said, it continues down. I like to continue adding to this um, when uh, when I find uh, a new name. I will add to this a database, and we can start to create a more full list of the uh, refugees that were present at Darlington during the 1930s and 1940s, at least from uh, my interest anyway. So I wanted to touch upon um, a couple of the individuals that are, that are highlighted in these refugee index uh, files that the Elm has kept. One of these is Dr. Heinz Beran. Um, but I was able to contact um, the like, descendants of uh, Heinz in a week or two prior to this um, this uh, symposium as I was uh, creating this uh, talk and starting to, to go back through the work that I'd done previously on it. So Heinz is someone that I, that I hadn't um, looked much at when I first did this research, so I started to do a bit more now. He was born in uh, Chanel in uh, Bohemia in 1907 to Hugo Lebrun, who was a school headmaster, and Anna uh, Fultyshek. He received his PhD in uh, child psychology from the University of Vienna and married Trudel uh, Gross in 1933 in Vienna. Trudel also came to uh, to Dartington with Heinz and I believe stayed longer than, than he did from what I can uh, gather. He was sponsored um, by Barbara Ward, who was later uh, the uh, Baroness Jackson of Lodsworth, who was known for her uh, ref uh, refugee work, and entered Britain at uh, Felixstowe, which if you have uh, good eyesight, you can see on the form on the right, um, the words uh, Felixstowe mentioned there. Heinz was predominantly a linguist. He was fluent in German, English, French, uh, uh, Russian, which was his uh, favourite uh, language. Um, and in uh, and in his sixties, uh, uh, post uh, uh, Darlington years, also started learning Chinese. So he 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 began to um, teach at Darlington. Um, I was able to reach out to Heinz's uh, uh, son Frank, um, who gave me permission to. Um, uh, show some of the uh, recollections uh, which Frank which Frank had of his uh, uh, father during this time. He said that Dad did not talk much about these these days, but I remember him telling me that he had enjoyed his time in the in the uh, camp of Hutchinson. So Heinz was one of the number of uh, refugees from uh, Nazi oppression that was uh, interned during 1940. He was sent to the Hutchinson camp, which was known as the the artist camp. There's a there's a great book by Simon Parkin uh, on Hutchinson camp, and then uh, Frank goes on, uh, uh, which was the seafront of a series of of hotels in which the the German and Austrians immigrants were interned. Uh, his sister remembered the the day two two policemen arrived to take that away it was a hard and sad period for her and his wife but in later life after leaving like darkinson after he was interned um heinz um became a um program organizer for the for the austrian broadcasting service of the bbc um he as you can see him on the left there and his uh, uh, victory in the AJR information in 1982 when he passed away. So Heinz is one of these people um, that we would be able to learn a lot more about um, than is present in the archive itself. There are only a few references to uh, Heinz's first wife, uh, Trudel, in the archive in the news of the day. Beyond that, I've not found anything else of him there and yet he was there i also want to share with you this uh, photograph which is taken from the the uh, holocaust library in london which shows dr ludwig rosenberg another uh, uh, linguist 
who talked at Dartington. His daughter, uh, Gabriella Fotti, uh, will be hearing from tomorrow at the end of the uh, symposium. Ludwig Rosenberg's papers, along with his that of his uh, father and his uh, wider family, were donated to the uh, Wiener Library and have been uh, fully digitised by them, which you can now see um, at the library in London. This is uh, one of the the pictures that was taken um, at uh, at Darton Tool, and you can see Ludwig on the back right, and I believe uh, uh, Gabby on the bottom right uh, somewhere. I'm sure um, no, she can say that uh, afterwards. Um, so again, Ludwig Rosenberg, nothing much in the Dartington archive on him, and yet we have this full collection outside of it, um, which we can begin to learn more about him. As I said, I want to highlight those that never arrived at Dartington. Um, I'm a firm believer that the studies... Uh, of refugees should be combined with the with the studies of those they left behind um to create a, a fuller picture of how they existed in this world during the 1930s one of these people at neustadt um i have done much work on um and one uh, benedict lackman who you may have heard of we'll touch on briefly at the end so Dr. Ernst Schneustadt was born in Berlin in 1883. He, in, he uh, enrolled in a school in Tiergarten, and one of his uh, fellow classmates was the uh, uh, educator Kurt Hahn, um, who I'm sure that many of you will be aware of as the founder of the Gordonston School, who is that connection that will also become important later in Ernst's story. He studied at the Friedrich Wilhelm University, which is now at Humboldt University in Berlin, and uh, eventually gained his PhD in <laughs> philology in 1906. In 1919, he married Gertrude Sardis Stadhagen um, and uh, uh, got his first job out uh, of his uh, uh, PhD at the uh, Askenas's gymnasium um, in Berlin. He then became head a, a, a teacher and a, a head of history at the Momsen uh, Gymnasium and in 1929 relocated to Frankfurt where he became the headmaster at the famed Goethe Gymnasium. There. In his uh, opening address to the school he spoke of the importance of, uh, of uh, humanism and um, stressed the uh, qualities of the ancient Greeks and how they could be used in this ever-changing interwar world. In the December 1935, Ernst was forcibly pensioned under the law for, for the restoration of the professional civil service, basically meaning that he could no longer be uh, the head of the school because he was Jewish. This is despite him him having won a vote of confidence uh, from his staff a number of years earlier when his job was first threatened. They 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 couldn't hold on. However, um, and he was he was um, uh, pensioned and sent to the lesser school, uh, the uh, Lessing Le Le Gymnasium, also in Frankfurt. In November nineteen thirty eight. Uh, many of you will be aware the like Kristana, the like, November like, pogroms, uh, and you can see a picture of the like, synagogue in uh, uh, Frankfurt um, from uh, January 39 on the left, or what was left of it. Now, this <clears throat> is when the Dartington Hall connection comes in. I'll come back to, to, to this slide after. <clears throat> okay, no, I'll go back to this first. Um, this is just a quote um, from two uh, academics which were which were asked to um, uh, discuss Ernst's uh, Neustadt's position at the Goethe Gymnasium, and they um, said that he was too too humanitarian, too too democratic, too cosmopolitan, and a pacifist to be a teacher in the new Nazi state. Post November nineteen thirty eight. 
Ernst began, Ernst and his wife began to formulate plans to leave. Now, this is where the Darton talk uh, connection comes in. In the archive, and this was the first thing that uh, I ever looked at in the, in the uh, Darton Hall archive, is a letter from Wolfgang von Terpitz, the son of the uh, First World War, Admiral von, von Terpitz. This is a letter dated the 30th of November, of November 1938, and is written to Leonard Elmhurst. The connection here is that Wolfgang von Terpitz was married to Elizabeth uh, Sering, who was a daughter of Max Sering, uh, the uh, agriculturalist and longtime friend of Leonard Elmhurst. As for the connection between Ernst Neustadt and Wolfgang von Terpitz, I do not know. I've not been able to work that out. I think they were... Uh, uh, well, uh, he says in the letter, a uh, former teacher and friend of mine. So we can presume that's how they knew each other. But as for the documentary trace of where that was, I don't know. This is the letter that he writes. A former teacher and friend of mine wishes to leave Germany on account of his Jewish uh, origin. This man, who has none whatever the, uh, disagree the uh, disagreeable qualities of his uh, race, is uh, 57 years old, married without uh, children. He is an excellent philologist and was director of the famous college in Frankfurt am Main, where he was held in the highest esteem by his colleagues. I enclose herewith a list of his uh, 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 publications. Uh, these documents also come with this letter. He says that he is, after all, a good uh, Christian and his character is perfect and his ability on uh, 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 getting on with young people is marvellous. So this is a letter that arrives to the Elmhurst from someone that that, that, that they, they know asking to help Dr. Neustadt. As I said here, Wolfgang von Terbitz writes post November 19... Uh, 38. Ernst himself also writes to numerous people at this time. He writes to Walter Adams of the Society for the Protection of Science and Learning, also uh, now known as the Council of At-Risk Academics. And he, he wrote this on the advice of, of uh, Elmhurst, who basically wrote back and said, I'll do what I can, but it might be worth you contacting these people too. He also writes to, to the Archbishop of Canterbury and Professor Gilbert Murray at Oxford, amongst other people. This letter uh, uh, arrives. Elmhurst writes to um, other people trying to trying to uh, to 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 get him out. Um, he's then suggested, as I said, to write to the SBSL. It is, however, through Kurt Hahn um, that Neustadt eventually managed to get out. I put on the left here his mail exemption from the internment card. It lists him as a teacher of classics and uh, history employed by Dr. Kurt Hahn at Gordonston School. So despite not being able to make it to Dartington, Neustadt does make it to the UK in the end. In 1940, uh, along with other refugees and those uh, such as Heinz, uh, Heinz that uh, 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 we talked about earlier, he was uh, interned in 1940. Ernst was sent to Central uh, Central Promenade Camp, a uh, drawing from which you can see on the right, on the same Isle of Man that Heinz and others were on. There's one reference to Neustadt on the islands from Martin uh, Martin Oswald, the historian, who who talks about um, Neustadt giving readings of Greek lyric poetry on the island, which I always think is quite a nice uh, image to think of. However, Neustadt is released uh, from internment, then comes to London. And the situation is gradually getting worse for him. He is released from internment, as you might see at the top of the screen under category 18, which is uh, extreme hardship, usually reserved for, for people if a uh, relative was gravely ill. Neustadt's uh, wife Gertrude was uh, dying from uh, cancer at this point in time, so he was released at the earliest uh, convenience. His situation gradually became worse. He eventually got a school at Wakefield Grammar School in Yorkshire, 
where later one of the uh, his students described him as a very unhappy man, very much feared and hated by the boys. There were few now who remember him, and this is at stark odds with the with the with the um the descriptions of Neustadt pri prior to this as a like, progressive man of pure and clear character, greatest love for each single pupil. Gertrude dies in 1942 from cancer. Shortly afterwards, um, uh, um, Ernst takes his own life in uh, April 1942. You can see on the uh, burial register on the right, uh, Gertrude's name the second down and Ernst's name at the bottom on the same page. I was able to find out where they were, where, where they were buried, that, they're both buried in the parish of uh, 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 Sandal Magna uh, in Wakefield. And this was previously the grave of Le Gertrude. Now, I wasn't content with the fact that Neustadt, Ernst Neustadt himself didn't have a grade, uh, have a grave partly because um, they were both buried in the same plot. Um, but evidently, um, by the time that Ernst was buried, there was no one left to um, get a gravestone for him. This was at the time that I started to then fundraise for a headstone and it was placed um, in, uh, I believe it was October 2020, 2021. Um, the um, gravestone is there on the left. And post, uh, post pandemic, I was actually uh, finally able to go see it a few, a few uh, months back. So all this being said, this this is a story of someone who wished to to come to 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 Dartington based on it, that reputation that we heard from Anna, but was unable to. And yet we can recreate this this full story based off of primarily one letter in the Devon Heritage Centre archive. I want to move on to one uh, other person who appears in the uh, at Dartington archive. That again was unable to come. Uh, Benedict Lachman was was uh, uh, born in 1878 in Kulm, uh, later like Kumlo, in West Prussia. He was a uh, anarchist uh, and uh, edited the uh, German language newspaper the Individualistische Individualistisch Anarchist, and then published uh, a work on the topic too. He also published work on theatre and music and left the uh, Jewish community because of his libertarian and uh, anarchist views. Most famously, he opened a uh, bookshop at the corner of Le Be of Le Be Le Be Le Be Le Platz. Um, and you can see the picture of that shop on the right. It exists still now and it's on its third owner. Uh, strong kind of uh, culture um, within that part of Berlin. In absence of a picture of him, he is uh, described as a striking figure, tall and gaunt, with a slight stoop and a mane of black hair. You can see the letter on the right, which was written to the Elmhurst from uh, from the Refugee Committee at the Bloomsbury House, um, asking if they would be able to guarantee um, Mr. Lackman. At the bottom, it said uh, acknowledge forms returned in Mr. Elmhurst's absence. So, because the Elmhurst weren't there at that point to uh, guarantee it, the form had to be ret returned. I'm including this in my talk because I think it's important to note for all of the people that we are able to discuss here today, of those that made it to uh, to uh, to uh, to Dartington, esteemed authors. Uh, and uh, with uh, interests in music and theatre, such as uh, Benedict uh, Lackman, were sometimes unable to be helped by the uh, Elmhurst and many others. Uh, Benedict was eventually deported to the Woods uh, Ghetto on the first transport to leave Berlin in October 1941, most likely because of his strong political views. He then uh, died in the Ghetto that same year. Within the archive, we do see see uh, people that made it to uh, Dartington, uh, such as Max uh, Salomon, and also interesting uh, documents um, of people uh, that didn't, but were involved in it in some way. 
So I want to talk to you about Max Salomon, uh, who did come to Darlington at this point in time. He was born in Frankfurt um, um, and married a non-Jewish lady, Catherine Ellsberth Schellens, and the couple had three children, Agnes, Ulrich and, and uh, Judith. Agnes and uh, uh, Ulrich made to uh, Dartington along with Max. Uh, Judith had stayed in Germany, but uh, eventually uh, came to uh, America with um, Max's wife. In the Refugee uh, Index cards, which I talked about at the start, that that uh, wrapped uh, Dartington, Max is... Uh, described as being arrested for 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 being a Jew placed in the concentration camp at Sachsenhausen. He is a banker, former director of the Deutsche Bank, um, and is also a philosopher and an author of a number of books. He held a, a PhD from the University of Munich and jurisprudence at the University of Marburg. He was anxious to be of service. Uh, indeed, when he moved to uh, America in 1941-42, I think, um, he enrolled in the U.S. Army. Max Ulrich and Agnes lived with Fritz Cohen, the like, director of the uh, musical director of the uh, ballet in Allen Park Cottage, on the grounds. This is a letter which is in the archive, written between Leonard and Dorothy Elmhurst. If you can't make out the reading from there, I've put the text over the top, where they discuss his uh, situation. Uh, when he had just arrived, they said he was just beginning to uh, uh, beginning after a week here to speak a few words, but paces up and down in the in the little garden by the hour, trying to recover that sanity. I should point out um, at this point in time that Max wasn't actually in Sachsenhausen; he was in Le Buchenwald. Um I'm not sure how this discrepancy has come to light, but there's no record that I can find of him being in uh, at Sachsenhausen, but he was in uh, Buchenwald. Uh, again uh, arrested in November 1938 on the November pogroms. What I show next is a um interesting letter from the archive which uh, which I know not why it's there but um it uh, uh, talks about the man George Quitner who was interned in a uh, kitchener camp and I'm sure that many of you will be aware of uh, kitchener camp as it is kind of um become more of a uh, thing in recent years um no, i'll let you read read through, through that uh, uh, yourself um but for uh, uh, point of interest um this letter is between the Bertolt Wirtel, the uh, austrian uh, screenwriter uh, to friedrich ledebo um the, uh, the austrian uh, actor who was um in uh, various films during the 1950s up to the 1970s, such as uh, Moby Dick uh, and, and uh, others. He uh, uh, conducted a uh, jazz band and was naturally musical and and an able and decent fellow in any respect. He surely would find work uh, in America. Uh, they're saying, but how to uh, how to bring him here? They 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 talk about wanting to liberate him from the camp where his where he is the unhappiest of all prisoners. And I think this is a misconstrued uh, point of what Kitchener Camp was. It was a rescue mission for many uh, Jews that were that were interned, uh, that were uh, imprisoned after Kristallnacht in 1938. Kitchener Camp um, was created post-November 1938 by the, US, by the CBF, and rescued at 4,000 adult men. Um, George had been arrested on an attempt to smuggle people over the border to Czechoslovakia, had been arrested in Germany, and then was saved by, by Kitchener Camp. Quitner is described as a uh, saxophonist in the camp orchestra. And you can see a picture of the camp orchestra here. These are the people concerned in the letter. So the letter is written by Bertold Wietel on the right to Friedrich von uh, Lebedor, um, a picture from uh, him in Moby Dick, I believe. And in it, they discuss Beatrice Strait, the daughter of Dorothy Elmhurst, and say, perhaps we should reach out to Beatrice Strait and her mother may be able to send him to Dartington Hall. Again, thinking of him based on this uh, artistic life there. As I said, like Hollywood's look, 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 calling 
thought even that for the meantime, until he can travel, Beatrice's mother could claim him for her school. The the community there is such an Admiral Island in our in our chaotic war world that I often am dreaming to be there myself. Many friends of mine, like the painter Hein uh, Heckhoff, who we'll be hearing about later, the uh, poetess Annie Gemeiner, um, who um, that Monica mentioned just before my talk, um, they told me uh, so much about it, the spirit there, that I'm that I'm so sorry to have postponed my visit. George George Quitner never made it uh, to Dardenton, um, but uh, was in turn, I believe, uh, moved to Australia um, later in the war and died in 1970. Um, but it's interesting to note the people that uh, mention here, which again tells us more about the individuals that were there and what was thought of it at the time. Um, it felt a, a weird point when when uh, Monica mentioned this this earlier, but um, Anna Gamay is on the right there. Her daughter, Eva Ibbotson, was at the Dartington School at this time and later wrote a book, A Song for, for Summer, which kind of transplants the Dartington Hall idea to Germany, I I believe. Um, uh, I've just started reading it, so um, um, I'm sure it's an interesting work. We can also begin at Dartington to highlight some of the work that was actually going on at Dartington to help refugees and about the refugee life there more broadly. There are various concerts um, and kind of... Uh, drives to help the uh, Spanish uh, refugee population in the UK. And I know we'll be hearing um, about some of the Spanish uh, refugee connections next. Um, again, the uh, Dutton Archive talks about um, concerts in age, uh, in aid for Spanish refugees. The news also highlights um, other instances in which refugees are referred to, um, uh, uh, such as uh, situations uh, wanted, um, the Austrian refugees, gold, 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 twenty, who has a home office permit, um, trained needlewoman, um, and the people within Darton start to take on more refugees during this period. We also see a reference to Heinz um, on third one down uh, Austrian with child of three seats position as uh, governess in family Dartington or Totnes Slovensky Heinz but and obviously a friend of Heinz in some way so the end of my uh, talk is um I suppose right now um I'd like to um kind of highlight that this is not necessarily attempted to be a um a clear a clear focused paper i more wanted to highlight the wide ranging nature of the possibilities of the study of refugees at the dartington hall based on some of the individual documents that are there so really i've only highlighted five or six individual correspondences but hopefully extrapolated those a bit to tell us more ab about it what i didn't touch on is the uh, angle of internment uh, in great depth in, in great depth from Darton. I think that would be a really interesting project to look at upon, upon how the Elmhursts and the artists community there navigated this notion, this kind of phenomenon in 1940-41 of internment. There's also various letters between Dorothy Elmhurst and uh, Jenny Gertz on <laughs> humanitarianism work and helping refugee children in the UK more broadly. I think that would be a really interesting to, to have a look at more. And then also Darton as a space of refuge. And I talked about the kind of many lives of Darton. And I think we can extrapolate this more to talk about the many spaces that existed within that, the many kind of hats which the Elmer has had to, had to wear at different points in time. And I think a space uh, of refuge, or as we've uh, termed it here, a creative sanctuary is something that um, should be looked at um more. so thank you very much for listening to my talk um and i hope to answer any questions uh, if i can so thank you very much
Thank you very much, Charlie. As fully anticipated, that was hugely, hugely interesting and opens up so many new avenues of inquiry, as indeed a good talk should. Um, Fine. Um, I'm looking at the time. We do have some time for questions directly related to Charlie's presentation. So now is the moment. Um, I'm just going to check the chat. Um, I think maybe that's a long comment indeed from Frank from Heinz's son, which everybody could perhaps read for them selves. Um, I could just chip in here. Uh, interesting, you know, sort of prick up my ears at names that are sort of familiar to me. And I read in Etienne Todd's memoir of wartime at Dartington, and Etienne's going to be talking to us tomorrow afternoon, but she mentioned somebody called Trudel. And I didn't know who Trudel was, but now, of course, I, I know. And Etienne, I don't know whether you are with us this morning, whether you might like to say something. Don't feel any obligation at all. But if you'd like to say something about your friend Trudel, this would be a lovely moment to do so. It's and I do see you. You need to un, un, you need to unmute yourself. Just click on the red little the red logo. Can I do it for you? Ask to unmute. It's in. It's in. Yes, lovely. Me? Yes, indeed. Go, yeah. go ahead. <clears throat> Total Randy um, Nursery School. Um, after, I think it was at, towards the end of the war, and she um, uh, was a, a delightful person, wonderful with little children. And there was a brief period before between leaving school and my going to Cambridge mm -hmm. <clears throat> when I helped her there and um, learned a lot from her uh, and liked her very much. Lovely. Thank you, Etienne. We look forward to hearing from you properly uh, tomorrow. So right. does anybody have any specific questions they'd like to ask Charlie at this um, juncture? <clears throat> I'm, sure there, I'm sure there must be some, but uh, they can wait till later, perhaps, if, if necessary. I'm intrigued, um, Charlie, by your mention on two occasions of the Quaker connection, and that's something else mm. that's always interested me. And indeed, there's at least one event on the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel focusing on the Quakers' really pivotal role in helping refugees, which I think is mm. still insufficiently acknowledged. I'd also can't resist saying this is something I was going to kind of keep in reserve almost till the end. But, you know, your point about needing to bring into the picture those who did not escape, those who did not arrive, as you put it, is so crucial, isn't it, in the broader context of this terrible period in, in, in modern history. And I wanted, therefore, to mention one wonderfully creative individual, um, and I was hoping that there would, in fact, be a talk about her, but there isn't. Um, but hopefully there might be a, a chapter in, in a possible book. And that's Otti Berger. Otti Berger will be known, I think, to some of you. She was a talented weaver. She was a senior figure in the Bauhaus in, in interwar Germany. Um, various people tried to help her when she came to this country. She did get out. And there were appeals to the Elmhurst. I mean, you're nodding, Charlie. I don't know whether you'd like to, in fact, say something more about what you've discovered. Because um, um, And um, the reason I mention her is, yes, she did come here, but she didn't thrive. She was deaf, she was hard of hearing, she didn't have good English, languages of course are always crucial, as well as the age which you come, of course, um, and she she didn't succeed really to put down roots in this country at all, and she had an elderly mother in um, Yugoslavia from whence she had come, and when it came to the crunch she went back and she did not survive the Holocaust. So I think you know that's an incredibly poignant story that's very pertinent to what we're looking at today, and I will mention since I've, I've brought up Otti Berger, that there is actually a Berlin-based artist called Judith Raum, together with Tanya Harrod, who's a well-known design historian in this country. And Tanya has actually written uh, an essay specifically on Otti Berger's time in the UK for a forthcoming book that's coming out in the spring mm. about Otti Berger. So I do urge you to look out. Look out. Yeah, I think also on that point, um, my kind of reason for highlighting Ernst Neustadt, even though he, as far as I'm aware, never stepped foot in uh, Dartington, um, was kind of that point that you just made that Monica that even if you did come here, even if you did make mm -hmm. it here, um, that didn't maintain like success, right? And the the uh, Ernst ended up taking like his own life in 1942 mm -hmm. because of the situation that he found him himself in. So I think uh, it's I think it was important for me to highlight both the both the, the people that uh, arrived and also as you as you as you say those that either couldn't make it to Darton directly. But did come to England, or those like Benedict Lackman who were unable to to get here. 
purely because either there, there wasn't space or it was too di too uh, too difficult or as it, in the case of the Elmhurst, uh in the case of uh, Lackman Elmhurst wasn't there to kind of sign off on it so so it, it's just that level of kind of admin that um, sometimes has the uh, emotional effect on people's um, lives indeed indeed uh question from Rose Sawkins um I don't know if you want to read it yourself about uh, yeah. asking if there's a connection is that something you could comment on or maybe if indeed Anna, Anna might um is there was there a connection between Dartington's agricultural experiments and things happening at Seal Hain Agricultural College near Newton Abbott also in Devon Anna Naima I wonder if you can throw any light on that Anna no 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 Okay. Um, yes, actually, I'll, I'll echo what Leah Helsey has just said. Sorry, hello. Y yes, hello. Can you hear me? Sorry. Sorry um, I, I, was, I was going to say that there was, the, uh, the Elmhurst did work together with various people at Sealhane. So ah. there was a kind of interaction like that, but um, nothing, yeah, no, nothing uh, closer than that. Okay. And, you know, Leah commenting a beautiful act to, 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 fundraise for the grave that that I mean you've had this wonderful ability in your talk to animate the archive to bring the personal into the dry you know the dry bones if you like perhaps of uh, the seemingly dry bones of, of, of archival material so thank you so much um for that um I think we'll take a, a break shortly we're running to time remarkable so far um uh, just just one thing that I couldn't help being surprised that you didn't comment on I know again you were had your eye on the clock but you know there's an extraordinary phrase in the letter from von Tirpitz to Elmhurst, and I'm sure you know what I'm about to say. It was something like um, uh, recommending um, Ernst Neuschul to, to Elmhurst and saying uh, he's of Jewish origins, but he has none whatever of the disagreeable, disagreeable. qualities of his race. I mean, oh, my goodness. Yeah, and I wonder they, if you'd like to comment on, on it's that. Such a, th I yeah. think that letter itself is such a it's such an interesting thing in itself because it, it almost sounds like Wolfgang is kind of like apologizing mm. for having for for Neustadt being Jewish. At this point in time, even though Neustadt himself, I don't believe believe have to be that that uh, to recognise with Judaism anyway, but but it's it's an extraordinary thing, and actually, I've I, I don't really know what to make of it at points in time because I've not been able to find anything else about the Volkswagen von Purpitz. I don't know what happened to him during the war. I think he served during the military during the war, um. So whether he was he didn't like Jewish people, but kind of was deferential to his kind of friend. Neustadt is kind of what I've assumed over the point in time. Um, but yeah, it's a fascinating um, uh, thing. I'm just posting in the chat some links to some of the things that I've written on Ernst uh, Neustadt, if people are interested in his story more, more kind Thank of... Thank you. No, it brings up that wider... Yeah very you know problematic issue doesn't it of jewish non-jewish relations in this yeah. period even even in this country never mind in in, in germany which i yeah. think we'll be touching on again in other in other contexts um just as a matter a point of fact everybody i should be able to send everybody a transcript of the chat with all the links embedded in it uh, at, uh, you know once the conference is, is over which i hope will be be useful all right well it's exactly 11 o'clock um so i think we will take half an hour break uh nuria i see that you're now in the audience if you wouldn't mind just sort of hanging about and we'll just check your screen share for the next presentation so we'll reconvene if that's the word on zoom in in half an hour and as i say don't bother to log off unless you particularly want to but uh, probably easiest if, if you don't but i think a, a cup of coffee would be welcome and thank you so much anna and charlie that was a wonderful beginning to our proceedings thank you <coughs> uh nuria are you are you there I, I spotted you here. Here we are. Very good. Lovely. I'm going to add a spotlight. Hi. Let's uh, move Charlie. Good. Nice to see. I was getting slightly worried because you weren't there at the very beginning. Shall we just test the screen share and then you two should have a have a break. Um, I'm going to make you a co-host. Just hold on a second. Um, alphabetical shouldn't it um why is it not um just give, give me a minute now thank you co-host there we go but you should be able to screen share now 
Okay. Do you want to just try? I, I, can't, I can't hear you. Have you said anything yet? Oh, oh, Nuria. Mm. I, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. You, you don't seem to be muted. Um, hmm. That's weird. Do you want to exit and I'll let you in again? Should we try that? It sometimes works. Nuria, are you are you joining us? I hope so. We'll try again. Yes. Nuria? No, still not. Oh, dear. Now, that's very weird. I have actually no idea why that is. Um, uh, mum, mum, mum. Okay, I think it must be something at your end. I mean, you're not muted, according to my screen. <clears throat> check, check your audio se settings. Ah, uh, hold on. Try saying something. No. Um. I'll call Rachel, um, who's um my IT assistant. See if she has any ideas. Is there nothing on the audio settings that looks um to be the reason? Hmm. How strange. I can hear some noise, but I think it's coming from somebody else. Let me just um phone Rachel. <clears throat> Unmute yourself. Why don't you? Why don't you speak to her directly? Okay, it's an odd problem, isn't it? Because there's no no sign of it, the muting being on. I'll, I'll, oh, okay. Th thanks a lot. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, Nuria. My assistant Rachel is going to try and help you. Do you use a Mac or a PC? A PC. Okay. Can you hear me? I've just done. Um... Okay, I'm just okay, going to give a minute. So, um, okay. it's going to be, yeah, and it's something at your end, but I'm a Mac user, so I'm not ever so familiar with, with PCs. Um, I wonder, it's going to be, um, so on your, uh, where do you find your sound settings?
then why it will um it will reveal itself so some i'm just gonna have a little um hang on a sec i'm gonna just check there's gonna be uh No, it's nothing I, we can do at this side. So I wonder whether it's worth um, restarting your your computer. It's not gonna, we can, I can, I'm lip reading. Right, hang on, I'm just gonna, I'm just going. So, um, can I ask what, um, are you using Microsoft? So you haven't got anything, you haven't got like headphones plugged into your, um, at the back, no. Uh. No, I, I at the moment. Let me just um. So it's so that you can hear everything, obviously. So it's microphone. Um. No, I'm just doing I'm just doing a sort of search and um <clears throat> so um it's not muted. Um what about uh you're not um you haven't got your mute button clicked on your on your keyboard so when you go to control panel um have you got um have you got something called sound ah uh, Because it says, I'm just reading here that it says on input, choose a device for speaking. And you've obviously selected the microphone. It's only got one microphone, there isn't an alternative. So it's yeah. So your your volume isn't inadvertently right down at the bottom. Sorry, I know you've probably checked all of these things. Um, uh, so you don't use an external microphone usually. So it, it hasn't flipped to. Um, it's not defaulting to something else. Uh, what about privacy settings? Oh dear. Um, I'm just reading here that on privacy settings there's a microphone, um, allow access to microphone on this device. Uh, do you have a device manager in your control?
because apparently in device manager there's an audio input and output <laughs> Right. It has, I'm guessing it has worked recently. So, um, well, yeah. Oh, you hear you. We hear you. We hear you. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Oh my well, God! You're here. here. You oh, know, God. It, this is something. It is the tune up with the institution. It it has happened. So what yeah, I do yeah. is I have an external microphone. Fantastic. Ah. Here you are. Wonderful. Thanks for having so, you know, done. All, all good, all good. So, listen, I've made you co-host, Nuria, so why don't you, um, you. try screen sharing right now? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's something um, I want to try, yeah. see if I can it's do it. It's wonderful when it works, isn't it, the technology? Yeah, no, it is. Wonderful when it works. <laughs> good. Nuria, how fab. Right, I'm muting myself. I'm Thanks ever so much, Rachel. Yeah. Let me, I'm just going to play around with something, okay? Okay. Um. Can you see that? Uh, yes, all, all good. Okay, so I'm doing it okay. Oh, I'm so happy. All, all good, all good. <laughs> okay, so I just stop sharing for the time being. Now I know I can do it, then I'm fine. Goodness me. Excellent. You know. And you are spotlighted. Let me just double check on that. So all, all I'm all spotlighted. Oh, that's all, even all as well. I always like to be spotlighted. <laughs> very good. I was just explaining at the very beginning that I'm not going to give long biographical introductions. No, 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 don't, don't. And people, I have, people have people yeah. have the biographies. So, so yeah, just... yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've got only 20 minutes and I'm always very careful when I speak exactly. at conferences. With exactly, time. exactly. And also I've got one class later. So I'm, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry about that. But thank yeah, you. No, that's thank okay. You. Don't worry. Don't worry, Monica. Very good. Okay. Were you able to listen into the previous two talks? I have been, I have been listening. I haven't good. had the screen good. on because I always think it is better uh, to have the, no, you no, know, that's the the face of when people are talking but i love i love the, the two talks i really did it sets, sets the scene well doesn't it yeah i know it definitely does Excellent. it definitely does okay well i'm actually going to go and walk around a little bit more i've got a slight yeah, back so it's not not good to be sitting for so long but nice to have you <laughs>
Nuria. It's Hello. Just occurred to me, I probably will butcher your name. So it's Nuria Captevilla Arguelles. Yeah, the, you, oh my God, that's brilliant. Okay, all right. That's really <laughs> my good. My Spanish is not brilliant, but I have I have some Spanish. So, okay, no, no, that's you, you're doing really well. That's really, really good. I wish my colleagues were able to say it. <laughs> okay, very good. All right. Is my volume okay? Now I know how to put it even higher up with this external microphone. All good, all good. I've got a, what well, feels like a mis mis mosquito bite right in my arm. CD. Tuna. Connect it up.
Thank you. I make it 27 minutes past, so we will uh, resume shortly. Very good. Well, welcome back. We're going to resume in a minute. If everybody could make sure that they are still muted, I'd be I'd be grateful. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Very good. I now make it exactly half past 11, so it's time to, to resume. Good. I hope you've all had a chance to have a good stretch and <laughs> refresh yourselves. Um, so it's my very, very great pleasure now to welcome uh, Nuria Captevilla Arguelles from um, Exeter University. She's the uh, Professor of Hispanic Studies and also Gender Studies there to be shifting the focus or perhaps focusing for a while on the Spanish Civil War refugees and one in particular who sounds absolutely fascinating. As um, Charlie mentioned in his wonderful introductory talk, clearly what was going on in Spain was an extreme you know, sort of concern to many people in this country and to the Elmhurst in particular. And while I'm an expert on the sort of refugees from Nazism aspect of things, I am of course also very interested and eager to know more about the Spanish Civil War contingent, if that's the right word. So over to you, Nuria, with very great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and it's absolutely wonderful to be here today. And, and uh, I've, uh, I've really enjoyed listening the, to the two previous presentations uh, on, on Dartington, because obviously I'm not an specialist on, on Dartington Hall. Uh, I'm, I'm someone who has enjoyed seeing it very, very often. But I am a specialist on, on, uh, on Spanish women's history, uh, and especially the history of, of Spanish feminism. And um, I've been very interested uh, to hear uh, this, this morning, uh, Dr. Anna Neyma talking about uh, projects of, of regeneration uh, in, in, of society following the World War. And it's a very interesting word to be using because 
the idea of regeneration was used um, to talk about my home country uh, from, I think, quite before, uh, before it was used here in the UK. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about Margarita Comas and the world around her. And I, Margarita Comas, um, I'm just going to be admitting people, Monica, or are you doing that? Sorry. Okay. So, so Margarita Comas Camps, who was a Spanish exile who worked in Dartington between 1942 and 1972, and, and she has recently featured in my project Cartas Vivas, who I, which I will be sharing with you shortly, uh, a part of that project. Uh, but, you know, um, very kindly, Lena Schifrin kind of got me in touch with quite a few of, of the students of Margarita Comas. And what I realized is that, you know, they remember a very, very stern teacher. And they also remember two other Spanish exiles that uh, that worked in Dartington, Caridad and Marina, Rodriguez Vega. Uh, but actually, people really didn't know who Margarita was prior to to 1936, prior to the Spanish Civil War, why he, she couldn't be in Spain and why she ended up in the United Kingdom. And I think that is the, that is the story uh, I want to share with you today. And, and in a sense also, um, it kind of lead you a bit also into, into the group of Spanish exiles uh, in the United Kingdom who are not as well known as the Spanish exiles in Mexico, or in Russia or in France, but actually constituted an, a very interesting intellectual community. Now, so Margarita Comas was born in 1892 and, and, and she died in 1972. Um, so she didn't make it to go back to a democratic Spain and, and so many exiles were kind of hoping to go back to Spain after Franco died in 1975. Uh, but, Margarita uh, was a product of, of uh, what we call in Spanish el regeneracionismo, uh, a regener regenerationist attitude that crystallized in Spain following 1898. And this is important because in 1898, Spain st stopped being great. It wasn't an empire anymore. It, it, she lost, the nation lost its last colonies, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Filipinas. And um, the country embarked on, on a quest to change, to progress, to modernize. Uh, and a very important institution called the Free Institute of Education started, started get, uh, becoming more and more important uh, as the 20th century started and um, progressed. Part of that Free Institute of Education, which in terms of ethos was really similar to, to Dartington Hall, was to promote the education of women. Something that I always say to my students when I teach history of Spanish feminism is that there is a key difference between British feminism and Spanish feminism. Uh, whereas the right to achieve the vote, um, the right to, uh, to suffrage was absolutely a key pillar in the development of feminism in the UK. In Spain, a key pillar of the development of feminism was the right to have an education for girls and whether to educate boys and girls together or not. And that was something that interested Margarita Comas from very, very early in her career. It's also, key, I would say, to remember that Margarita Comas was born in the Balearic Islands in Menorca. And she was the daughter of a fantastic pedagogist called Gabriel Comas and a fantastic teacher. So she came from a family in which teaching was greatly valued and education was really, really important. And she became, early in the 20th century, um, one of the first women to gain a doctorate in the sciences. So she was part of the world of the Free Institute of Education, which had its seat in Madrid, but soon in the first decade of the 20th century, it spread out throughout Spain in different smaller institutions that promoted the education for the masses and the education for boys and girls. So in that world, little Margarita grew up and, and started studying and then moved to Barcelona after studying also in Maon and, and in Mallorca, she moved to Barcelona to start her training as a teacher and at the same time to start studying science. 
And from very early, early on in her training, she realized that it, she realized something that is really, really important nowadays, and is that girls should study science. And that would be a key theme of all her writing until 1936, until she, she kind of, the, the war started and she had to stop all, all the work that she, that she had been doing. Now, um, I am mentioning before, I mentioned before the, the, the world of exiles that kind of stemmed from Dartington and kind of connected, it connected itself to other places in the UK, mainly London. Margarita came to the UK for the first time in the early 1930s, and um, she came with a scholarship from an institution called La Junta de Ampliación de Estudios. Being immersed in that world that had as its central premise the idea that for Spain to be great again, the masses had to be regenerated, educated, and Spain had to stop being the country with the worst rate of illiteracy, that was absolutely central to the education proposal in which Margarita was, was forming herself in. Part of that world was an organization called La Junta de Ampliación de Estudios, founded by José de Castillejo. Castillejo was married to a, a British, um, to an English lady called Irene Clermont de, de Castillejo. Irene Clermont, a fantastic psychoanalyst living in, in, in London. And Castillejo gave a, a Margarita Comas her first scholarship to come to the UK to observe different schools in the South and learn about the different ways in which science was being taught and incorporated into the curriculum. She believed science should be present for boys, for both boys and girls from primary school until the highest levels of education. Um, Margarita represented um, the newest form of Spain called Mopol cosmopolitan egalitarian. And she believed that Spain had to align itself with Europe if it wanted to regenerate itself. She was an institutionista woman, active cosmopolitan, uh, learning languages and engaging with other nations. She also traveled to France and also accompanied by her father was very keen to learn about how science was being taught all over Europe. Um, interestingly enough, when 1936 arrives and the war starts, and, and there's something else I should mention, um, I don't know how much Spanish history people know, but in 1931, Spain became a second republic. And between 1931 and 1933, which were key years in the formation of Margarita Comas, Spain advanced very quickly in the promotion of equality between the sexes, very, very quickly. A lot of laws were passed, divorce, abortion. Um, those of you who follow Netflix and, and, and know the, the, the series Cable Girls, that reflects exactly that time, equal pay, maternity rights. Um, so the position of citizens of women was changed very, very quickly. Conservative sectors saw that as a betrayal to the essence of the nation, to Spanishness. While Margarita progressed as a really cosmopolitan and modern scholar, the identity that she represented, um, a modern woman, feminist, that believed in the equality of the sexes in education and that believed in the education of the masses, was also being deeply, deeply problematized in Spain. The country was giving a huge push forward to women's rights at a time in which those rights were being taken aback. Uh, in all in other European countries. 1936 arrived and, and Margarita Comas found herself being represented like her generation of feminists as the emblem of anti-Spanishness. Now, she, we don't know very sure where she was when the civil war started. Some scholars say that she was in Menorca, some others say that she was in the UK, but she was traveling. That is something that we know for sure. Uh, and um, she came to the UK in 1937 with the last scholarship from the Junta de Ampliación de Estudios, and she never came back to Spain, uh, not until very late during Francoism. 
She started working in Dartington Hall in 1942. And there is a fantastic anecdote. I think it is really, really interesting to share with you all. The students didn't want her. Um, what was doing this, this foreign, uh, foreign teacher speaking such bizarre English, probably with an accent similar to mine, I would say. And they didn't like her. Um, and, uh, and in a letter to her brother, she mentioned how they climbed to the tables and, and they didn't like her approach at all. But she said, you know, try me. She said to the director of Dartington, try me and let me work for free for a couple of weeks. And if I cannot convince the students and the staff that I really am made to, I'm made to, be, I'm made to be here, then, you know, I will go. But actually, she managed to to uh, to do things okay, and the students soon grew to like her. And uh, it's been really fantastic for me to to see how many um, of her students are still alive and 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 do remember her. Um, by the time she died, there is something um, um, a former student wrote about her that I think it is really beautiful to share. Um, uh, Bridget Edwards wrote about Margarita Comas Camps, the Spanish woman soon knew more about the environment of Dartington than many of us who had lived there for years. Um, I'm not sure if that... Oh, you ...education of the Free Institute of Education in which... in which... Um, Education had to be practical and students learning science, Margarita taught biology and chemistry, the students learning that had also to learn to draw, had to be out in the fields and she favored the practical education that was condemned in Spain after 1936 and that, you know, she was able to carry out in Dartington until she retired in 1972. Margarita was married. And one of the great things that Darkington did for her was helping her bring her husband to Spain, from Spain to the um, uh, to, to Devon, to the United Kingdom. Her husband, Guillem Bestard, a photographer and painter, um, also aligned with the Spanish uh, Second Republic, um, couldn't get out of Spain uh, in 1938 or 1939. Interestingly enough, a boat brought to Dartington in 1939 to other very eminent exiles, the musician Gustavo Duran, and, and also um, the army officer Federico de la Iglesia. And we have that, that group of Spaniards that comes to the UK in 1939 uh, and aided by the British government, but Margarita's husband was not there. She wasn't yet attached to Dartington, but between 1942 and 1946, so Margarita had been uh, separated from her husband for a decade, uh, for 10 years that uh, they were apart, but between 1942 and 1946, Dartington Hall helped Margarita bureaucratically to be able to, you know, to bring Guillem Bestard uh, to the UK. And in Dartington, they lived until until um, um, until their death. Guillem died in 1970 and Margarita died in 1972 in Exmouth. Um, they managed to go back to Spain uh, late in Francoism as an, as a, as an anecdote. Um, I like to also mention that their family didn't even dare saying Margarita was Margarita and they talk about her as if she was a distant relative. At the time that she goes back to, um, to Spain, the generation that she represented, the generation, the first generation of feminists with the awareness of being a group, they had become ghosts. Either silent in Spain, not saying anything, very discreet and very hidden, or exiling Mexico, that network had been lost. Uh, and here in the UK, a few of them remained. Um, connected between Devon and London, between Margarita and Irene Clermont de Castillejo, we have a small a network of, of intellectuals, men and women, and a few really interesting feminist figures that soon will be appearing in a project that I would like to now, just to finish my talk, present to you very briefly. I, I have a project called cartasvivas.com uh, with which I aim to bring for Spanish and non-Spanish audiences uh, basically the legacy of this generation of women that played an active part in, in the regeneration of Spain prior to 1936 and were then 
forgotten by the regime. Something that I want as a Spaniard is to really, really promote their work and their legacy for the students of Hispanic studies worldwide and also for Spaniards. So I'm going to share my screen now with you and show you a small film capsule in which an actress becomes Margarita and brings for us all her words and her proposal uh, for education. So I'm going to do that now. So I'm hoping that you can see it. Uh, this is part of my project Cartas Vivas. So we have three Cartas Vivas letters from the past. And I'm just gonna show you the last one in which we are going to listen to Margarita's education proposal, pedagogical proposal, and also see the wonderful actress Maite Jauregui representing Ha. If you look at the background, you'll see many things that I suppose are familiar to you, buildings from Dartington and also some of the books that uh, Margarita Comas published about the schools in the UK and about how to teach science to all ages that she published while in exile, gathering all her writings and having them coming out in Argentina. So there we go. Here comes Margarita Comas for all of us. <laughs> Que sepa contar, que sepa que le ha puesto para esta joda. Es característico de la evolución humana el avance en tierra. Cuesta mucho adquirir un nuevo principio, una nueva idea, una nueva organización social. Y una vez se ha llegado a ello, se va demasiado lejos. Y el paso siguiente no es un avance, sino un retroceso seguido de una serie de oscilaciones en uno y otro sentido, hasta llegar a la consolidación plana. En el arte, en la política, en la moda, encontraríamos ejemplos típicos. La educación tampoco es una excepción. Las ciencias reclaman un sitio en la escuela únicamente porque representan un movimiento de capital importante en la evolución del espíritu humano. No por su mayor o menor utilidad, sino por su eficacia como disciplina. Como el latín y el griego, sirven para humanizar las mentes jóvenes. Como la literatura y el arte, las ciencias son una de las grandes expresiones históricas del espíritu. El movimiento científico del siglo XIX hizo que las ciencias fueran entrando en la educación. Se creyó que esto iba a ser remedio eficaz contra todos los defectos que padecía la enseñanza, una especie de panacea universal. Y ante la rectificación marcada por la experiencia, siguiendo un movimiento de péndulo, se vuelve a pensar que tal vez las ciencias necesitan llenar su objeto, servir para formar personas, no tener un carácter meramente informativo. Una buena enseñanza científica cultiva en el alma el espíritu de observación, la serenidad, el dominio de una misma, la costumbre de buscar las causas a las cosas, el orden, la cautela en las afirmaciones, la admiración por la naturaleza, la modestia y la tolerancia. La niña, el niño, hará ciencia y sentirá las mismas emociones que el descubridor o el sabio. Experimentará como ellos un sentimiento de responsabilidad. Pondrá en juego todo su yo, y no solo su memoria o su inteligencia. No queramos que las pequeñas cabezas estén bien amuebladas, sino bien construidas para que se desarrolle una civilización mixta y no meramente masculina. Mi preparación personal adolece de muchos defectos que yo quiero evitarles a mis alumnas. Yo sé más... ...enseñar las ciencias 
uniendo enseñanza e instrucción. Lo hice. Thank you very much. I I think my time is up. I I hope that you've enjoyed also seeing a version uh, of Margarita Comas uh, and uh, and you engage with the project and 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 discover also about Irene Clermont de Castillejo and Carmen Zulueta and all the names that actually started their exile uh, in the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nuria. That was that was so interesting. Um, Right. What I suggest we do now, we have a little bit of time to play with. I have a few questions specifically for you, and I'm sure that other people will as well. And then I will invite Charlie and um, um, Anna to come back on screen, you know, to spotlight them. And maybe we can have some sort of not concluding, but, you know, some sort of group discussion and take things a little a little further. Um, first of all, the text that the actress was reading, is this drawn from one particular publication or, or written source? Yes, um, the text that, that she's reading is one of the articles that Margarita Comas uh, wrote about on the equality uh, of, of, uh, of, of the sexes in terms of education. She wrote quite a bit about that. Uh, and that was a huge, huge debate in Spain. Writing about that would have got her into trouble uh, because... Um, between, especially between 1931 and 1936, uh, the debate got quite heated uh, and religious orders have had the monopoly of education in Spain for a very long time. And those who, de who defended co-education and also that girls did the sports, uh, et cetera, were, were then um, stopped from teaching after 1936. And in many cases, uh, and there has been a recent documentary on the teachers from the Spanish Republic, um, um, the processes of, of, uh, of being what we call depuradas uh, were incredibly brutal. I mean, I hope one thing that I also should say is that our transition to democracy is full of mute grandmothers, of, of women who don't say anything. And, and for me, those are the symptoms of the margaritas of our past. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I noticed also in the background uh, against which the actress was, was, was talking, there was a Las, uh, Las Escuelas Nuevas. Um, yes. Tell us more about that, because that was, had a specific English focus, didn't it? Yeah, the Escuelas Nuevas, it was an international uh, uh, movement uh, and the... Uh, and also one in which the Spaniards, Cosío, were very, very interested in changing the way uh, teaching was taught and creating a new school, in the case of Spain, for a new Spain. So, and there were a few um, new institutions that were created in Spain following all the ideology of the Escuelas Nuevas. There was La Institución Libre de Enseñanza, of course, the Instituto Escuela, uh, Margarita's father had, had been a leader in the Balearic Islands in, in promoting that sort of Escuela Nueva ideology that, you know, Margarita then would find in Dartington Hall. But uh, all of Margarita's writing on Las Nuevas Escuelas, these schools in the UK, was burned in 1937. Uh, in in Mallorca as a punishment. Actually, I forgot to mention that, and I think it is a, a really, really, uh, you know, poignant uh, anecdote. Hmm. Absolutely. It's deeply shocking, isn't it? And not sufficient mm. about yeah. this country, for sure. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned in your abstract, uh, I think I'm right in saying that she also worked with Basque refugee children yeah. in England. Yeah. I wondered if you might say something more about that. Uh, yeah. 4,000 Basque children came in, 19, uh, in 1937. Uh, and, and you know, there, um, the committee, there is a still uh, a committee of us children active and the descendants of those children, are, I believe, they still get together and are in touch. And Margarita became a sort of, became a sort of mother figure, kind of uh, liaising uh, with uh, Spanish parents, writing letters, etc., raising money. Uh, and, uh, and I think the two teachers that she then brought 
to, to Dartington uh, were Basque children. Um, quite a few groups of children were sent away from, uh, from Spain during, uh, during the war. There was, there was the 4,000 that came to the UK and that stayed in London and then in different colonies. And there were also the children that were sent to Mexico, which that was a really, really unfortunate story, the Morelia children, in a sense that the exile in the UK is a really beautiful story of exile mm -hmm. without uh, major traumas um, kind of popping up in the present. Um, and, and I suppose we need to also credit Margarita for that because she really was very involved with the Basque children uh, until, until very late in the 1940s. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I wanted to pick up on that because I sort of pricked up my ears again, sort of mm. suspecting interesting connections. And there was a camp, I think, in fact, on the South Coast called Stoneham Camp, which was for Basque children. I don't know if that has come up in your researches, but I am almost certain I'm right in saying that a very mm. interesting Austrian Jewish communist okay. photographer called Edith Tudor Hart produced right. wonderfully mm. empathetic photographs of the Basque children there. Mm. And there's more to it than that, because actually, I think, again, it was Etienne Todd's in her uh, wartime memoir, which I can also provide a link to because it's on it's mm. online. She mentions that one of her best friends was Delia Tudor Hart and the whole Tudor Hart family. Mm is really mm. quite interesting I just you know I'm just wondering what what links might be made there but is well, it really a name you've come across at all no I don't know no, I haven't but this is an area I am researching now because um I mean for me it has been fantastic to find my exile close to where I work in Exeter because um um I do work a lot with with uh, um, a small archives uh, in Mexico, in France, in Madrid, uh, in the United States, uh, and and um, I really really wanted to have an exile to work with that was that was um, that was close to where I work. It's something I suppose you know quite emotional for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, what, when you work with, um, with the Spanish women exiles, you discover always, always fantastic networks. So the one thing that I have got pending to do is to look at different key archives that feature in my research. For example, the one uh, of Carmen Conde in Cartagena in Southern Spain that contains about 33,000 letters between Carmen Conde, the writer Carmen Conde and all Hispanic exiles and I'm hoping to find some key connections there and, and, and perhaps some new leads to, to use, apart from the ones I'm already following, which are uh, the Clermont Castillejo, um, the Clermont Castillejo uh, marriage, especially, you know, with, with whom uh, Margarita was involved. Jose de Castillejo and Irene Clermont, the psychoanalyst, graduated from Newnham College. Uh, Castillejo, a very eminent Spanish exile. Uh, in London, he died in 1945, and he was involved uh, in the creation of the uh, Instituto Republicano Español, the Spanish Republican Institute that stopped working in 1950, and with which Margarita was also involved, kind of promoting uh, the legacy, the pedagogy of the Spanish Second Republic and the Free Institute of Education. I'm also curious, Nuria, to know if there are other people you're in touch with or maybe not yet in touch with who are working in this more broad terrain of you know the Spanish Civil War Republican refugees who ended up on uh, on UK soil is this a topic that's being sufficiently explored would you say no I don't think so I mean it, we do have work on on a few very eminent male exiles uh, like you know Arturo Barea and Chavez uh, but I think we need to start looking at uh, at um, the archives of, of women exiles and the the Spanish exile in the UK is the one that is a study, I would say, less of all. Mexico had such a, a very important, received so many Spanish exiles, uh, Argentina as well, Argentina too, and also, and also New York. And it so happens also that the UK was very often the first stop for the exile uh, of, um, of many Spaniards before going to Latin America. Many of them, Carmen Fulueta and all her family, the Vesperos, lived in Norwich and spent, uh, you know, a, a year or two in the UK before deciding what to do with their lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think also you have to realize that, that you know, come 1939, some people were still hopeful that something would happen and, and Franco wouldn't be in power for, for um 
for that many uh, for that many years. Uh, I mean, it is it was such a such a long dictatorship, um, and uh, and as the 1940s advanced, and of course there there was there was also the Second World War, uh, refugees started to accept that there probably was no going back until who knows when, uh, and uh, and in the case of Margarita she went back with Guillem, with her husband, but, you know, it, it was traumatic. It was difficult. The family didn't, didn't even dare saying who they were, despite the fact that it was the 1960s when they went back for the first time. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have, uh, no, hold on. Yes, more, more comments coming in. Uh, I'm also just curious. I'm going to hand over to, I think I'd like to bring Charlie into the conversation as um, as well, but just tell us a little bit more, maybe before I, I spread the net wider to, to the audience, um, about her husband. You mentioned intriguingly mm -hmm. a photographer uh, and a painter. Where can we see his work? You know what? I've been trying to find it, and 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 I had a thanks to you. I had a lovely, uh, lovely tea once with with uh, Lena, who I'm not sure is if she's around, and we we talked about them a bit, and I. The one thing I know about Guillem is that she, he was a photographer and, and he also painted watercolors. And once a year, he sold his watercolors in Darlington, once a year. So perhaps someone in the audience can actually uh, can actually tell us where we can find some of his paintings. But I ha actually have been unable and I've been trying to find some of his, of his works. There must be traces somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think... Because politically, uh, he must have been very controversial. He had to hide. And it looks to me uh, to be like one of those artists that actually, in a sense, accept they are going to be secondary and they are not going to keep an archive. Mm. Mm. Please okay. may I say something. No. Yes, indeed. Sorry, I'm not sure who that is. Um, let let me also bring in. Let me bring in Charlie because Charlie had something to contribute. I have to say, um, I've got lots of Guillermo's pictures. Oh, for goodness' That's sake! Sorry, who, who who is that talking? Mm -hmm. Who who's talking? It's me, Gabriella. Gabriella, oh, oh. hold on. Sorry, it's just tricky on the screen. Let me let me find you and bring you up if I can. I must be able to find you. Hold on a second. Uh, where, where are you? Hold on, hold on, hold on, sorry, and. Uh, just, okay. just give, give me a moment, Gabby. Just give me a moment. This is one of the delights of gatherings like this, that all sorts of things <laughs> sort of uh, come out as a result. Why can't I find yeah. you? So many people just, oh, hold on. Um, hmm. Hold on, let me. I'm just going to type my email because I would love anyone who knows about the Spaniards to please get in touch as well. So I'm going to... To put right. my email in the chat. Why can't I find you, Gabby? You must be. And Charlie, I'm going to. Sorry, I'm going to. Monica, I can see her there. Gabs. Yeah, and no, I'm sure. I'm sure that's right. It's just. Her? Um, let me. Um, she's waving. <laughs> she's waving. Okay. Not <laughs> waving, but drowning. <laughs> no, no. I hope oh not. my goodness. Uh, <laughs> why can't I? Uh, some everybody ought to come up on the top here. Oh, there she is. Hold on. I've spotted you. Lovely. Hold on. <laughs> Good. Add spotlight. Um, good. This is Gabrielle or Gabby. Hello. Labs, 40 as she was known, who you'll be hearing from uh, in more detail tomorrow. But please ca carry on, carry on. Please. I just, I just wanted to tell Nuria that her talk was absolutely brilliant. Thank and you. I've got many, many pictures by Guillermo because mm. my husband was an art who was a Hungarian Jew refugee. He had an artist material shop and he, when Margarita died, the, the Gilly, Guillermo's pictures were there in a shop in Totnes and nobody seemed to be interested. So Paul bought them all up and I've got them all here in my flat. I would love, I would love to Come see and them. Come see me. <laughs> oh, I would love to see Please you. drop That's me a line, Gabriela, please. You know, the thing is, um, I... In my project, Cartas Vivas, a lot of the things that you will listen by the women who are there have come from a small archives, uh, and I'm incredibly committed not, you know, not to, um, not to have the women from my country and our kind of feminist for mothers forgotten. So, well, I think I must have at least ten or twelve of Guillermo's pictures. Well, so if you come to London and see me, I shall. Oh yes, yes, I'd love to. Can you 
Please drop me a line. I've put my email in the chat and I'd love to oh, just to you get your details. I don't understand chat. Do don't worry. Gabby, I'm, I'm sure Monica I will, can help. I'll put you in touch with each other directly. Worry yeah, not. Thank you so much. Technology will not defeat us. No, absolutely not. Okay. Charlie, do you want to chip yeah. in? I think I um, and Gabby, I should just add that Gabby is the daughter of Ludwig Rosenberg, so there's a direct connection with the archive in the Wiener Charlie, Library. Charlie knows all about me. I know Charlie does, but not everybody else does yet. Oh, <laughs> Charlie, so do you nice. want to just wonderful. Ch chip in at this point and just Charlie. talk a little bit more about your findings in the archive? Yeah, no, no I was just going to oh, say there's... Spanish now, get out the way. All right, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was just going to say there's, there's a, some interesting letters, as I said, in the in the chat from... Um, between Dorothy and uh, Margarita about uh, Guillermo. And um, he, I think Dorothy wrote to the US ambassador and there were, and it's really interesting because there's a, there's copies of the letters that she sent on like the backs of forms and things like that. So they're all just randomly typed out to kind of keep uh, mm -hmm. there, but there's about five or six okay. letters in there. And I, I, I came a, a, a crossman. I saw that like, you were doing the talk. I thought yeah. that I won't put. The, but, that's uh, wonderful. The, that's the that's there. that's wonderful. I mean, I've managed to get hold of of uh, Margarita's um, reports on on her experiences of travel in the UK and visiting a school that I've managed to read. Uh, um, I, she was an unbelievable woman. Um, I think, and also don't forget. Also, I don't know if you've come across him, Gustavo Duran. No. Who married Bonte Crompton, who was a niece of the uh, of the Elmhurst, okay. uh, and Gustavo Duran was a friend of Federico Garcia Lorca, Dalí, and Buñuel. Uh, so a very very important group of of, of intellectuals, uh, and he was a really gifted musician. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in 1936, he cut his his uh, kind of long blonde hair and became a fantastic army officer. A uh, really, really good um, military man and responsible, like Federico de la Iglesia, for the education of soldiers, also in the um, in the Republican Army, because they that that kind of that idea of educating the masses was taken forward during the war in the Republican Army, and and the soldiers uh, who didn't know um, how to read and write learn to read and write, learn to appreciate poetry and the theater, learn to know about uh, learn learn about art, learn about maths, and, and that is something that continued during the war effort, and it continued thanks to Gustavo Duran, who also started his exile in Dartington. Fascinating, yeah. absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Uh, Anna Naima in our audience now, and I don't know whether she's absented herself. Anna, are, are you there? Because I'd like to bring you back in to the conversation if you are. Uh, Anna Naima, yeah. Is she, mm. Are you still there, Anna? I think she may have had to... I don't think she... No, I, th I think not. Uh, fine. Um, we've got an interesting um, comment from Rose. Rose, I don't know if you'd like to unmute yourself and tell us about the person you're referring to in the chat. Yes. Oh, uh -huh. do you know Kate Cameron? Nuria? No, I don't. The name sounds familiar. Uh, but she's I at the University of Exeter. I've just googled her. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I know, I know of Kate. Yes, she teaches mm. French and performance, uh, yeah. but she made this extraordinary show at Dartington mm. called Song for Europe, which yeah, you know, when a theatre show is, it just imprints itself, and you never forget it. Especially mm. one image in the middle of that show was of her, her fellow, uh, well. I think, I can't remember if Kate was in it as well, but certainly Motsi, mm -hmm. who was a Spanish actress, or, or I don't even know if she was an actress, but she, Kate had met her and she'd brought her and made this project called A Song for Europe. And I remember it in Studio One at Dartington and Motsi in a, in a spotlight. I'm going to cry talking about it, so I won't start, but it was so fantastic. I think it was, I think she was Catalonian or Basque. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I can't remember. Yeah. But she sang this extraordinary song yeah. in Spanish. Yeah. What year would that have been, like. Rose? What, what year that was that? Have been. Jane, if Jane's still here, she mm -hmm. might know. But it was I was there 85 to 89. So it was probably well, it was sometime between those two years. Mm -hmm. And Kate will tell you, she's at you know, she's at Exeter. So yeah. um mm -hmm. she yeah, I'll ask about Motsi. Um yeah. I can't remember her surname, but I just remember this extraordinary moment, which was mm -hmm. spectacular. 
Well, you know, there is also the Jules Dance Company, which was related to Darkenton, and one of the daughters of, of uh, Jose de Castillejo and Irene Clermont was also a dancer there. So I keep oh. on finding connections, mm -hmm. and I, I, I think it is wonderful because, you know, I am a Hispanist, but I, I, I love them on. I, you know, this is the place where I've lived for now nearly 20 years. Uh, um, and I also would like to share with everyone one thing, that this thing that I do, the researching um, uh, women's history, if I've been able to do it, it is because I became a Hispanist in this country. Uh, when I started my career, my, you know, oblivion was so important in Spain that I couldn't do the research I wanted to do. Mm. Uh, and I owe a lot to the to the United Kingdom in being able to connect with the legacy of, of the generation of my grandmother. You must mm. talk to Kate. She's she's a great mm. character. I haven't seen her since college, but she was she was yeah, she's pretty special. I would I would get in touch with her. Good. And I've just noticed a note in the chat from Isla Goldhahn, who's one of the organisers of the symposium in Hamburg in November, which I shall mention at the end. Isla, don't let me forget to do that. Um, but uh, she's saying I'm in touch with Kate Cameron. Happy to tell you about her work and pass on your email, Nuria, if that is helpful. So yeah, and I, I will look her up. I, you know, if she's here, you know, I will look her up. And in fact, I, I'm pretty sure I've been I've been working with her in some committee sort of things. I'm pretty sure because it's just so many people. Very good. Charlie, can I ask you, we'll, we'll wind up for the lunch break um, yeah. fairly soon. It's a shame that Anna, Anna, Naima, you're not, you're not here, are you? Because I was wanting to rope you into this concluding discussion. Maybe we can come back to you later if, if the occasion arises. But Charlie, I mean, are you aware of other Spanish Civil War connections in the course of your researches that you could just um, mention to us? I was thinking about this. I, I, the only one I remember of, of, from any uh, major, like, La Cressy was La Marguerite Comas. And as I said in my talk, there's various references to concerts and things like that in the news of the day yeah. at Dartington. As yeah. for mm. as for other people there, I I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um I don't think any were listed in the refugee indexes mm. that I mentioned at the start and those were the ones that I kind of started off and then went from there with um they weren't mentioned in there there um, is of course Gustavo Duran's uh Duran and Comte's children Shelley mm. Duran uh, uh and Jane Duran and Lucy Duran and mm. and they are all writers um and um and and two of them living in London I'm not sure about Shelley yeah uh, but there are also the Duran the Duran Bontom children the thing is, I think also this 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 kind of brings us back to the point that that I made at the start of the the thing that the Dartington archive is a weird archive anyway. That yeah, th that there are many things in there that aren't that might be that might have been very important in the kind of overall life of Dartington. They just don't appear. Um, so I wouldn't be I wouldn't be shocked if there were a lot more things like that that that, that appeared at Dartington that just don't appear. In yeah, I, I tell you, reasons. you know, I'm going to just throw you uh, something that I found out uh, uh, reading, uh, uh, like a network of midwives, of Spanish midwives that came to the UK. <laughs> uh, exile, <laughs> and they yeah. worked between London and Devon. That I know it existed. I'm kind of yeah. chasing it up and I'm trying to find out names. That would be uh, great, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Just, no, in case you knew. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know somebody who's just about to publish a book on the refugees from Nazism and the nursing profession. So interesting, mm. possible uh, intersections there. Um, Nuria, do you know of any connection between Margarita and uh, a German-born refugee called Marie Neurath? No, I don't. Because also, she was a pioneer in very attractive-looking science books for children. No, uh, I don't. But one thing also with, with Margarita is that, you know, once she was settled in Dartington, um, anything that she published was her own writing, publishing it again in, in Argentina, where many exiles were having their books uh, uh, published or compiled, because she says that she was very, very busy. She taught 30 hours per week, and, and she didn't, uh, I think she became more or less a teacher, less of a researcher, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the last um, decades of her life. I just wondered if their paths had crossed because Marie Noyat's another very interesting, yeah. not sufficiently known, you know, female. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if Etain wanted to ask something. Oh, because Etain, she was sorry. Her hand. 
forgive me. Um, Etienne, un, 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 you have to unmute yourself again, Etienne. Just click, click, no, no, Etienne, click on the red logo, bottom left on your screen, I think. We cannot. Uh, yes, that, now we should I be able to unmute un her. <laughs> now we can hear you. I just. I, I was taught by Margarita, ah, wow. and I will. Um, I I will talk, uh, something about it tomorrow afternoon. But I wanted to also say that Marina and Carito Rodriguez were yeah, my yeah. friends throughout. Yeah. My they were older than me, but. Yeah. Um, I knew them throughout their lives, mm -hmm. and I, I wrote their obituaries for okay. the news of the day and, and yeah. similar organizations, mm -hmm. so that I did research it all, mm -hmm. um, that extraordinary journey mm -hmm. from Bilbao to Southampton mm -hmm. that they were on the boat they were on and so on. Yeah. Um, yeah. I could either talk about that tomorrow or a bit more now, as you think, um, but otherwise, um, you could get in touch with me. Well, you two again must be put in direct touch with each other. Totally, totally. That, totally. that happens. How wonderful! Living history. There's nothing like it, is it? That sort of sense I, of it's the most wonderful thread. thing. Absolutely. Um, all right. Another comment from Rose. I was taught Spanish at school in South London by Kerouche. That's an Isle of Man name. Okay. Well, that's another <laughs> interesting connection. Does anybody else have any questions that they'd like to put to Nuria or indeed to Charlie? Okay, well, I'm going to just throw one extra ingredient into the mix, which has always interested me. I've written, I haven't yet mentioned the book that acted as a companion volume to the Insiders Outsiders project. And I will let everybody know there's even a discount on the cover price available, but it's called Insiders Outsiders, Refugees from Nazi Europe and Their Contribution to British Visual Culture, which is a rather long-winded <laughs> subtitle, but there you are. But in it, I've actually, among other things, I was the contributing editor and I wrote a piece on Hampstead in the 1930s because Hampstead, as many of you all know, is an absolute extraordinary, again, hub of cultural interchange, including in many cases, the refugees. And one of the things I mentioned in that chapter that there was in uh, living in Keats Grove, which was very close to Roland Penrose and various other people we're gonna hear more about, I think later today, uh, an MP called um, Wilfred Roberts, who happened to be the brother of Winifred Nicholson, the painter, first wife of Ben Nicholson. But he was so pro-Republican in his politics that he was actually dubbed popularly the MP for Spain. And I, any of that? I think, and I haven't yet ascertained exactly what this connection is, but am I not right? And it's a shame Anna's not here. Maybe we, we I can ask her uh, at some other point. But but I think the Elmhurst did actually have a, a base, certainly in London, but actually mm. that there were Hampstead connections. I don't know, yeah. Charlie, are, are you aware of this at did. all? And I'm just yeah. curious how Hampstead and Dartington might perhaps have interlinked. Yeah, I think they they did. I definitely saw references to Hampstead, but Anna would be the best person to answer it on the. The Madariaga but... family lived also in in Hampstead. Very important. It was ah. King, King Alfonso the Thirteenth, professor of Spanish of University of Oxford, Salvador de Madariaga, and uh, and his daughters Asita and I I've forgotten the name of the other the Madariaga sisters, which helped a lot the the Spanish refugees starting uh, starting a life in the UK or traveling to you know the other side of the ocean very interesting now that confirms my suspicion that there are interesting connections yeah no no definitely definitely excellent now i'm looking at the time we're keeping once more fantastically to time rose is your hand up to say something something no, I tell you that there is a blue yeah. Park. I think it's in the Vale of Health in Hampstead to Tag yeah. Tagore. Tagore absolutely absolutely so that might be something with and also dh lawrence i think those connections yeah. are also another, yeah. another yeah. have a different yeah. avenue um yeah, yeah, good yeah. i see that marcus who's going to be talking after lunch has very kindly provided a link to my, my Hampstead essay for those of you who would like to pursue it to, to, and of course to... all those guests tagore dh lawrence had gone to spain to the free institute of education and to the residencia de estudiantes in madrid so all these communities that that nana was talking about that dr nana was talking about at the beginning it also meant, means that there were networks of intellectuals kind of 
you know, really becoming global, we really need to talk about an international globalization, intellectual globalization happening, um, you know, in the interwar period all over Europe. Absolutely. No, no, indeed. And one last thing, perhaps, before we break uh, for a slightly longer time for, uh, for lunch, and that is something you didn't mention, but that I, I will mention now that uh, Federico de la Iglesia, who you mentioned, is Lena Schifrin's father, father. and she yeah. will be uh, yeah, yeah, gracing yeah. us with her presence uh, yesterday, uh, tomorrow yeah. afternoon. Yeah. So I look forward yeah. uh, to that. So I think that's probably enough for one morning. It's been wonderfully rewarding and, and a lovely congenial sort of atmosphere as well. Thank you so much, Nuria. Thank you, Charlie. Thank Pleasure. you, Cynthia, Anna as well. And we will reconvene at one o'clock. So have a good have a good break, everyone. Fantastic. Bye. I'm off to teach. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Monica. Hello, Ete. Hello. <laughs> Gosh. We... Oops. Look, can, can you see me? Yes, I can see you and hear you. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, th I think you need to um, raise your... To, to... Yeah, I can see you perfectly well, but you look as if you're leaning back. Try um, raising yeah. the... Uh, yeah, that yeah probably is no, but you you're looking upwards. Try yeah. that's it. That's better. That's much better. Good, good. <laughs> oh, extraordinary morning. <laughs> I know, very very weird. I couldn't I unmute it at the beginning. Yeah. So I had to. I lost the very beginning of it all, oh. um, in the speech. But um, somebody oh, then came and helped me, and. Uh, and then someone called Anna Nima, who's written, or I mean, I've, who I've never met. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, I thought this lady who spoke about Spain was the most amazing. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. I quite, yes, and and um, um, the d distinction between the two kinds of feminism was really interesting, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Oh. Oh dear, do you think we should both go and have a bit of lunch? Yeah, I think so, and talk to you later. Talk to you later. Talk and to you already for tomorrow. And hope to come and see you before yes, the... I do hope so. Yes. Um, I've, I've sent the link to Brenda, so she... I don't know if she's watched any of this. I don't know, I, yeah. But, but she's got the way to do it from... Yeah. I've, I've sent it oh, by good. Monica. Yeah. So it could be all right. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, love. Anyway, Have a nice see you later. <laughs> yes. Bye bye. I'm just going to. I'm not touching it. I'll leave it all because I'm so afraid of mixing it up. <clears throat> <clears throat>
Alan? Alan, are, are you there? <clears throat> yes. Alan? No, not yet. Valerio, are you there yet? Okay, I think everybody's still. Not I am Monica. Yet. Oh, Valeria, hi, hi. I was just hoping to have a word with Alan first, but uh, all good. Um, hopefully. And is, is Rudiger there? He's, I think, possibly signed off for lunch. And I'm here as well, Monica, Marcus. Oh, Marcus, yes, indeed. Hi, hi. How are you doing? Okay. Yes, so all good so far. Good. Um, good. Hi. <coughs> Marcus, 
Yes. Well, have you heard of somebody called Peter Nicholson? No, no. No, I want. Uh, I was hoping that he'd be here because I met him on a recent visit to Dartington. He's doing a whole lot of research on the current collection that they still have at Dartington of artworks. Oh yes, yeah. And you should be you should be in touch at some point. Yes, please. Yeah, I'd, I'd be particularly interested in um, what they might have in terms of uh, prints or mm -hmm. drawings uh, related, particularly to Halkett or sure. um, anything you... additional. I, I think they've got material in the archive about Sukop as well. So um, that, that there's was... a lot more still to be yes on Earth. I Definitely, think. no doubt about it. Anyway, no, he's not well, unfortunately, so can't. can't yeah. um, right, how are we doing? Um, Uh, Rudiger, can I just have a quick word? Uh, are you there? No, I think he's he's left the room, isn't he? <laughs> um, Alan? Yes? Hi, you're, you're back. Are you planning to show any pictures? I didn't actually think to check with you. Are you... Well, um, I haven't got prepared anything. Um, you asked me to say something about Gropius. And yes. I'm just doing a quick, a quick That's bit That's absolutely of fine, and I just, just wanted to check. In Fiona's book. Um, I mean, there's only one picture I can really think of showing, which is his uh, design for the for an open air theatre in the tilt yard, right? Um, uh, which well, I could I could pull that up from somewhere. I expect. Okay, it might be nice to have a little bit of visual material. So in, uh, rather sorry, guys, it's you. in. I think it's in. Um, it's in the Isaacson book, possibly, or the anyway, one of the of the books. Uh, um, I definitely saw it in one of Magnus's. Um, yes, yeah. well, I I, I know I've I've used the image. Yeah. Uh, of, I could Actually. even go and get the book if that would be useful. I can run upstairs. I have um, I have, have a snapshot on my phone. I don't know what it can be of any. Uh, right, that's probably not good enough to share with people, is it? Um, let me. How no, you... I think I think it, it might be okay. It's just it might be snapshot. okay. Okay, fine, fine. Um, I don't know. I'll. I I yeah. I, it's it's from the it's from the um. Uh, it's from the book, so I don't know. I mean, if you have better ideas, but otherwise, I'm happy well, to send I'll it to you. I'll just do a bit of um, a bit of searching, and it may emerge. Oh, I've just noticed a um, useful warning message from Elizabeth um, about the link to the Hamburg conference. Please ignore it. Right? <laughs> okay. Monica. Yes. Hi. Monica. Hi, I just wanted if I can just have a little ten second when you of do course, your your reintro just about something sure. about to do with Powell and Presby. Thank you. Sorry, did you Anna? Did you want to say something? No, well, it was to it's to everybody. It's just that I've in the, my lunch hour now on Radio Four. They've had an amazing program about um, Paul and Pressburger and the Red Shoes and Hein Heckroth. And... Ah, right. Okay. So nice. I thought people might they can listen to. Why it don't on, you um... wait? Let's wait till everybody's reassembled. Yes, exactly. Yes. And then Anna, Anna, I'll I'll bring yeah. you up. No, no, it's BBC means. Sounds, isn't it? The, the yeah, I believe so. Thing. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Here, here yeah. you are. Lovely. Let me just warn people. Oh dear. Good timing. Yeah. Please. Print. Well, Anna, I, I've just sent you the my my snapshot just in case you don't have time to find right. I, look I for have... a better one. You, I think you just if you crop it, it's actually not too bad. If you crop it, just do the image. Okay, actually, um, I have found one. So okay, great. Very good. Okay. Um, 
Um, Lovely. So what I'm going to I'm, I'm just looking for the the running order. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, it's in it's yeah, in the document yeah. I send you. Basically, I'll just say some very few brief words yeah. over to you. And uh, would you like me to introduce all the other speakers? In fact, would that be easiest? I mean, you know, so so brief. But you uh, well, one that's, yes, that would that be easier because I've got I've got the information in front of me. And um, really, you know, if you'd like to sort of then be in charge of the kind of the way the conversation goes after the presentations, yes. that that would be great. Nice. Um, lovely. And and I too, likewise, you know, both of you. Well, I'll just chip in with my. I'll just chip in with my. Yeah, I'll just chip in with my little bit of about okay. the press program, pal, before we kick off. Mm -hmm. and that. Yeah, yeah. Packing sim is just brilliant, Monica. I'm just blown away by it. It's been fantastic so far. It has. Been, yes, if it, if it goes on, I've already yes, spoken I, I so it well. I'm already spreading the word about mm -hmm. that last talk. Just great. Nice. What I'll do, I'll send a follow up document to everybody with the relevant links because um, clearly there's some issues here. <clears throat> so Alan, I mean, just, just to remind you I and mean, remind everybody, so we have you first, then Valeria talking about architecture specifically, Marcus talking about um, Sukop and Halkett specifically, then Sigrid talking about Hekroth, and then we have a break, and then it's Rudiger talking about Slutsky, which I very much look forward to because he's a shadowy figure, and then Anna talking about Weissenborn, and then finally Elizabeth talking about the Lucian Freud connection. Indeed. I've so got all, rich, I've got all that in front of me now. <laughs> yep. Good. That's great. All right. Well, it is one o'clock. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Good. Well, welcome back, everybody. I suspect there'll be a few people <clears throat> coming a little late, so I'll keep an eye on the uh, on the waiting room. Um, I uh, I'm going to hand over to Alan Powers, the well-known design and architecture historian, as many of you will know, to preside mostly over this afternoon's proceedings, which will be focusing, as I'm sure you know, if you've read the program, on architecture and the fine, so-called fine and applied arts. Um, but before I do that, I just want to uh, ask my friend and colleague Anna Nyberg to say a few words about a serendipitous <laughs> coincidence that she's just uh, uh, wants to tell you about. I won't take very long, but perhaps like me, uh, during your lunch break, you listen to Radio 4, and lo and behold, there's a programme on about Powell and Pressburger, and uh, specifically talking about the red shoes, and it ties in so beautifully with today's uh, programme. Um, I thought some of you might like to listen back on BBC Sounds. They were mentioning so many emigres, not just Heinz Hickhorn, but uh, cameraman and another designer as well. So that's it. Um, Radio 4, Powell and Pressburger. That's, that's can my, I? That's my. Can ad. I just add? It's it's Valeria. Can I just add that the um the BFI is doing a, a season on Paul Pressburger, which is I suppose it's why they they were um yes, they had the exactly. Program. Well, that's an interesting partnership. The whole Hungarian connection. Oh, absolutely fantastic. Yes. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. So uh, we'll be hearing from Anna later. So I'm now going to remove the spotlight from her, and as I say, hand over to my friend and colleague Alan Powers, who knows much more about the architectural and design side of things than I do. Author of many books. I again, his biography is in the document that we shared with you. So I think without further ado, I'll hand over to him, and he'll be talking by way of introduction about the Gropius connection, tenuous and you know, tantalizing and frustrating as it was. And then we'll be handing over to Valeria to talk about modernist architecture at uh, Dartington more generally. So Alan, please take take my place. Well, uh, thank you, Monica. And it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I have to admit, I haven't liaised with Valeria about what she's covering. So um, I don't want to duplicate anything, but uh, there was going to have been a talk about Gropius. Uh, as uh, part of the programme, which uh, in fact has has dropped out. 
Uh, Alan, just to reassure you, I'm going to be speaking mainly of Lascaux. So. Okay, right. Well, uh, as Monica hinted, the, um, the story with Gropius is a kind of non-event, almost, not quite. Um, and uh, it has puzzled me beyond the fairly scant details that, that we have about him visiting uh, in the summer of uh, 1934, before he had actually come to live in England, um, hoping that this would be, you know, his next big step in the world of education, uh, and talking about it as being similar to the Bauhaus, which, <laughs> in many ways, actually, it it wasn't. Um, but uh, then, um, while well, hoping that he would get into the um, a kind of building opportunities there, which were um, ramping up as the school expanded, which is where the scars was already embedded. Uh, this Swiss American architect, William de Scars, who um, Valeria will talk about, who in fact was very worried. And there is a letter from him uh, to the Elmhurst saying, you know, I've, I've got this job and I don't want it, somebody else to take it. Uh, what they thought, of course, is always much more difficult to uh, to discover, and um, uh, Gropius was given a, a, a rather minor job to do, uh, organising the Barn Theatre, which he was well qualified to do, and what he did there, I think, basically still remains in place. Um, but he was he was definitely expecting more. I will now pull up uh, the uh, image, um, which. Uh, there. Is everybody seeing that? Or, no. no. No, maybe the share isn't enabled. I think you have to... Um, it should be because you're a co-host. Um, uh, multiple participants can share. Hold on a second. Let me double check on yeah. that. Um, this looks better. Yes, yes. Yes, right. So, um, yes, this drawing... Um, I don't know by what route it travelled into the RIBA collection. Um, and it's certainly not by the hand of Gropius, uh, because he didn't have those sort of drawing skills. But it's it's an intriguing thing for an open-air theatre in the Tilt Yard. Those of you who know Dartington will remember this well with its um, mm. clipped yew trees, a very evocative space that it's a survival from the uh, medieval... Uh, occupation of the site, um, and also haunted, I believe, by a ghost called the Grey Lady, if anybody can contribute about her. Um, uh, so it is it is architecture of a sort, although landscape, uh, but this didn't happen, and I don't think there's any reference to it in the documents. Uh, Gropius was then, um, there was a suggestion that uh, Dartington could produce a range of products rather similar to those from the Bauhaus and Gropius could be the controller. And he was offered a sum of money, which he believed to be far too small uh, for his purposes. And um, so that didn't go any further either. Um, and I only speculate that maybe the Elmhursts, it, with their sort of discreetly charming ways, uh, saw Gropius and thought, well, if this man comes here, he will want to take us over. You know, he's too powerful uh, and we shall have conflicts and it's better if we don't really go very far. Uh, that's just my hypothesis. Uh, in other respects, um, Fiona McCarthy in her biography says that, you know, Gropius had a very uh, sort of meagre reception uh, when he first came to England in October 34. But I would actually contest that. I think he he made much more of a, a splash at the beginning, but his impact rather diminished as uh, as he stayed on. Although he got work to do and he was by no means neglected, um, uh, he, he had an immediate impact on maybe essentially on the circle um, of people who were interested in him but it did go well beyond that. Uh, it's a complicated story. I've tried to give a what I hope is a just appraisal in my, my book, Bauhaus Goes West, soon appearing from Thames and Hudson in paperback, if I'm uh, 
allowed to say that. So uh, I think that's that's all I will say about Gropius, and uh, we can move on now. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Valeria Corolo. I know, Monica, you said you would like to, or you might introduce the speakers, but I think I will do so in this case because she's a, a good friend and colleague and is doing a fantastic job with the photograph collection at the RIBA, making it better known with a current exhibition at the RIBA headquarters, 66 Portland Place, on um, photography of the 1960s that, and 70s that was featured in a series of issues of the Architectural Review called Man Plan, which aimed to sort of take architecture off its pedestal and bring it into social action through photographs that were much more like a like photojournalism than a very carefully posed usually almost unpopulated um photographs of buildings that magazines mostly produced then and largely still do uh so um valeria has published on uh, maholinage in britain uh, a very useful book indeed and she's talking now about um, modern architecture at Dartington. The exit from the oh, image. Yes, Sorry, yep. top. yes, there we are. And we'll make sure that Valeria is spotlighted. Thank you. Um, Spotlight. Good. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Alan, for the for the introduction. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, let me know if everything is fine. Um, yes, all all good. All good. Okay. So, uh, first of all, what I wanted to say uh, to add to uh, to, to what uh, Alan was, you know, was was saying about my. Um, well, my role at the RIBA, not really specifically my role as photo as curator, but as something I think very relevant to the uh, to this um, to this conference in general, probably to the interests of a lot of people on the um, who are attending this this conference. Um, I have been conducting in the last few years um, research around refugee architects. Um, so late 1930s, um, mainly looking at the activities of the RIBA Refugee Committee. It was set up in 1939. So um, I'm hoping to. I've I've been in touch with with a few of of you on on uh, on this conference, I think, and um, I am hoping to organize a, a conference next year on the on this topic. But obviously, I'll uh, you know details to come. Fingers crossed. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say is that in about month's time, I think it's the 15th of November, Monica confirm if I'm if I'm right. Um I'm going to 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 give a um a talk for um for insiders outsiders related to my research and in particular regarding the uh what uh two people Bobby Carter and Godfrey Samuel um did to help refugees in that um on and in, in that period. So um just a kind of uh, forward notice for that if you if you're interested but instead on this on this talk actually I, I'm not I'm this presentation not really going to be talking about um um refugees much but I just thought and I proposed this presentation to Monica because I thought it would be maybe interesting and useful to to see also the aspects of the of, of the dark into environment you know the, the the aspects of you know where these people were were working you know what uh, what, what what type of buildings there were and and how the elements you know like um obviously went in the you know in 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 this direction in terms of um with the progressive ideas they also um apply those to to the type of buildings that they they commissioned for for Dartington. Um, and the other thing I want to say, you will see on the screen that I, uh, you know, uh, true to my uh, role of photographs curator, I've in the, always indicated um, who the photographer of the uh, photographers are. So you will see their names on the on the slides. So um, the, the the site of Dutton Hall has, had been occupied, I think, for over a, um, a millennium. Um, so for a very long time, um, but it was in the in the 14th century, as I think it was mentioned before uh, at the beginning of um, uh, this morning 
possession uh, that it became a great hall. Um, it underwent ma major alterations um, over the century, especially in the 19th century. Um, one of the wings was radically altered. The other one was partly converted um, into a barn. So by the time the Elmist um, bought the property, um, it was quite in derelict state and much of the hall um, had actually been been destroyed. So they started renovating the property and they um, commissioned uh, William Weir, who was one of the foremost experts on medieval architecture at the time in Britain to oversee the restoration. So they went about the restoration of the of the of the hall and also of the gardens and they commissioned the American landscape um, architect uh, Beatrix uh, Durham to uh, to work on the gardens and she actually also ended up working on 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 the modernist properties that we will see in in a moment this uh, this photograph by the way is um is much later it's from the 1960s um so they also commissioned and they 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 employed they appointed an architect Oswald Mill to uh, start building the new um, you know to start on the on the building program for the for for the school and for for the you know for the estate and obviously you can see from this photograph the type of architect that um, that Mill was um, so it is just one of the um, of the many projects that they realized for the for the Elmist. So at the same time as they were restoring the hall, they were also uh, they started on the, um, on on new buildings. Uh, but when the new headmaster was appointed, William Curry, uh, I think in 1931, he actually um, suggested that. Um, a completely different architect, an American architect, William Lascars, was commissioned to uh, build the the residence, his his house. Um, and this is an interesting story. So why why William Lascars? Lascars was born in uh, in Switzerland. He studied in Zurich and then worked in France um, to the. Um, reconstruction program uh, after the First World War. Um, however, uh, discouraged by the slow economic. Um, recover in Europe and the, the kind of limited opportunities that were at the time, he uh, moved, uh, migrated to the United States. Uh, here he established a partnership with um, the architect George Howe, and the two of them were actually responsible for some of the first um, international style uh, buildings in uh, in the United States. Uh, this is um, a drawing for the house and studio that he designed um, for himself in New York. Lescaz designed for himself. It's still there. It's a it's a wonderful building. In case you haven't seen it or don't know it, um, and um, also they uh, designed what is possibly uh, the first modernist skyscraper in. Um, in the in the United States, which is the this one, the Philadelphia Savings Fund Society uh, building um, of 1932. Uh, but it was a few years before, in 1929, when he was working on the uh, on the nursery school for the Oak Lane um, Country um, uh, School um, that he uh, near Philadelphia, that he met and befriended William Curry, who was then the headmaster at, at this school. So that's the, where the connection starts. And um, this is how uh, they ended up, um, basically, Curry ended up recommending Les Cas for, uh, for the job in, um, in Dartington. So uh, this photograph is of, uh, of later, it's 1954, but you can, I just wanted to show you to uh, to, to share the setting uh, of the house. So the house was set in extensive uh, grounds and, you know, in, in extensive gardens. And the gardens, again, were uh, designed, um, probably, I, I, I don't think this is the original design that we can see here, but the gardens were designed also by, by Beatrix uh, Farrand. Um, uh, I also want to say that um, when when um, when presented with this proposal by by Curry, the Elmist, you know, decided to uh, commission Ellis Cars, but wait to see the uh, the drawings before actually uh, approving. So there is a, the right to possibly um, reject the 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 the. the, the the, the project, but they eventually uh, approved it. And so the house went ahead. And you can see here, I have um, a few, these are all, all the photographs are from the collection. 
in case you have noticed at the beginning. Um, there's a few photographs of the house under construction. We can see here the uh, the street side, so the, the front, the front, uh, the entrance front, uh, which is quite plain. And uh, many have remarked that it's, um, it resembles and, and reminds us of um, the, villa, the Villa Gauche by Le Corbusier. Um, this is the side elevation. At the moment, it was uh, plastered. And then you can see it here um, after having been painted. And then uh, the garden front, the south front, this is where um, the, the, we can really see the type of construction because it's, in spite of the fact that it was a very modern building, um, it was actually built in uh, bricks and block, uh, had a big bricks and, and block structure. So it was quite traditional from that point of view, even if the, the roof terraces were in uh, actually in concrete. Um, so you can see uh, the, 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 that side of, of the, the, the garden side of the building, uh, again, um, after being plastered and finally painted and almost uh, completed. You can already see, um, you know, an, an interesting, uh, how much more interesting from this side the house appears. Um, it's, it's from this side that it, re it reveals its shape, which is a bit like a T-shape with uh, the, the corners partially filled in, at least at uh, ground level. We can also see that there's there are um, a, a lot of balconies and terraces. Most of the rooms, or I think possibly all the rooms and bedrooms, have their own balcony or, or terrace. Uh, and we can see here in its complete state, um, with um, again you, you can see the balconies and terraces. You can see uh, that the roof terrace on the right has got um, wire. Um, fencing, you know, railing for um, this is for the safety of, of children, and also what you might notice, but it's not that obvious because obviously the photographs in black and white is that while the main block, the the, the two uh, story block is um, and and the curved wing, and sorry, the curved uh, part are white, painted white. The uh, the, the 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 two story part on the left hand side which is basically the part um of that of you know facing the 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 street and the entrance side is actually painted in uh, in blue which is um is something that um was very you know remarked on uh, in in magazines also color was used quite extensively uh, inside and um it has been said that this shows the influence of the style on um on um on 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 Les Cas. Um, this photograph, interestingly, is uh, has been published over and over again. It uh, appeared on the cover of Design Food Today in 1934. It's probably the most seen uh, image of, of 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 the house, I would say. But if you go to the architectural periodicals at the time, you will see a lot of other interesting photographs from other uh, viewpoints that we don't have in the collection. Um, this is also to say that the, the house was published very extensively on all major architectural uh, magazines. Um, it was also featured in the famous exhibition um, at MoMA um, on uh, English architecture um, in 1937. Um, but um, what I find particularly interesting is that this uh, photograph was for the first time published in Country uh, Life, you know, so a quite traditional uh, periodical, unlike, you know, say the Architectural Review, uh, did an extensive feature on the house. In fact, they sent the staff photographer, Edward Henson, uh, to, to photograph it. And uh, I, you know, I've find it particularly interesting also reading the article how they were almost trying to justify um the the reason why they were they were so interested in the house you know to their readership um it's probably not that used to seeing these type of houses in in country house um and uh just i wanted to um quickly show you um some of the things that uh, you know uh, th that they say in the article, so habitat, sentiment, association, all bind us to a preference for the traditional type of home and blind us to a different type of beauty that can be elicited from the opportunities of the present day. Uh, and then they go on to say, we have invented new materials construction that enable us to provide the requirements of a house without having to employ any of the traditional shapes and at the same time to meet those requirements in many respects far more fully. So again, if you read the text over and over again, there's this kind of almost justification, you know, they want to kind of convince their readership that this is, um, that this house is, um, you know, is, is, is very important. And in fact, it was uh, one, probably one of the first um, uh, 
uh, modernist houses, not the first, but one of the first modernist houses in uh, in this country. This is 1933, so it's still um, it's still quite quite early on. Uh, country Life publishes in uh, in uh, in February. The Architecture and Building News um, do an article on the on the house a few months later in July. And interestingly, just to and this really shows how early it was in the development of modernism um, in Britain. They call it. They say it, it, that the house is in the style of High and Over. High and Over is the house in this photograph that was designed a few years later by Connor Wood and Lucas, the uh, uh, British partnership. So it's it's quite interesting what the reactions and, you know, the uh, were to, to, to the house. Um, the Elmists were actually really impressed and they um, dis decided to commission further buildings to, to, um, to Les Cas. Dorothy um, in particular commissioned um, her, well, she not to less cast, but she had already kind of um she 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 went she was much more convinced about modernist uh, design and she commissioned uh, Search and Maif actually to uh, redesign her um, a, a flat in London for her, which is this flat in um, Upper Brook Street. I also uh, need to say, it's, it's quite important because Les Cas obviously was, was American and he was often in America. Um, he got help and assistance already from this house, High Cross House, uh, by a, a young British architect, Robert Henning. He had actually joined um, Oswald Milne in, in the first few projects in, in Dartington as his assistant, but actually then changed um, allegiances basically and started working with, um, with Les Cas instead and ended up really um, working with him on all the other projects that Les Cas realized for the estate. So he was commissioned to design three boarding houses, um, uh, a house uh, for uh, the dancer and choreographer um, Yost, uh, that I think was mentioned before, and we're going to hear about him uh, tomorrow. Uh, cottages for the workers um, and the offices, the estate offices as well. So I'm going to show you a few of these buildings. Um, this is um, one of the boarding houses. Uh, interestingly enough, the Architectural Review, uh, great promoters of modern architecture, they didn't uh, publish a feature on High Cross House, but instead they sent their staff photographers, Dallin Wainwright, to, to photograph one of the boarding houses when it was completed. So um, you can see, you know, obviously the, um, this is very typical of um, of Lescaz type of design with a very slim uh, metal support, the continuous uh, ribbon windows. Um, there, there were, um, again, two, two more of these, and you can see here a few photographs of the, of the, of the, um, of the boarding house. All these photographs appeared in, as I said, in the architectural review. I'm going to go quite quickly because I don't want to take too much time, but since we have these images, I thought it would be interesting to show them to you. So there's a few interiors as well. Uh, this really shows, you know, the built-in furniture, which was very pr prominent as well in, um, uh, in High Cross, that's something I forgot to say. How you know how much attention and um, and expenses were were made for uh, the interiors of High Cross House, where everything, all the furniture and furnishings were also um, uh, had also been designed by by Les Cas. Uh, this is again uh, the uh, dining area with there's lots of obviously um, furniture by um, by U the European masters. There's, there's lots of broiler chairs in the another. Um, piece of furniture in the high cross house as well and this is one a typical bedroom in the boarding house and a stuff room with um fireplace and then these are the estate offices um very similar type of in a way type of buildings limb metal supports long ribbon windows it's interesting to to notice that the original design for the offices had a kind of pinwheel uh, plan that was very reminiscent of uh, of the Bauhaus uh, by Gropius so there's definitely that connection and and Lescas was an admirer of, of Gropius but this is much simplified design uh, with two blocks uh, three blocks that um create two open courts. And because there's a sloping side, the courts are at different levels. As you can see, the lower court, it becomes basically an area for, for car parking. And then, um, yeah, you see the same area here with a, a block uh, in the background for laboratories. Um, and the entrance from the, from the corner, 
and then the uh, the upper court um, and it's quite interesting to notice in this photograph if you look on the left hand side you would see the, the kind of piloting the slim supports um, that were very shortly afterwards after a few years a few years later as you can see in this photograph were filled in um, again if you look at that left hand side you see the the slim metal supports and they've, they've gone here. So finally, um, Lascaux was also commissioned to work on um, a speculative development at Churston, which is in an area uh, not far from Dartington and quite close to Torquay. It's um, a seaside um, a site, um, beautiful um, position, a kind of described in the journals as a um, natural amphitheater, um, of, you know, sloping down to two beaches, so a really beautiful, spectacular site. So uh, the the trust of the the, trust, the trustees of the of Dartington had commissioned Lascaux to work on this project, and he had designed a great number of of dwellings, both um, houses and and terraces, um, a hotel that you can see in this photograph, um, and then you know a lot of other facilities. But um, the project was probably from the from the start with lots of difficulties. There was the um, one of the problems was obviously that he was in America, and um, the other problem is that the, the the clientele that they were expecting, you know, that kind of English middle class is often retired um, uh, people weren't that keen on this type of architecture. There were problems, of course. There were all sorts of, of problems that limited this uh, this project. And in the end, only six of the of the houses designed by um by the scars uh, were built and they are still there even if um i understand that they they've substantially altered but they're still on um on the side uh interesting enough to add to what um to what alan was saying before um it looks like gropius was also um kind of they they were thinking the almost of asking Gropius to be involved in this project. And in fact, even I've read, even they were thinking of um, Miss Van der Rohe and, and Al to, to, to involve them as well. The almost obviously had been to the Bauhaus, I think, in 26. And then in 33, they'd become in particular interested in, in Gropius's work. So um, they... Um, they in, in the end they went with um with Lascaz and the other American kind of group that came with Lascaz, uh, Beatrix uh, Farrand, and also the um planner, the American planner, Henry Wright. Um and um and clearly it looks like when Gropius went to Dartington the first time in 1933, they had already commissioned Lascaz, but they actually didn't tell him. So they must have been quite interesting. Here he found that out later. Um, and then, um, as Alan was saying, obviously there was the, certainly one of the problems was, was this kind of uh, potential professional rivalry. And Lascaz was was very concerned, as Alan said, about uh, Gropius's presence at Dartington. And in fact, I just to uh, quote that bit of the letter that possibly Alan was referring to, he writes to, to Karin uh, in January 35, saying, you no doubt know that Gropius has been at the hall. And I do, do realize that with his charm, his Bauhaus reputation, and his French friendship with yours, the situation may be very dangerous for me. So clearly he was... Um, he was very worried. So um, in the end, as I said, the, the scheme kind more or less, you know, failed and um, Lascaz left, you know, um, and terminated his employment um, and his association with the, with this project. Um, and this is the end of the presentation as well. Well, thank you, Valeria. Um, <laughs> It is a fascinating story, and uh, because Lascars is across the other side of the Atlantic, you know the great thing is it's so well documented through letters. I can't think of another modernist commission that has so much documentation, and he's at the beginning of High Cross, particularly having to justify what he's doing, and this thought would have because it's all about um, efficiency and rationalization. And he employs a consultant to design the kitchen. And um, I think, I don't know what you think, that the plan of High Cross is, is in fact not a terribly good piece of work. Uh, it's very wasteful of space um, and, and not very kind of uh, flowing. 
I've never had the pleasure of um, of uh, of going inside actually, so I reserve judgment to <laughs> to when I um when I manage yes. to. But I think even looking at it, at it on at it on paper, yeah. you know, we could design that better. We could be more more economical. Um, uh, the roof leaked, of course, uh, okay. and it went over budget. Yeah. Uh, uh, but they, I mean, what's charming about I think it's Dorothy really who's um, pushing in favour of Lascars is you know, she wants to give him another chance and Henning has really becomes her favourite I think and he's actually based at Dartington um, he leaves Oswald Milne and is is employed by the estate as as an on-site uh, architect um, and and indeed continued working there after the war uh, and uh, what I think is quite helpful for understanding all this is that they had their own building company, Staverton Builders, um, which was also a development company, because uh, what ha what is happening at Churston is it's a, a speculative development by Dartington Hall, uh, one of several that they did. In fact, they did housing on, on the edge of Exeter and uh, at least one other site. And... Um, the management of that is is the people who are sitting in that office building uh, that you showed at, at uh, Shinner's Bridge, and and they're interested in not losing too much money, basically. And this is the problem with Churston that the first batch of modernist houses doesn't sell, uh, and they only one thing sold, didn't it? Didn't one sold, yes. They they go to um, Louis de Soissons, uh, um, who. Uh, I think it was Mr. Slater who was the the manager. He'd come from Welling Garden City, which is um, laid out and much of it designed by Louis de Soissons. So he was somebody he knew and trusted. And so he comes in and also designs some of the farm workers' housing. Uh, and modernism, for the time being, comes to an end, uh, which uh, I don't know what conclusions one draws. Uh, I thought I would... Um, because it came to my mind, the what Nicholas Pefsner said in his um, Devon, South Devon uh, Buildings of England, which comes quite early on in the series. And he says of, of High Cross, as appropriate to Devon uh, or in the other buildings, as they would be to California or the River Hudson, a symbol of enlightened internationalism, which is all very well, but the weather in Devon is not the same as California. Wow. Exactly. And just just to add to this, Alan. Sorry, it was just uh, something I noticed was quite um, quite quite funny in a way. Is that um, in uh, in building in 1935, when they, when they um, publish an article on the first houses in Churston, they one of the things they say in the article is construction details have been carefully considered, particularly as regard to dump proofing and insulation against extremes of heat and cold. But then, in, in fact, when you when you read about what happened afterwards, it looks like you know, as you said, the damp, you know, kind of cold climate in South Devon actually didn't didn't help at all, and the the walls and the metal windows and everything deteriorated quite quickly. So, yeah, interesting. Yes, yeah. yes, I think the the boarding houses seem to have lasted relatively well though i think it's Hen henning was a was a nuts and bolts kind of architect he wasn't terribly interested in design as such but he wanted stuff to work um and uh, he also interestingly designed airports for whitney Strait, uh dorothy's son by her first marriage who was an aviator and also um had a business constructing municipal airports in ipswich and Exeter. Can I? Yeah, exactly, Alan. I, I I just forgot. Well, I have another image, which is this that I I thought I'd gone over time. Yes. So I, yeah, that's yeah. one of the okay. yeah, one of this one by by uh, by Henning and Chitty. Yeah. Yes. And sorry, I think I'm talking too much, but uh, <laughs> just anecdotally, I was researching David Platel Bouvery, rather um, shadowy figure in the 1930s, who designed a, an airport for Whitney Strait at Ramsgate, rather elegant building and uh, for some reason I had Robert Henning's phone number and I rang him up and asked him about it and he said oh that building it was terrible it didn't work the kitchen was so small you couldn't turn around in it and they called me in straight away to change it before it even opened so that was uh, quite revealing of um, uh, you know different architects and their priorities I suppose you'd say
I wonder if I could just butt in there. I've got a question for Robert Burstow, just asking very, very simply, are all the modernist buildings still there? High Cross certainly is. What, yeah. about, the, what about the others? I think, I think they're, all, they're all, I think they're mm. all there, actually. Mm. Yep, I'm also wondering, are. apropos this question of, yes, sort of how successful the architecture was perceived to be for actually living and working in, um, whether, Etienne, perhaps I can turn to you. I mean, you presumably were familiar with these modernist buildings as a youngster. How did kids feel, you know, kind of living in that very starkly, you know, geometric sort of environment? You're going to need to unmute yourself if, you, if you'd like to answer my question. Or indeed, is there any other evidence, Alan or, or Valeria, of the kind of, you know, the, the I, you know, actually living there and their response? I mean, I, I only, I have, um, I copied, there was, there's a quote that by, by Curry. So, you know, it's quite early on, obviously, only been there for, I think, six months or something like that, when he he writes, you know, very favorably about it. And he says, to me, serenity, clarity, and a kind of openness are its distinguishing features. And I'm disposed to believe that they have important psychological effects upon the occupants. So I thought it was really interesting to... That, that kind of looking at the psychology of, of living in a house like that um, as well. But yeah, he seems he seemed quite um, happy with it. But, you know, again, he was only he's only been there for six months or or just over um, maybe a year. Maybe I'll keep that question reserved for Etienne for the concluding discussion. But, you know, it's all very well to have the, you know, the, the architect saying this is what we planned, but that how it was actually, you know, lived in and, and, and perceived is another question, presumably. Um, Alan, I'm just looking at the time. Do you think we should now move over to, to Marcus and we'll, we'll yes, have yes, indeed. opportunities yes. for discussion later on? So, Marcus, if we can turn to you now. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much to Monica for organising this marvellous event and to Alan for curating this section on architecture, fine and applied arts. I'm a journalist and I'm specialising in obituaries. And when researching obituaries, I'm particularly interested on uh, turning points, uh, either accidental or deliberate moments when the subject's life is changed irrevocably. I hope that we can share some of those moments in the lives of Halkett and Sukop, and in particular, the period at Dartington, uh, which was important for both of them. My own discovery of the pre-war exiles at Dartington came in 2016. Uh, and I first encountered the work of René Halkett then. Um, it was during the organising and exhibition of the uh, British surrealist Ithel Colhoun. And a friend showed me work by Halkett, um, quite surrealistic work, uh, and I became fascinated by his life and his work. I soon made contact with Ursula Klimmer, uh, who is based in Munich. Uh, she'd met Halkett in Cornwall when she was a teenager in the late 1970s. And she later translated his book, The Dear Monster, which we'll hear about later, uh, from English into German. And Ursula Klimmer now hosts the Halkett Archive. So if anybody is interested in, in his work, um, then uh, I would recommend making contact with her. Can you see the slides? Uh, not yet. Okay. Um, Monica. My fault, I should have made you co-host in advance, which I failed to do. Just give me a minute. Well, we're waiting. Perhaps I can add that uh, I had one of those um, wonderful coincidental experiences that I happened to be in Falmouth uh, in March 2019. I just completed my Bauhaus Goes West, it was published, and I walked into Falmouth Art Gallery, and there was an exhibition about Rennie Halkett, who I'd left out, but and, and I kind of kicked myself for that. Um, but this was organised by Marcus. It was an excellent small exhibition, uh, and um, I th thought, I spoke to the person who was invigilating, and, said you know who, who's done this and only five minutes later Marcus walked in <laughs> uh, so we we met at that point and I'm glad to say my, I've been able to include Halkett in the uh, the paper pack. Marcus you're now uh, able to share screen if, if you Thank you excellent.
Okay, so René Halkett was born uh, Albrecht Georg Friedrich Freiherr von Fritsch uh, on the 5th of February 1900 in Weimar into an aristocratic family. Uh, Freiherr equates to Baron in English. As an adult, he used the full name Georg René Halkett, or more usually just René Halkett. His pseudonym was borrowed from Hugh Halkett, a distant relative on his mother's side who had served with the British Army at Waterloo. He himself served in the Baltic Free Corps during World War I as a cadet, and he subsequently joined a communist group, Spartacus, and travelled with his family to Java. Um, we can see then that he uh, joined the uh, stagecraft workshop of the Staatliches Bauhaus Weimar in 1923, studying under Kandinsky and Clay. And here is one of the paintings that he submitted during his application to join the Bauhaus. As you can see, there's an inscription there, which is on the back of the painting uh, from uh, some words which Feininger gave to him um, during his interview. Okay. Yes. Can I interrupt for a moment? Uh, we're not seeing the picture change. Okay. And also, I wonder if you could make it full screen. Yes, of course. Down in the bottom left-hand corner. Okay. That has changed now. Okay, and now we should see... Either that... Is it changing? Or above where it says draw in the bottom left, there's that row of little symbols, and it's the right-hand most one. There's like a sort of square on the stem. Okay. Um, if you go over the screen itself, down to the bottom... Is that working now? Uh, not yet. Okay. And again? Um, I don't know if you you may have done this before. Run your cursor all the way down. Yeah. You might work too. But yes, you're almost in the right area. But um, go up from there. Yeah. Disappear that box. There, right along to the right-hand end of that row. Um, little to the left. Yeah. That one. Try that. How's that? Good click. Not yet. Try again. Uh, not quite the right place. Try again. Okay. Um, Logo, uh, Marcus, if I can interrupt, that looks a bit like a little screen, a sort of old fashioned screen. Yes. That, that's the one. That's, that's the, the one. one yes. Okay. Try clicking that. Do you see now? No. Picture. Well, I don't know why. Anyway, we could manage. Okay. Okay. Um, it could be yeah, yes. It could be that it's opening up the PowerPoint in a new window, and so you need to share that window specifically. Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah, I can see. Right, that try. Now. Yes, probably work. Ah, trying it, trying again. Are we there now? I think you need to stop sharing this screen and then start sharing the opened up PowerPoint. Okay. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yes. Ah, that's it. Yes. Brilliant. Okay. Alice Clark. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so this is the painting that Halkett took to his interview. Uh, Kandinsky said, uh, das mag ich nicht. A seat aus wie ein Fluor Kandinsky. Um, and uh, so in this case, um, he he had an interview with Feininger, and uh, uh, the inscription remains on the back of that painting. Uh, that's now in the Halkett collection. He, uh, despite the comment that was made there, he was admitted to the Bauhaus School, and he spent almost two years at the institution. Uh, he later commented, as you can see here, I became an apprentice in the workshop for stage design. And although the Bauhaus was in principle anti-painting, I learned a lot from clay, but most from hanging about in Feininger's studio. He was also involved in the stage workshop at uh, the Bauhaus. And here is Halkett in the role of Der Mann am Schaltbrett, the man at the controls in the play of the same name, uh, staged in 1924. And here, uh, the figure on the left there is Halkett at the controls. 
From the same period, we can see a Bauhaus inspired painting. Uh, like in the previous image, we can see block work figures uh, and uh, they're as if marching or dancing on a Bauhaus school stage. Following his time at the Bauhaus, Halkett journeyed to the community at Lower Land in the state of Hesse. The Lower Land Schule für Körperbildung, Landbau und Handwerk, that's the Lower Land School for Physical Education, Agriculture and Crafts, was a visionary feminist settlement and a utopian experiment led by women combining art, dance, and agriculture, and founded in the same year as the Bauhaus. So uh, Lower Land ce celebrated its uh, 100th anniversary in the same year as the 100th anniversary of Bauhaus. Alkit traveled widely in Germany during the early 20s and 30s, uh, visited Java and Ibiza for extended stays. He'd first come to England in 1930, uh, arriving at Falmouth in Cornwall, and he was on the sailboat uh, Tiraponga, uh, he journeyed with the uh, writer and adventurer George Dibbon, and he was already aware of Dartington Hall through his friendship with the Bauhaus founder, Walter Gropius. Halkett and his wife, Hilda, who was Jewish, decided to emigrate uh, definitively to England in 1936, escaping the rise of National Socialism. Here's an etching which was created around 1938 during his time at Dartington, um, which shows Halkett, uh, as you can see here, uh, as the, the gate figure. Uh, we see Roland Penrose as a mountain, and we see Lee Miller, uh, Penrose's partner, as the sky. And this is a testimony to the uh, relationship, the connection between the three of them. And we'll, we'll say a little bit more about Penrose later on. As well as painting and etching, Halkett also made prints using a Ronio machine, whereby one draws or writes onto a wax stencil, uh, which is then used to print onto paper. And similar prints can see, be seen in the early work of Cecil Collins, who was a fellow artist at Dartington from this period. Halkett wrote a book, um, and this was published in 1939 by Jonathan Cape, and it was an autobiographical volume, which was about the rise of National Socialism and the impending threat of war, and Halkett's own experience of growing up uh, in Germany. Unlike other German and Austrian emigres about which we've already heard and we'll hear about later, Halkett was not interned as an enemy alien. Instead, he joined the British Army. So he was one of few people who were able to serve first in the uh, First World War in the German Army and later joined the British Army. His call up is recorded in the Dartington News of the Day on the 9th of January, 1940. And the report states, refugees, René Halkett, first of the German refugees, has volunteered for the British Army and has now been called up. And throughout the war period, he continued painting alongside his military activities as a means of remaining grounded amidst the chaos. As he once said, during all that, including the worst times, I carried on painting. That was outside and somehow natural, like breathing. Perhaps, seen in retrospect, it was a continuous attempt to create my own reality. And here's a painting in a rather surrealistic mode of Halkett in uniform in the British landscape. Even during the war, artists such as Halkett were able to continue to exhibit. And here we can see a ticket from 1943 for an exhibition which was at the Modern Art Gallery uh, Jack Bilbo's uh, establishment, and uh, at that exhibition was Francisco Barres, uh, Fernand Leger, and uh, René Halkett. The gallery was run by Jack Bilbo, um, a pseudonym of Hugo Cyril Baruch, who left Berlin in 1936, and he founded his gallery in London five years later. And he exhibited well-known artists such as Picasso, Schwitters, alongside many lesser-known emigres. His Halkett in a self-portrait created just after the war, showing him in the country, as it was called, um, as the former German baron now creating propaganda on behalf of the British Army. And that was the unit that he worked in, in the propaganda department. It was at this time that Halkett became a British subject. Uh, he worked on the Nuremberg trials as a translator and in denazification programs. During the 1950s, he worked for the BBC, 
which was a natural continuation from some of the propaganda work that he'd been involved with during wartime. He broadcast regular Tagebuch diary programs in the late 50s and a brief Aus Cornwall uh, during the 1960s on the German service. He moved to Camelford, Cornwall in 1967 and lived in a small house which was lent to him by a friend and benefactor, Wilhelm Necker. I mentioned Ursula Klimmer earlier on. She visited Halkett as a teenager and remained in contact with him uh, to the end of his life and published her translation of The Dear Monster as Der Liebe Unholt in 2011. Another contact uh, from those later years was David Jay of the British rock band Bauhaus. Uh, he'd heard that a former Bauhäusler was living in England and went to visit Halkett at home in Camelford equipped with a tape recorder. The result was a haunting duo with Jay on keyboards and Halkett reading his poetry released in 1981 as a single titled Nothing Amor. Exhibitions of Halkett's work have been held at North Cornwall Museum and Gallery in the 70s and 80s within his own lifetime. Uh, and then uh, my contact with Ursula Klimmer led eventually to the 2019 exhibition at Falmouth, where am I Alan, as Alan mentioned earlier, uh, René Halkett from Bauhaus to Cornwall. And that brought together the 100th anniversary of the Bauhaus and uh, Halkett's chosen home in later life, which was Camelford in Cornwall. Halkett died on the 7th of March, 1983, aged 82, and is buried in Camelford. Before we go on to talk about Vili Sukop, I'd like to briefly mention another type of ex exile that turned up at Dartington, uh, this wasn't an artist in exile, but an entire art collection. And uh, Roland Penrose, who was mentioned earlier, and uh, Edward Mezens of the London Gallery arrived at the Dartington in 1938, and they brought with them the art collections of Penrose and of the London Gallery. We can see from two archival sources at Dartington that the collections were not simply stored away out of harm's way. Well, not initially, at least. Um, Penrose and Mezens had planned, together with Dartington's Arts Department, a series of six exhibitions based on their collections, of which two took place. And we can see here the Dartington News of the Day newsletter, 8th of December 1939, exhibition, uh, the Arts Department has arranged an exhibition covering Dadaism, Cubism and Surrealism in the Bang Theatre and the pictures of the property of uh, Roland Penrose. Uh, and as you can see uh, at that time, you were able to see Picasso, Brack, Magritte and Dali. It must have been a fantastic exhibition um, in the Barn Theatre at uh, Dartington. If we then look to the following year, we can see in the McNally photograph album, again in the archive, uh, a second exhibition which took place. So we had before Cubism, Negro art, Cubism and Shirak. This took place in May to June 1940. Uh, again, coming from Roland Penrose's collection um, and um, previously uh, in the ownership of Paul Eloir. Unfortunately, around the time of the 1940 show, uh, many of the exiles were being interned as enemy aliens. And therefore, while the collection of paintings remained in Devon, the anticipated exhibition programme was curtailed. So that's just a little interlude uh, two excerpts taken from the archive there. Uh, let's talk now about Sukop, uh, Billy Sukop, the sculptor. Uh, he was born on the 5th of January, 1907 in Vienna. And uh, his father who had fought in the First World War uh, took his life in uh, 1919. Uh, so young Billy worked as an apprentice making ivory boxes and umbrella handles for a local trader. And this helped him to contribute to the household and pay for his studies at the Vienna Academy of Fine Art. Uh, and he undertook those studies from 1928 to 1934. His uh, greatest influence in terms of uh, his work was the German sculptor Ernst Barlach. Uh, we can see here a quote from later in Sukop's life. He says, my work is rather Catholic and ranges over a wide variety of subject matter as well as materials but my chief influence was Ernst Barlach and also uh, the meeting with other artists in particular through teaching in England. 
It was in 1934 that he had the fortunate opportunity to meet Kay Starr, who was Leonard Elmhurst's secretary. Uh, she was visiting Vienna uh, and they met. She invited him to England and the Elmhursts offered him a studio. Uh, and from based there, he formed um, early friendships with Bernard Leach and his son, David, who taught him pottery. The penniless sculptor, Sukop, was soon invited to produce one of his earliest works at Dartington, which you can see here, and one as, which has become uh, one of his best known. Um, the donkey lives in the gardens, and you can see it here. Um, it's almost life-size, as you can see from this picture. This was from a, a recent visit to the gardens at Dartington, and it was originally made as a commission to be exhibited on the Dartington stand at the Chelsea Flower Show. However, the piece did not sell and was then generously acquired by the Elmhursts for the gardens at Dartington. A similar donkey was later cast in 1955 as a piece of public art for Harlow and bought using funds from Morris Ash's Elm Grant Trust. Uh, the architect and town planner, Sir Frederick Gibbard, who led on the development of the new town of Harlow, uh, lamented the damage caused by children climbing on the work but he commented quite positively saying that the resultant polish adds to its interest. Uh, so that's the other donkey, which is in Harlow. Shortly afterwards in 1937, he produced this remarkable sculpture of Pola Nirenska in pink cement. Uh, she was a dancer who'd arrived in Dartington in 1935, studying with Kurt Jus and Sigurd Lieder about whom we'll be hearing more in tomorrow's sessions. From 1937 to 1939, Sukop taught at Dartington Art School with a group of teachers who included Cecil Collins, Mark Toby, Bernard Leach, and Hein Heckroth. Again, we'll be hearing more about Heckroth in the next presentation. His first solo show took place in 1938 at the Storen Gallery in London and was organized by the gallery's owner, Erdley Nollis, and that exhibition showed sculptures which uh, Sukop had been making at his workshop in Dartington. Sukop was interned as an enemy alien, initially at Aintree Rains course, and uh, was then shipped with others to Ottawa, Canada, uh, for nine months during 1940, before he was able to return back to Dartington. And it was there that he met Simon Michel, the French dancer who was part of Ballet Jus, uh, who arrived at Dartington in 1934. The couple married and moved to Hampstead. Hampstead, we heard mentioned earlier, and they moved in 1945. And Sukop later recalled the simple single room studio in which they lived and worked and cooked and slept. He went on to teach at Bromley, uh, Guildford School of Art and Chelsea School of Art. And one of his pupils was Elizabeth Frink, known for her bronzes of animals, which were perhaps influenced by Sukop and, and his own works. The other work by Sukop that remains at Dartington is the Swan Fountain, also in the garden, uh, which was commissioned in 1950. And local law has it that when the work arrived in the gardens, the gardeners believed it was a bit too bright and didn't fit in well with the surroundings. So they promptly arranged for it to be smeared with dung taking away the brightness of the stone and providing a healthy foundation for the rich layer of moss and lichen, which now decorates the piece. And you can see the, the Swan Fountain here. Sukop was recognized through memberships of the Royal Society of British Artists, which he joined in 1950. Uh, he became a fellow of the Royal Society of British Sculptors in 1956 and was elected a member of the Royal Academy in 1969. A benefit of the RA membership was that he was able to exhibit and sell at least, uh, in this case, six works every year at the popular Royal Academy Summer Show, and that ensured a regular income uh, alongside his teaching work. He remained in contact with Dartington throughout his life uh, and died in Glasgow on the 8th of February, 1995. So, as we can see, uh, the lives of both Halkett and Sukop were changed by the opportunities that Dartington provided to them. 
Uh, in both cases, they made lifelong friendships, acquiring and developing skills and connections that served them well in their professional careers. And in Sukop's case, he met his lifelong partner and left behind at Dartington two important works of sculpture. The next two slides, this slide and the next one, provide some suggested further reading on Halkett and Sukop. Um, the best reference on Halkett I, I found is uh, his autobiographical book, which we mentioned earlier. Um, Peculiarly for a, a German writer, he wrote first in English, in this case, as The Dear Monster, which came out in 1939, uh, which, as we mentioned earlier, was then translated uh, in 2011 as a, a, as a German version. Um, and catalogues for his exhibitions are also available online and in libraries. Um, I still have uh, catalogues available from the 2019 exhibition in Falmouth, and I'd be very happy to send them by post to anybody who would like them. Uh, you can see the email address there at the bottom uh, if you would like to send off a, a request for the catalogue. On Sukop, um, the references include a dedicated page on the Dartington website about Sukop. You can see there the top item. Uh, there are also holdings in the uh, archive at Dartington. Uh, there is a page uh, and a work held at the Ben Uri Museum um, and two obituaries you can see here. One is for Simon Michel uh, and one for Vili Sukop uh, at, in the Independent, um, which were published on their, on their deaths. So that is uh, the lives, very briefly, of Halkett and Sukop. And Hopefully, as you can see, there's a lot more there uh, for study and for work, which could eventually result in a, in a more fulsome uh, biography of both of those artists. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marcus. Um, a fascinating presentation. That um, One thing I, I think you didn't say was how did Halkett get to Dartington in the first place? Uh, he got there, well, he, he came uh, via London um, but it was through uh, the, the connection um, with the Bauhaus that he found out about the place in the first place. So it was uh, the uh, Volta Gropius, who was a friend of his, uh, who introduced him to the place. Um, so in Sukop's case, it was that fortunate introduction uh, with uh, the Helmhurst secretary. And in Halkett's case, it was a connection through Volta Gropius, who, who, whom he knew. Um, and Yes. Who, who, who met. Um, I mean, other people in the meeting may be able to say more about this, but um, it strikes me that particularly that period just before the war, uh, if you were the right kind of person, you could simply turn up at Dartington. They didn't, you didn't need to have a job, really. You were sort of fed and housed yes. and find things to do. Is that right? Yes. I mean, as, as we said with Sukop, uh, he was given a studio. Uh, he was invited to work there and and became very very productive and and went on uh, to take his own experience uh, and his own work into teaching uh, within the Help Dartington environment. So, yes, very much so. Um, Marcus, there's a question if I can just butt in from Anna, which I was also going to ask you. You know, it's really unusual that Halkett was on was able to join the army directly. All Absolutely. The refugees yeah. would have loved to, but they weren't given the chance at first. Was it the Pioneer Corps? Did he actually go straight into some other unit? Uh, he went straight into a, a propaganda unit. That picture from earlier of him in mm. the country mm. um, is of him um, as a, a, a gentleman on, on the land. Uh, when they talked about going to the country, that was a kind of code word for working behind the scenes at a kind of Bletchley Park kind of uh, environment. And uh, you would there, you would be working on uh, both propaganda. There was a particular work um, which was called Crankheit Rettet, which um, is, is quite famous now, uh, which was dropping notes behind the scenes uh, to the German soldiers saying, uh, just take a sickie, will you? Um, just take a couple of days off. And the idea was to undermine their morale um, through encouraging them to abscond um, that same propaganda ended up being translated and, and sent back uh, against the British troops as well. Um, but that's the kind of thing that he was creating. And those elements would then be dry, either dropped over German lines uh, or they would be slipped into um, uh, the uh, news information that, that was being broadcast. 
Uh, and uh, so he was uh, really trying to undermine the German war, war effort from, from the British side. That slightly begs the question of why he wasn't, in fact, interned. Yes, um, he had already written the book, uh, The Dear Monster, and I think he had um, shown through that uh, that he was already on the British side. Um, so he was uh, uh, then able to go directly into the into the British army. Good. Um, well, thank you very much. I realise we're starting to run slightly late, so <laughs> let's let's uh, move to Sigrid, and then we'll indeed have yes. a have a further discussion. Shall we? Shall we do that? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, Monica, would you like to introduce Sigrid? Uh, yes, sorry, I'm just, hold on, I'm just trying to find her first of all, and also stop Marcus being highlighted, which I think he now is. Uh, right, where's Sigrid gone? Um, should be a better way of finding people, shouldn't there? Um, uh, Sigrid, do you want to put your hand up? That might help me find you. Yes, there you are. <laughs> Thanks. Very good. Um, ba -ba -bum. Right, spotlight for everyone. Here, here we go. Lovely. Okay, so as I said, going to keep it very, very brief, but I was delighted when Sigrid actually got in touch with me, and I can't remember how you got wind of, of my project, but I was delighted that you had, saying that coming from Heckroth's hometown of Giessen and working in the university there, you'd been doing research from that end uh, on this very interesting character. So I think without further elaboration, I'm going to hand over to you to talk about Hein Heckroth, who sounds, again, a fascinating figure. Well, yeah, thank you, Monica. Thank you. Can you understand me? It's fine. It's up to you. Fine. Yeah, OK. And I will try to, to share my screen. Um, uh, I hope. He, can you see it? It's coming. It's coming. Okay, let me see how can how can um you just need to go full full screen again if you can. Ah, uh, one more thing. It's um, always a bit uh yeah, you can see it, right? Okay. Perfect, perfect. Well, thanks for having me uh at this interesting conference. I'm particularly grateful to to Marcus Williamson who um with Rene Halkett uh, had such an interesting character to present and I I got the impression that the life and beings of Hein Heckroth are pretty much uh, in the same vein, and they are very sim similar in many ways. So um, let me start with a quotation. Um, Hein Heckroth, who was interned in Australia, wrote to Dorothy Elmhurst in October 1940, and he wrote, at times I think of the court and the garden and my studio and wonder if we shall ever work together again and how long it will be. All that I can say is that I spent the most wonderful time of my life there, and I don't know how to thank you for what you've done." End of quote. This is what the German artist Hein Heck wrote, wrote to Dorothy Elmhurst in October 1940 from the Australian camp to which he had been deported in that summer. Heckroth had spent almost five years at Dartington Hall from the late summer of 1935 until July 1940, when being classified an enemy alien, he was forced to embark on the ship Dunera. He was brought to the Hay internment camp in New South Wales. In what follows, I will try to shed some light on the activities Heckroth pursued at Dartington, on the tasks he was set to there and on his development as a multi-talented artist during these years. This spring, I had the opportunity to visit and work in the Devon Heritage Center in Exeter. And unfortunately, I didn't find the time yet to really work through the more than 300 documents I found and photographed there. So today I can only present some first findings and impressions. I will introduce Hein Heckroth by sketching his biography and early career. Then I will present what I could find out about his activities at Dartington Hall. My questions concern empirical data, most of all the whereabouts of his work, to be able to reconstruct his artistic oeuvre, especially his work as a painter of surrealism. More analytical or systematic questions pertain to Dartington Hall as a creative sanctuary for artists in the 1930s, yes, but also as a place where personal contacts were made and professional careers performed. Careers that turned out to be important for the international cultural scene after the Second World War. 
I'm very excited that this conference is now being held, bringing together so many experts on Dartington, which I somehow found out about lately last year. Um, and I hope that some of my questions can be clarified in the course of the conference. Some already actually have been. So Hein Hagrid was born in Giesen. Uh, where I'm situated right now in April 1901. Gießen is a medium-sized old university town right in the middle of Hessen in Germany. And Heckrud completed training there in Gießen as a printer and typesetter. And then in the winter of 1919-1920, went to the Städel Art Institute in Frankfurt to become a painter. He stayed at this renowned academy for only one year, however, and then continued his training at the drawing school in Hanau, close to Frankfurt. In the interwar period, Hegrod cultivated contacts in the avant-garde art scene in the Rhine area, notably in Dusseldorf, and he exhibited with the local secession movements. Here you have two impressions of his painting style and subjects. We could call this Neue Sachlichkeit painting or expressionistic. It's a moderate modernism, I would say. It's not an avant-garde art that he is actually um, producing at the time. But he's part of this movement and he's part of uh, an avant-garde uh, exhibition context, definitely. This is a photograph from the late 1920s where you see him with his wife Ada and the uh, Düsseldorf-based art dealer and collector Johanna I, who is very important for the uh, Rhenish art, Rhenish art scene um, in the in the 20s. In 1924, and this is also similar to, to Hawkett in uh, Suze's personal life, Heckroth married the artist Frida Diana Meyer, called Ada, who came from a Jewish family. And you see her here next to her husband. And perhaps due to this situation of starting a family, the painter Heckroth turned to a proper, that is regularly paid professional activity. From 1924, he was engaged as a stage designer, first in Münster, in Westphalia, then in Essen. Here are two of Heckroth's stage designs for the Theater of Münster of 1925, both of them. They give us an impression of the stylistic variety of his theater work. His artistic flexibility was, I guess, part of the job, as well as a personal trait of Heckroth, who later on in the situation of exile would adapt and fit in rather easily. So at least it seems to me in retrospect. Heckros became head of, head of set design at the Städtische Bühnen Essen in 1929 and was also involved in the founding of the Folkwang School for Music, Dance and Language in 1927. In this context, he worked together with, with Kurt Joos for whose ballet he took over the stage and costume designs. Joos achieved international fame as the choreographer of the anti-war ballet, The Green Table, which premiered in Paris in 1932. And I'm sure we will learn more about Kurt Joos tomorrow um, when Laura Gilbert is presenting her paper. Paris is the place of Hagrod's first exile soon after Hitler's seizure of power in January 1933. Hagrod continued to work with Joos and in the same year went on tour with his ballet group through Europe and also to the United States. In 1935, Hagrod and his wife moved from Paris to London where Heckroth was invited by Kurt Weil to make designs for his musical, A Kingdom for a Cow. Heckroth was also in demand as a media designer, as this program booklet for Weil's play attests. So Heckroth was a costume designer, a stage designer, a media designer, a printer and a painter when he came to Dartington in the summer of 1935. And these are two portraits I can show you of um, Hein Heckros in Dartington in around 1936 that, was given, that were given to me by his grandson, who is living close to Frankfurt. 
An undated registration formula in the Dartington Trust Archive gives information on the dates of issue of permit, certificate, and passport, and we've seen such formulas, such files already in the presentation of Charles Knight. So Heinrich Georg Heckroth was at Totnes on the 11th of July, as he got the certificates in the, the, the 11th of July, 1935, and he got a British passport in June, 1939. His occupation is artist. He's married to Ada and has a daughter, Renate, 13 years old. As Renate was born in 1926, the formula must date from 1941, and it might have been devised in the administration of enemy aliens, their deportation and prospective return. Heckroth's reasons for leaving Germany are noted as married Jewess, blacklisted by Nazis, forbidden to paint. The Arts Administration Report to the Dartington Hall Trust from November 15, 1935, mentions Heckroth's as accession to the staff in the wake of Kurt Jos. It is written there, and I quote extensively because it gives us an idea how and why Heckroth came to Dartington. I quote, at the beginning of the present term, an art section of the arts department came into existence. Mr. Toby returned from America and immediately started a weekly class for all persons, for all the persons on the estate who wished to join in. Early in the term, the arts boards the Arts Board learned that Mr. Heckroth was faced with returning to Germany to a concentration camp. They therefore offered him a home at Dartington in order that he may build up for himself a career in England. They have set aside a sum of 69, 69 pounds per quarter for Mr. Heckroth, but it is important to emphasize that this is not a salary since Mr. Heckroth's permit does not permit him to earn money in England. The 69 pounds is therefore calculated as being sufficient to support Mr. Heckroth at Dartington and it is in the nature of a subsidy. The Home Office have, however, been good enough to allow Mr. Heckroth to hold an art class and to give his services to Dartington as and when they are required. Mr. Hackworth then is another artist on the strength of the department and the old puppet studio above the solar has been placed at his disposal, end of quote. I find this a very interesting document and it hints also at the complicated employment situation. I assume many artists or many refugees from Germany or elsewhere faced when they came to Darting in the 1930s. The Arts Administration report, report from February 1936 reads, I quote once more, Mr. Heckroth, whom the department undertook to support for one year, is rapidly justifying the confidence placed in him. Within the last week, he has signed a contract to design the dresses for the production of Don Giovanni at Glyndebourne. As a contribution to the activities of Dartington, Mr. Heckroth holds a weekly class in stage construction and design, which is proving very popular." End of quote. Next to these reports, which I still have to work through thoroughly and in detail, I found personal letters written and illustrated by Heckroth, such as this one of December 1938, directed to Chris Martin. And I picked out this one because it illustrates so very well the panorama of all the activities Heckros obviously was involved in at Dartington in the second half of the 1930s. There are a few photographs showing Heckros painting or teaching painting at Dartington Hall. These are from private archives in Gisan, so from here. And I find it interesting that he is teaching or painting in a rather conservative way, at least in these two photographs. In the Dartington Trust archives, there are several photo albums. One of them shows Heckroth single or taking part in group events on the campus. And these photos are, photo, are, are annotated so we can identify individual people. Interestingly, Heckroth also worked as a designer at Dartington. 
The design department was installed as part of the commercial departments in late 1936, and Hecros was employed as its, as its chief designer. This obviously caused some trouble with the arts department, which needed Hecros too. He was competent, professional, and flexible in many fields, a man of many talents, as I wrote in the title of my little talk, and as such, he appears to have been quite valuable to the Dartington enterprise. Heckroth was definitely involved in the design and marketing of the Lambda chair together with Robert Henning. Here's an impression of the catalog. Unfortunately, I haven't found any other visual document at Exeter to learn of his design activities for the company and or school. Maybe the photo archive still at Dartington, which Anna Neymar mentioned this morning, holds some interesting material in that respect. Now, another parallel to René Halkett. While living and working at Dartington, Hackworth was active as a surrealist painter. And this is what actually caused my initial interest in him as an artist. Several years after his return from Australia, there was an exhibition of surrealist paintings by Hein Heckroth at the Modern Art Gallery in London. That was in May, 1943. The foreword to the little catalog was written by the eminent British art historian and critic Herbert Reed. And that was, of course, public proof of high esteem and appreciation for Heckroth. It underlined his identity or labeling as a surrealist painter. His connection to Dartington is not mentioned here, and the importance of Heckroth's surrealist work for the Dartington context is completely unclear to me, I have to admit, and I'd be interested on what Marcus, what Marcus has to say on that. The uh, 1943 exhibition brought together 14 works by Heckroth. Only four of them can be identified today, namely the paintings shown here. For three of them, the current situation is unknown, which also explains the poor quality of some of the illustrations. A recurring motif in these artworks by Heckroth from the late 1930s is the broken egg or the empty egg shell. The motif and its semantics remain in limbo, though. It is associated with sensual pleasure, opulence and beauty, but also with instability and fragility. So maybe this is a reflection on Heckroth's own fragile situation of exile at the time. Another painting cited in the 1943 catalog bears the ironic title, Free Love in Nature, slightly marred by the bad weather in England, uh, conditions, I assume, prevailing in the declining Occident, anno 1939. Here we have a barren rocky landscape in the background, like a stage set painted with aerial perspective in front of which a bizarre encounter takes place. Herbert Reed pointed out the special quality of Hagrid's surrealism in his catalog preface of 1943, quote, this preoccupation with the theater was reacting on his painting, that is to say, on his easel pictures. Constructivism was abandoned in favor of a style which, though obviously influenced by the surrealist, is always controlled by the dramatic sense. Each canvas is a miniature theater in which the super real drama is enacted and in which incidentally the artist displays his considerable gifts for decorative color and composition." End of quote. Another exemplar maybe of this um, bringing together stage design and painting is this enigmatic painting called Nina. Two more works, works by Heckroth uh, to finish this up from these years in Dartington, which are quite different from the ones I'd shown before, a fantastic landscape and a portrait in the manner of Salvador Dali. The British military advisor, Basil Littlehart, whose portrait here was present at the wedding of Bonte and Gustavo Duran in Dartington Hall in December, 1939. Heckroth demonstrably met him in that context. He probably thought that Littlehart was an intelligence agent and already feared being interned and deported, brought away from Dartington. Heckroth remained a painter by heart, but eventually made his living as an art director in the British film industry. 
that was mentioned already. In 1946, he was given the artistic direction of the ballet film, The Red Shoes, certainly his greatest success for which he gained an Oscar as art director. I think that surrealist aesthetics somehow opened the door to film for him. Maybe surrealist painting and darting had made it possible for Hein Heckroth to think and work in, in terms of film aesthetics. In 1956, Heckroth and his family came back to Germany. Hein had been appointed head of Ted Design at the Städtische Bühnen in Frankfurt am Main, so he picked up where he left off in Münster and Essen before the war and before going in, into exile and into having a supposedly very good time at Dartington Hall. Thank you for your interest and attention. Thank you very much, Sigrid. What a fascinating trio of talks, I'm sure everybody will agree. Alan, I'm just looking at the clock uh, and trying to be strictly and horribly practical. Shall we just have a very brief Q&A with perhaps some questions in direct response to the three talks and then have a short tea break, you can grab a cup of tea, bring it back perhaps to the screen and then have the other three and then have perhaps slightly longer with everybody um, at the end of the afternoon. Does that sound good. A sensible yes. ploy? Okay. Yes. So, um, fine. So now's your chance, everyone, if you have specific questions then for one or other of the three three speakers. I'm just looking there. Hold on. Listen. Uh, we've got two raised hands there. Oh, Colin Johns. We haven't heard from Colin before. Would you like to unmute yourself, Colin? And uh... Yes, thank you very much. Um, fascinating. I... Grew up not far from Dartington and went to school in Totnes, so it's it's really a a comeback to my mind of the great influence and significance. But just a comment I'd like to make relating to two things said earlier. One was uh, the reference to William Weir and Leonard's approach to restoring the historic buildings on the estate. And I think Alan mentioned Staverton Builders. Um, Back several decades ago, I saw a fascinating video which was uh, transcribed from a, an earlier film, which was of the rebuilding of the roof of the Great Hall. So this showed the Dartington workers on site with the timber they'd cut from the site. And it's narrated by the clerk of works with assistance from Leonard Elmhurst. I don't know if it still exists. It's a really very interesting piece of history. I don't know if anybody would like to uh, comment on that. Uh, well, I should mention there's a, a, a book about William Weir at Dartington, a, a small book produced by Dartington, which is uh, very informative. And apparently uh, Dorothy took to him tremendously. Uh, I think, am I right in saying they approached the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings for advice and uh, Weir was a, an old hand with them. And so he yeah, was recommended. I might just interject. Yes, indeed, they did, because there's an SPA book, uh, book on restoring historic buildings, which has William Weir and the Great Hall roof on the cover. It's a fantastic piece of work. It is indeed. The, the, the film is fascinating because of its date and uh, the way in which the estate workers, presumably not skilled in, timber frame repair, we're simply able to recreate that wonderful roof. Yes, lovely, I'd like to see that. Um, uh, Helena. Hello, yeah, my name's Helena. I'm um, a PhD student researching emigre art dealers in this period. So it's really wonderful to see all the uh, paintings of Heckroth that you've managed to find Sigrid at Bilbo's gallery, um, because I've really struggled <laughs> to even find the um, exhibition catalog for that. Um, I didn't really have a question. I, it's more a comment actually on Marcus's talk. Um, the head of Poland, Arenska, that you showed by Sukop was actually shown at the Stafford Gallery by Alice Story, who was another uh, kind of emigre refugee art dealer who actually owned the Storing Gallery, gallery before she sold it to Early Nollies, um, which is just quite an interesting connection. And I just wanted to flag that I'm hoping to show it in an exhibition at Ben Uri next summer on my research. Um, so if anyone wants to see it and you're in London next summer, hopefully it will be on display then. 
Thanks. Yes, Jack, Jack Bilbo is a, a larger than life character. What's the name of his autobiography, Helena? It's got a rather wonderful name, hasn't it? Um, is it Out of My Mind, or is that? Um, no, I don't think so. Anyway, I'll check no. it out and let you it's know. It's got a very long title with all his fantasy kind of occupations in it, I think. This was the only gallery to actually open up in wartime London, actually, during the war, which is no small, no small achievement. Uh, great. OK, um, right, there's some comments coming in. Uh, I hope everybody's keeping an eye on the chat. If you're not familiar with how this works, if you just click on the logo at the bottom of your screen saying chat, then all everything comes up on the side of your screen. Uh, an excellent, yes, um, uh, book, in fact, uh, about refugees and propaganda, War wartime propaganda by Sharman Brinson and Richard Dove, which uh, I highly recommend. Um, and then, yes, oh, the Sef Sefton Delma, the Black Propaganda Unit. Yes, that's a whole other story, isn't it, Marcus? That uh, yeah, uh, I think actually people, Peter Pomerantsev has been delving into. He has, it. yes. I yeah, haven't been in touch that. with him recently. Do you know, is his book coming out shortly or, or, or not? Yeah, it should be, yes. Yeah, I, I spoke to him a couple of months ago and, and he's also yeah. appeared quite regularly on Radio 4 talking about propaganda and, and uh, wartime. Uh, propaganda movement so yes so many interesting connections and then there's the whole Dunera as aspect the Australian uh, experience which is a very disturbing one it does not show mm -hmm. the British army or indeed the navy in, in a good light to say the very least and I should perhaps just mention while I think about it I organized with an Australian colleague an, uh, uh, an online symposium about the Australian experience and there's indeed a talk about the Dunera uh, and the artists uh, who ended up in Australia as part of that I'll send you the link for that. Any other questions for any of the afternoon speakers so far? No, perhaps we've had quite a quite an earful and an eyeful, as it were. I think shall we shall we take a short tea break? I think that would probably be wise. If we could reconvene, we'll keep it a little bit shorter than I've planned, but shall we say at quarter to three if we can reassemble? That would be great. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rudiger, can I just have a quick word with you? Would you like, to, Rudiger, could you unmute yourself? Just just click on the red, the red logo to unmute yourself. Can, can you hear me? Rudiger, you have to click on the red logo the, at the bottom left of your screen. Can you see there's a red, there's a... Ah, oh, okay, you have somebody to help. We need to unmute, unmute, uh, Rudiger. It should be very simple that, oh, oh, okay. Oh, fine, so you're ready to screen share. But I still can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself. Rudiger, I can't hear you. Rudiger, sorry, I don't know the name of the person who's helping you. That's it. Yes. Can you hear okay. me now? Now I can hear you. Now I can hear you. Very oh, good. Okay. No, no, that's okay. all good. So we'll keep you like that, ready to go. Go and have a cup of tea, but come back. We can leave the screen exactly. When, when shall I? When shall we come back? At, just in about ten minutes, if that's in okay. In ten minutes. Just time to get a quick, a quick cup of tea. Fine. Okay, thank good. you very much. All right. Thank you. Und diese diese ganze Geschichte. Also ich ich habe auch bei, kann, bei den anderen gesehen die ganzen Bildunterschriften. Wir haben mit, mit Mama hat die schöne Bildunterschriften gemacht und die ja. die sind die rutschen alle nach unten und diese Spalte versaut mir also ein Bild was ganz wichtig ist. Wie, ja, wie hast du das gemacht jetzt? Ja, das habe ich jetzt so gemacht. Also, Herr Juppie, Herr Juppie Sie sind Herr gut, Jupp, ich, Hallo hören Sie mich? Herr Juppie? Wenn ich es zwischendurch ausblenden könnte ne? Sie sind, Sie, wir hören das alles, was Sie da. sagen. Hören Sie mich? Also du kannst es komplett ausblenden, aber dann, aber dann kannst du es halt nicht. Dann sehe ich mich nicht und dann... Genau. Nee, dann mach es mal wieder an. Dann, äh... dann mache ich es vielleicht so. Dann ist nur sozusagen, dann siehst, wirst du wahrscheinlich gleich nur dich sehen. Okay. Könnte ich mir vorstellen. Na gut, also ich fange in zehn Minuten, fange ich dann an. Jetzt nehmen wir noch einen Cup of Tea.
Also ein Viertel vor. Also hier oben können Sie das wechseln. Ich, ich mache es jetzt mal so. Ja. Und so. ich nehme an, dass man dich dann da sieht, weil du oh. hier sprichst. Ja, aber ähm, ich kann auch wieder zurückgehen. Und du kannst ja. aber dann auch zum Beispiel da hingehen und machst okay, es gut, wieder gut, so. Gut, gut. Du kannst das auch woanders hinschieben. Ne? Also du kannst das auch... Ähm, ja, wenn ich es rüberschieben könnte, wäre natürlich auch gut. Aber das geht nicht. Das ich glaube eigentlich ja. schon. Warte mal. Ich bin jetzt nicht... Aha. Da ist jetzt ganz doof, ne? Ja, das ist ganz doof. <lacht> dann lass mich doch mal da eben ran, obwohl du dir deinen Kopf auch tief. Also viele und das ist jetzt groß, du kannst es aber auch klein machen. Ja. Wie du möchtest. Ich kann es auch etwas kleiner machen. Du kannst es auch etwas kleiner machen. Du kannst es auch. Ach, das ist ja auch ein schönes Foto. So machen wir. Ach so, ach so. Und wenn ich es jetzt doch wieder größer machen will, dann. Dann setze ich mal hin. Dann. Äh, Gehe ich da drauf genau. und, und, genau, genau. Ach so, und dann, und dann gehst du dann, auf dann gehe ich zwei. Ich ja da. Genau. Okay, gut. Und du klickst einfach hier weiter, ne? Ja, Zelda. genau. genau. Mhm. Gut. Ach, ich okay. habe schon. Na, ja, mhm. Dankeschön, Dankeschön, Dankeschön.
Very good. We'll start in just a, a few minutes. Sorry. <coughs> are, are we back? Uh, well, it's, sorry, I'll give people one minute, two minutes. <laughs> um, really ready to go. Can I start? No, not yet. Uh, just, no, just, just hold on a second. Um, two, two minutes, I think. I'll introduce you first, just quickly. You want me to start? No, no, I'm going to say, I'm going to introduce you first. You give me a sign, you give yes, me a sign. Yes, okay. yes, I, I will. Yeah, 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 please. Very good. Well, I think we may have lost one or two people for, for tea purposes, but hopefully they'll come back. Uh, we will make a start. It's my great pleasure now to introduce uh, another colleague, I hope I can call you that, um, from Germany, like um, Sigrid uh, Rüdiger Jopien is the an honorary professor at the University of Hamburg. Again, if you want to find out more about him, I urge you to look at the biographies that we have provided the link to in your own time. Uh, but since time is pressing, I'll now hand over to Professor Jopien to talk about a figure who's long interested me and about whom I've managed to find out very little. But Rüdiger is the person who has written one of the major the major publications about Naum Slutsky. So I very much look forward to hearing what you have to say. Do, do please start. Okay. Well. Okay. Yeah, I start with the first okay. two pictures. Please do. Uh oh, they are not coming. Oops. Is it not going forward? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Johanna? Yes, you might. What's, it sometimes gets stuck. Um, you might, what I find works rather oddly. Have you got Johanna there? Johanna? <laughs> I'm just calling. Yes, okay. It, okay. it functioned a minute ago. I know, it sometimes gets when stuck. When it gets mache, it's come kein Bild. You might want to just click on the top left-hand side of the screen, Johanna. It sometimes works. I don't know why it works. Ah, it often does. Okay. Try, try that. And then okay. now try again. Oh, okay. I'll try again. Okay. That's better. And now go full screen if you can. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I start. When Naum Slutsky arrived in England on the 2nd June of 1933, he had successfully escaped from Nazi Germany. The Nazis had searched for him as a communist who was said to have been involved in arms trafficking. During his last months in Hamburg, he had lived in the underground, changing his addresses several times. During his passage to England, Slotsky suffered a shipwreck in the lower river Elbe, which caused the loss of his luggage, including his tools. Thus, his former career as an avant-garde gold and silversmith and here I show you some examples of his silversmith's work, came to a set end in a physical and symbolic way. Soski arrived in England by visa, but almost penniless. Almost immediately, 
he turned to some colleagues of Max Sauerland, who was the director of the Hamburg Museum for Kunst und Gewerbe, Art and Industries, who had been his loyal patron for the last six or seven years. Sauerland had suggested to contact his colleague friend Herbert Reed, who had already bought a necklace from Slutsky during his former visit to Hamburg. Reed agreed to do what he could, for example, recommending Slutsky to Sir William Rothenstein, the director of the Royal College, and also to Percy Jowett, the director of the London County School of Art, later to become the Central School of Art in Southampton Row. Sauerland might also have suggested to contact the Hamburg-born collector and art dealer Gustav Del Banco, who later on became well known as the co-director of the Cork Street Gallery of Rowland, Browse and Del Banco. It is quite possible that as a legal resident in England who traveled regularly between London and hum Hamburg, Del Banco offered help by transporting some of the jewelry which Slutsky had left behind in Germany. A choice collection, um, which uh, I show here uh, from his Hamburg, uh, late Hamburg years. Slutsky's poor English made it difficult for him to find suitable work in London. Herbert Reed could have pulled some strings, for example, by recommending Slutsky to the industrialist Robert Dudley Best, owner of the lamp producing firm of Best and Lloyd in Birmingham. Best, who had once studied in Germany and who was aware of the progress which members of the Bauhaus had made in modern lamp design, had already brought a modern classic, the best light lamp, onto the market in 1931. Its form had been inspired by similar models by the ex-Bauhaus members Christian Dell and Marianne Brandt. In 1934, Herbert Reed published his groundbreaking book, Art and Industry, which contained a photo of a table lamp by Slutsky on the left, which the latter had designed in Hamburg, as well as a ceiling lamp in the form of an undecorated glass bowl by Best and Lloyd. Reed obviously knew both the designer and the manufacturer and could have established a contact between them. When in July 30, 1935, William B. Curry reported to the trustees of Dartington Hall upon a part-time contract between the Dartington Hall School and Slutsky as a forthcoming teacher for the school, he mentioned that Slutsky was presently working as a designer for Best and Lloyd and that he could continue to work for them during his free time at Dartington. But how did get Slutsky get in contact with Dartington Hall to begin with. It is known that Dorothy and Le Leonard Elmhurst had attentively watched what was going on in the Bauhaus in Weimar and Dessau because they regarded the Bauhaus as a potential model for their own reform school at Dartington. In June 1933, the Elmhurst received first-hand information about the Bauhaus why and how it was closed when they invited Walter Gropius and his wife Ise to visit them. Gropius may have hoped to receive some architectural commissions from them, but this was at the time wishful thinking because the Elmhurst were bound by contract to the American architect William Casey, whose work we have seen. Gropius went back to Berlin but returned to London in mid-May 1934 in order to attend the opening of an exhibition of his work at RIBA. One day later, one day later, on 19th of May, he held a programmatic speech before the British Design and Industry Association, DIA, which had been modeled on the German Werkbund and which consisted of the most forward-looking manufacturers architects, designers, craftsmen, etc. Among those who attended the lecture were the entrepreneur Jack Pritchard, who was to become the founder of the Isaacon Furniture Company, also Herbert Reed, and the lamp manufacturer Robert Dudley Best. We assume <laughs> that also Slutsky was in the audience and could have spoken to Gropius, 
for it is hardly a coincidence that a few days after his return to Berlin, Gropius wrote a letter of introduction for his old Bauhaus companion from his Weimar days, remarking on Slutsky's outstanding innovative, innovative and technical skills. And here is the letter. Gropius was always generous in his praise of former colleagues of the Bauhaus, even if they had angered him. At the end of 1923, Slutsky had been asked to leave the Bauhaus because he had carried out commissions on his own without informing the Bauhaus <coughs> business department. <coughs> However, the fact that Slutsky had been a member of the Bauhaus for almost four years justified Gropius' recommendation, particularly when an old colleague was in desperate need of work. In this context, Gropius' favorable recommendation could have acted for Slutsky as a door opener to Dartington, as, as, as I assume. Thus, from 1935 to 1940, the year when Slutsky was interned as an enemy alien in Douglas, the Isle of Men, he worked as a teacher at the Dartington Hall Reform School on a half-time basis. In his initial years in England, Slutsky may have been devoid of contact and communication. In Dartington, he must have met emigre companions from Germany, such as, I remember, uh, I, I mentioned one instance, the dancer Sigurd Leder, who was a native of Hamburg, who in the early 1920s had contributed to the famous Hamburg artistic festivals, which he called Künstlerfeste, and who, in the meanwhile, mm, um, had become co-director of the ballet Yours. Um, I show you here um, two photographs where Leder and Yours uh, um, performing um, between themselves, and on the other side, a snapshot from the Künstlerfeste, and you see um, Naum Slutsky and his wife on the, on the farther, far right. Um, he was uh, what we called uh, um, some. He 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 liked um, uh, such kinds of celebrations and uh, artistic uh, congregations, and uh, so it's no surprise that we find him here. As is well known, Dartington's fame as a hub of emigre artists in the 1930s rested very much on its preference for the performing arts, theatre, dance, and music. They had already played a dominant role at the Bauhaus where Slutsky had been an active member. In later years, when Slutsky taught design in Birmingham, he complained about the students' abstinence from festiv festivities like the one which he had experienced at the Bauhaus. He found his students all too lazy. To his taste, the students' life in Birmingham was too serious and sober, for he was convinced that engagement in play was an essential, essential factor in generating creativity. Living in the company of different kinds of artists at Dartington must have given Slutsky joy and satisfaction. Can we assume that after years of fighting for his existence in Hamburg and subsequently in London, he enjoyed the peaceful, carefree atmosphere of the Dartington surroundings? After Slutsky had come to England in 1933, he had seemingly abandoned his former profession as a jeweler <laughs> and henceforth concentrated on design. Only on one occasion, he seems to have practiced jewelry again at Dartington when he was supposed to have created a brooch for the girl he loved and supposedly married, Birgit Kulberg a member of the Ballet Yours and in later years the pioneer of expressionist dance in Sweden. In 1939, Kulberg returned to her native Stockholm. Her biographer mentions a love affair with Slutsky, but how their relationship ended is not known. Uh, I tried to contact her when I worked on it 30 years ago, uh, but she was already dement, so there was no information anymore. As Slutsky did not work as a jeweler anymore, um, he mentioned himself in around 1960 by confessing that he had given up jewelry um, 30 years ago. So what did he eventually teach at Dartington? He taught metalwork, as we know from two different sources. Mrs. Bride, Mary Bride Nicholson, 
later archivist of Dartington Hall remembered, as Monica Rudolph, Slutsky's first biographer, tells us, that when she was still a little girl, Slutsky set her the task to measure an egg and to produce an egg cup. Another young pupil was Brian O'Casey, the son of the dramatist Sean O'Casey, who left his native Ireland and settled in Darktington in 1938. Brian, the son, was then 10 years of age and visiting the Dartington Hall School. Brian's memory of Slutsky may be quote, quoted in full. He says, he, Slutsky, was an excellent teacher. I remember one class to teach us to use the piercing saw. We each had a small square of German silver and drilled several small holes in it at random. Then we had to saw out a pattern freehand, so to speak. The results were made into a brooch, my first piece of jewelry. Later on, Brayon himself became a professional and internationally acclaimed jeweler. His attachment to Slutsky remained so strong that after the latter's death, he visited Slutsky's widow and bought some of Slutsky's tools. Brayon is also recorded saying, I quote, Naum was a marvelous teacher, much too good for the likes of us. Brian's remark poses a question. If Slutsky was more qualified than teaching school children at Dartington, why did he stay there for five years? Or what else could he have done in those years? The British Museum owns a decanter, which once belonged to the fine art collector Margaret Gardiner, and which had been acquired from her in 1984. Slutsky is supposed to have presented this object to Miss Gardiner after the war, or rather he had given it to her in lieu of some oriental carpets which he had borrowed from her and presumably not given back. The decanter, a Chianti bottle or green glass, could be identical with what is called a bottle, see on the right-hand screen, which he had entrusted to Richard Bedford from the Victoria and Albert Museum for safekeeping, plus two other objects, before his internment in 1940. Bedford had been a close friend and of Max Auerland's and therefore could be trusted. At the end of the war, Slutsky asked for the return of the three objects. With regard to the decanter, the question arises whether it had been already produced in Hamburg and somehow reached England during the 1930s, or whether Slutsky had made it after his arrival in England. We know very little about what he did. The British Museum dates the object as before 1937, to which I would subscribe, even we cannot pin down the date more exactly. During the years between 1935 and 1940, Slutsky probably continued to work, as we've heard, for Best and Lloyd, and for this he would have had to travel occasionally to the firm's headquarters in Birmingham. But were there no other projects in London which interested him? The available literature on Dartington, which I know, on Gro which is not very much, I'm afraid, on Gropius and other emigres in London who were active in architecture and design makes no mention of Slutsky's activities. Although the Bauhaus style was not generally favored by the British public, a number of people were enthusiastic about it. I have mentioned Best already, and I would like to add Maxwell Fry, Herbert Reed, and especially Jack Pritchard, who gave commissions not only to Gropius, but also to Breuer and Morley Notch. In his memoirs, View from a Long Chair, Pritchard mentions Slutsky only once, but as a visitor to the Lawn Road flats between 1937 and 39, where Slutsky encountered his countryman, the Russian sculptor Naum Garbo, in the so-called Isobar, the community room at Lawn Road Flats, which Marcel Breuer had designed before he had left for the US. Here it is. In light of the fact that three major representatives of the Bauhaus, Gropius, Breuer, Morlinoch, with whom Slutsky had studied and closely worked, I mean, Breuer was a student at the time, um, during his early years in Weimar, 
that they stayed at Lawn Road flats between 1934 and 37, it seems puzzling that Slutsky's name does not appear among their names or along their names. Was there no opportunity or indeed intention to meet again? In the autumn of 1935, Isa Gropius spent some holidays at Dartington at the invitation of the Elmhurst, and her husband had changed the old barn into a proper theatre. There must have been occasions to run into each other, but to my knowledge, there is no evidence that this happened. Pritchard went out of his way to give work to the three mentioned Bauhaus members. The Lawn Road flats, which he had conceived and built with the architect Wells Coates in July 1934, were fully furnished and equipped with household utensils. Would Slutsky not have been a suitable candidate for designing some of the objects, for example, the light elements? Unfortunately, we hear nothing about this. At the beginning of 1936, Pritchard founded the Isocon Furniture Company and on the suggestion of Gropius entrusted Breuer with a design of a long chair in laminated plywood, which was finally produced and released in 1937. It is interesting to note that the textile covers on the long chair seats were produced by the textile mill at Dartington, which suggests that at least in this one instance, but there may be many more, that a business relationship existed between Pritchard and Dartington. Both Pritchard and the Elmhurst shared similar ideas and beliefs about the importance of modern art education and they sponsored works of art. Thus the question arises, why did Pritchard, who was such a devoted Bauhaus admirer, not make use of Slutsky's abilities? For example, by asking him to design furniture, which Slutsky had also done formerly in Hamburg. In the light of missing, or at least unknown to me, unknown archival material, I cannot answer the question, but I would like to follow this up in the future. In his view from the long chair, Pritchard extends the story of the Lawn Road flats into the post-war period and proudly names some famous British people who had stayed in the building, including Agatha Christie. Flusky's name is not on Pritchard's list, although from 1941 to 1946, he, during the war years, he resided in the building. Um, and his, this is the contract, um, which was actually laid out for only one year, but then it was extended and extended. The reason for the exclusion might have been that Slutsky quite often failed to pay his rent and had constantly to be reminded in doing so under the threat of given notice. But Slutsky might have felt convinced that Pritchard or the Isaacson administration would not take this last step on the grounds that he had been a notable Bauhaus member and thus enjoyed a special status. Gropius too had had difficulties in paying his rent at Lawn Road, but he paid them off through consultancy for Pritchard's firm, while Slutsky may have relied on help from the outside and seems to have succeeded with this strategy. It was suggested that for some time he worked for the Ministry of Defense. After 1945, Slutsky had various teaching posts in the Central School of Art from 46 to 50, the Royal College of Art from 50 to 57, and finally at the College of Art and Crafts in Birmingham, 57 to 64, <clears throat> where he held the post of head of the School of Industrial Design. In Birmingham, Slutsky was considered a brilliant teacher. This I heard from many of his pupils whom I could still interview. They formed a young generation of um, designers who were not only British, but also came from abroad. One of them was a young student from Paris, Patrick Le Cumont, who in his later years advanced to chief designer of the Renault car works in France. Uh, I show here uh, Slutsky with his students um, uh, uh, looking at some design objects they had just uh, uh, produced. Some years ago, I was able to ask Le Coumont why he had Paris for Birmingham 
And he answered that at the time, a technical design course such as was given in Birmingham did not exist in France. Very interesting. In 1961, Sotsky's earlier career as gold and silversmith became known again when his pre-war work was included in the International Exhibition of Modern Jewelry, 1890 to 1961 at Goldsmiths Hall, one of the most important jewelry exhibitions in that century. And it was the organizer of the show, Graham Hughes, who persuaded Slutsky successfully to take up jewelry again. He had seen jewels by Slutsky in Hamburg and then tried to find out who is this man and, uh, and in, he finally uh, spotted him in Birmingham. Some new jewels were subsequently purchased by Goldsmiths Hall, the Victoria and Albert Museum, and the Bauhaus Archive, which was still had been founded at Darmstadt at the time. Now it's Berlin. For his necklaces, Slutsky chose a design which he had invented in his very last months in Hamburg, when he was already without a workshop and dependent on improvisation using his hands. He had collected pebble stones from the river Elbe and tied these up with silver wire so that they would form a chain. Sluski had made these necklaces to impress his girlfriends. He presented them in lieu of accommodation when he was living already in the underground. Unfortunately, such early works seem not to have survived. To his later jewels, in the early 1960s, of which I show you one example, Slutsky added enamel, but that was not characteristic of his work, earlier work. He never used enamel in his early Bauhaus or later work, only in, up since 1960. Only the constructive way of making reflects the originality and the functional simplicity of his former years. And I come to the end and one last coda, I add two pages um, from correspondence between Gropius and Slutsky from September and October 1965. Slutsky, who was now at the advanced age of 69, was still living in Birmingham, but just about to take up a new teaching job at the Ravensbourne College of Art. In spite of a pension for his teaching services, his financial affairs were in a disastrous state. Being totally destitute, he saw no other way but to write to Gropius, explaining his circumstances of living and future plans. He wanted to move back to London and asking him for a loan of £600 sterling. But Gropius refused, which might have struck Slutsky as a shock. A fortnight later, only a fortnight later, on the 4th of November 1965, he died of a heart attack, leaving a wife and a daughter behind. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you very much, Rudiger. That was fascinating and indeed very, very moving. Would you mind exiting from your PowerPoint? Can you say it again? I have really have great exit, difficulties in understanding. Stop, you have to stop screen share. It should be at the top of your screen, a bright green strip that says stop screen screen sharing can you ask your is it your daughter johanna to no, help I, you? Be, um, should I, hmm. I, I can't do it for you unfortunately can, can you ask you her? otherwise we can't uh, we can't continue no that's it that's, that's it, it. Okay. Very good. all right very good thank you very much Wonderful. Okay, so I think what we'll do now is carry on straight to the next presentation. As I say, we'll have plenty of time at the end to have a more discursive discussion. So thank you, Rudiger, very much indeed. It's now my pleasure to introduce an old friend and colleague of mine who you've already heard from, Dr. Anna Nyberg. She's honorary lecturer at Imperial College London and also a member of the uh, Research Centre for German and Austrian Exile Studies, which is also part of the University of London. And she's going to be looking at... Um, a lesser known figure still, I think, in many ways, and his connections to Victor Bonham Carter, namely Helmut Weissenborn. So, Anna, over over to you. Okay, let's hope I can. I, I may have to make usual. A, I might have to make you co-host. Let me just. Yes. Um, I can see my screen. Can you? Can you see? Not yet. Hold on. Ah, oh, wait a minute. Share. 
Hold on. No, no, Anna, I think I have to make you co-host first. Oh, okay. just, just wait, just wait a second. Uh right, okay, hold on. Um you are now spotlighted. <clears throat> just give 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 me a minute. Hi. Hi. Oh, go in. <laughs> it's <Wait>. all happening. <laughs> make oh. a, okay, Anna, go go ahead. You should be able to screen share. I think so, somebody it, needs to mute. Is it it it, it, it you need to Somebody yes, mute. please Sorry. make sure everybody's muted. About her too much. <laughs> okay, let's um, try and bring my PowerPoint up. Can you see it? No. Uh, not yet. No. Ah, where's screen share? Let me make it go down you again. See bottom, it's that bright green logo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but now it's not showing my... Mm. Oh, sorry. If I put my PowerPoint up, then there's no... no. There's... No, 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 I chance. don't think, no, no, no. Open the PowerPoint and then minimize it. Okay. Yes, minimize and then go to, it. yeah, and just keep it there. Uh, and go to uh, share now... screen. Nope, that's, oh, here we go. There we are. Okay, and now go to share screen, Anna, and it should come up as one of the options, and then you click on it. Let's try that. There. Yeah, it looks promising. There we go, and yes. then we go to full now, screen. Full screen, very good. Yep. Uh, reading uh, to you. Mm, not yet, not yet. It's the, the little screen Coming. logo. That's it. Perfect. Yep. I think we've got that. Is that full screen? Yes, that's good. Perfect. That's better, I think. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I think my story is a little more peripheral uh, than some of the very central stories of Dartington. Um, but I hope that it will add a couple of threads to the, the very rich tapestry of the Dartington story in some way. Now, the previous speaker, thank you very much, has... Um, segued slightly because he mentioned uh, Ravensbourne School, uh, where Slutsky taught, well, also the subject of my talk, Helmut Weissenbaum also taught there. It was a very small art school, but um, had a lot of emigre teachers and uh, was actually uh, punched beyond its weight, I think the expression is. So um, I'm going to talk about Helmut Weissenborn and Victor Bonham Carter. The name Bonham Carter has long been associated with liberal politics in Britain. And of course, we all know the name of Helena Bonham Carter, uh, one of Britain's leading actors. Victor, from the same family, had a role in the Dartington School as its historian, which we've already heard. Leonard Elmhurst, co-founder with his uh, heiress wife, Dorothy, praised Victor Bonham Carter for his objective account of the history of the project, contextualizing it in the problems of the countryside faced by Britain at that time, that's the 1970s. Uh, Bonham Carter alluded to his, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, now we've gone back to um, Elmhurst, alluded to the disarming friendliness and profound humanity and uh, found little difficulty in winning the hearts of a large number of people. One of the helpers in this was the refugee artist Helmut Weissenborn, who named Victor Bonham Carter more than once as his best English friend. Now, in the study of exile, uh, those refugees who fled Nazi-occupied Europe to find asylum in Britain, there are many stories of patronage and support, both financial and emotional, given to Germans, Austrians and others in their hour of need. A modest example, which does relate just to Dartington, is that of a Quaker couple, Robin and Heather Tanner. Robin was an educator and etcher who taught at Dartington, which was a source of great joy to him. And, uh, sorry, that's uh, Helmut Weissenborn, and here we have the Tanners. The couple, uh, the Tanners, took in an 18-year-old German Jewish boy, Dieter Hanf, who became their adopted son and helped them with their work. Another example already much quoted today is Herbert Reed, a celebrated art historian who had a close connection, I might say, with Thames and Hudson, the art publishing house founded by a Viennese emigre. He too took in a German Jewish girl, Leonie Korn, to live with the family on an au pair basis. She later became very important BBC. But in the case of Bonham Carter and Weissenborn, it was a case of genuine friendship with some mutual benefits. Bonham Carter was born in 1913 
um, into an army family. He had very a varied career, one part of which was one, running the school print service, quite well known, whereby reproductions of famous works of art were lent out to schools across England for the benefit of school children. He also worked on the Countryman magazine and had a lasting interest in rural affairs. Weissenborn, by contrast, was born in 1898, so he was 15 years older, in Leipzig, which in the 19th century and early 20th century was the center uh, of the German, indeed of the European book trade. The city was home to hundreds of publishers, printers, bookbinders, and all the activities associated with book production. Logically, it was also the seat of a prestigious college, the Leipzig Academy of Graphic and Book Arts. Uh, an international student body and celebrated practitioners in the book arts helped to make its name known throughout Europe and beyond and still going strong today, albeit under another name. It was here that that Weissenborn enrolled as a student after having survived a truly dreadful spell in the German army when he was conscripted aged 17 to fight in the First World War. At the academy, he gloried in his studies, eventually becoming its youngest professor. He taught perspective and printmaking. The 1920s were a golden age of book arts, especially in Germany. Book collecting and book appreciation were popular. Weissenborn designed and printed ex libris book plates for his friends, family and private clients. You can see one here. He made a specialism of uh, making um, book plates out of little printers, geometric um, tiny little pieces and made them up into these very striking uh, book plates, mostly in this is around the 1920s. But as the 1920s gave way to the 30s, the horizon started to darken for Weissenborn on two fronts. On the one hand, the National Socialists were starting to force their way into the Leipzig Academy to impose their own political and racial ideals, replacing teaching staff with fanatical but untrained staff members, much to Weissenborn's disgust. On the other hand, Weissenborn was now married to Edith Halberstam, the daughter of incredibly wealthy and cultured Jewish fur traders. Leipzig was also an international center for fur trading, located as it was in the east, as it is, uh, near the borders then with Russia and Poland, where the fur was sourced. Edith and Helmut uh, seems to have been a passionate affair rather than a planned relationship. When the couple were married, Edith was already expecting their son Florian. Weissenborn lost his post at the academy because of his Jewish wife, and he decided to make his way to Britain, where he already had many contacts. In 1939, the time had come to flee. Weissenborn had to leave before the German army uh, call-up papers arrived, and he left without his wife and son, who followed on later. Weissenborn set about finding work, but the internment crisis of 1940 came just as he was getting his work permit based on re recommendations from Monotype, the printing giant and other companies. He was rounded up and sent to Hutchinson Camp on the Isle of Man, uh, much to his horror. He absolutely hated his loss of freedom. But there was worse. Adit served divorce papers on him while he was incarcerated and she emigrated further to Argentina with Florian. There she remarried and started a new life, much to Weissenborn's chagrin. On his release around Christmas 1940, Weissenborn picked himself up again and started out, taking up a teaching post, many illustration commissions. He remarried and revived an existing publishing company, the Acorn Press, and produced with them very many collectible, beautiful books and prints. Meanwhile, Victor Bonham Carter, uh, now married to his first wife, uh, Audrey Bonham Carter, and you can see here the book plate that Weissenborn made for them. Victor had joined up in 1939 
and uh, recalled that time in his autobiography, which is called What Countryman, Sir, which he wrote, uh, was published in 1996. He'd met Weissenborn in 1938 when he was looking around England as a possible place of exile. And he said, quote, late in 1939, uh, this is Bonner Carter, I was able to assure the relevant tribunal of his status as a friendly alien so that he was allowed to continue working as an artist. Difficult enough in any circumstances, although he'd begun slowly and painfully to make his way. Then came the panic of 1940 and Helmut, like the rest, was shipped off to seclusion on the Isle of Man, whence he emerged later in the year, unquote, from Bonham Carter. Perhaps because Bonham Carter spoke German, having lived in uh, Hamburg, in fact, uh, for many years and was sympathetic to the cause of German refugees, he engaged more than one, for example, to design his journal called The Author for the Society of Authors, which he ran. Just one was Georg Tölcher, uh, later called George Adams, who had in fact trained at the Bauhaus. Um, and he, uh, Bonham Carter really liked Adams's modern and striking page design and his choice of typography. Weissenborn and Bonham Carter together produced a book called Billy the Bee. And a charming children's book, which Bonham Carter had written. And Bonham Carter explained, quote, we planned it primarily as a vehicle for Helmut to allow him scope to fantasize with drawings of insects, birds, and fish, most of them in color against lush backgrounds of riverbanks, a spider's web and a harvest moon. We sold the copyright to Mr. Goodman, another emigre publisher of Hammond and Hammond, and the book was superbly printed by the Baynard Press. Now, the Baynard Press, who already produced the school prints we mentioned, was where a certain Leslie MacDonald worked on the printing side, and she became Helmut's second wife. We'll see her book plate in a minute. The next book that Bonham Carter and Helmut produced together was here, um, A Posy of Wild Flowers. And Bonham Carter said, Helmut was at his best, creating elegant designs out of the flowers I chose, all within a format of 40 by 50 uh, millimeters. So they were quite small. Bonham Carter then took up farming in Devon after the war, before he became involved in Dartington. He was invited in 1951 to uh, make a radio program about Dartington Hall and admitted that he then knew nothing about the place. This commission, he said, gave birth to one of the most important experiences of my life, since it led to a 15-year assignment by the Dartington Hall trustees to write the history of the enterprise since its foundation in 1925. It seems that whenever there was an opportunity to pass work Weissenborn's way, he did so. Uh, naturally, for the history then, he asked Weissenborn to supply some drawings. These were two graphic reconstructions. There's Leslie's um, book plate that he designed. You can see her printer's tools there, something they had a common interest in. Uh, now we have the history of Dartington Hall with uh, tiny, tiny drawings by Weissenborn, which are here. Uh, so these are the original medieval buildings to give the, the idea an idea to the reader of the way they would have looked. Now, underneath the credit given to Professor H. Uh, Weissenborn of Leipzig, under the captions, is almost disproportionately large, given that there are only two small drawings shown. But this is uh, then the uh, the typical help and friendship that uh, um, Carter was showing to Weissenborn, trying to give him a helping hand. There's another connection because nearby Bryanston School, which uh, Bonham Carter's son had attended, hosted Dartington Hall's Music Summer School. There were 29 Dartington Summer School of Music events. I think we hear more about these tomorrow, beginning with the first ever event at Bryanston in 1948. Bonham Carter hit on the idea in 1958 of compiling and editing a symposium 
with contributions by distinguished, distinguished writers and artists who had some connection with the school. The Bryanston Miscellany appeared in the autumn of 1958, with only small fees being paid to the, the only two friends who helped him. One was Eric McNally, the typographer at Dartington Hall, and the other was Helmut Weissenborn, who designed the end papers and the cover block, which was based on the Greek theater at the school. You can see uh, that tiny, tiny um, drawing here with the Greek masks. Bonham Carter continued to work with Helmut's wife, Leslie MacDonald, after Weissenborn's death, bringing out later editions of their cooperative works uh, by Weissenborn's Acorn Press and others. Bonham Carter died in 2007, but his widow Cynthia, the second wife, lived on in their house in Somerset for some years and I went to visit her. The house had paintings by Weissenborn in almost every room, several of them landscapes of Bonham Carter's beloved Exmoor. Some of these were gifts from Weissenborn. It was easy to see what the two men shared, a love of the countryside, of flowers and other plants, animals in particular. One room had two of his insect paintings, a very large bee, no doubt to remind Victor of the joint Billy the Bumblebee project, and a similarly large fly. Cynthia Bonham Carter recalled to me what pleasure the two friends had in speaking German together. As, as I've mentioned, Victor lived in Hamburg for a long period and spoke the language fluently. With a shared passion for natural history, as well as for art and literature, there is no doubt that Weissenborn benefited greatly from his English friend's support and the friendship was rewarding for both of them. Thank you. Lovely, thank you very much, Anna. I'm sure we'll come back to some of uh, the points made there. And I think now, if we may, we'll move straight on to Elizabeth Lamley, our last but certainly not least speaker for today's proceedings. Um, uh, Elizabeth, let's um, find you and I'll make you co-host as well. Right, here you are. Um, good. Uh, Great, OK. There, there we go, and I'll just... I'll move Anna for the for the moment. Um, good. Hi. Nice. Nice to see you. And thanks for your uh, technical input earlier. Let me just uh, let me just. Ah, uh, oh. can everyone see that? All good to go. You just need to go full screen. Lovely. So now for the enfant terrible, <laughs> Lucien, Lucien Freud. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you for having me. Um, so today I'm going to be speaking to you about community and migration in the Freud family letters focusing on one woman's account of her and her family's journey from Nazi Germany to Dartington Hall. Um, these letters that I'm talking about today can be found in the Lucian Freud archive in the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and they really give some insight into like the personal perspectives of some of Dartington's inhabitants at the time, their interpersonal relationships, and how the school and its people facilitated and supported some refugee families. So, in Berlin in 1896, Lucy Freud, who is the central figure of this talk today, uh, was born as Lucy Brash, the daughter of the wealthy merchant Joseph Brash and his wife Elise. She studied classical philology and art history in Munich, where she met her soon-to-be husband Ernst Freud. Ernst was an architect and the youngest son of Sigmund Freud, the famous psychoanalyst. The couple married on the 18th of May 1920 and they had three children together, Stephen, Lucian and Clement. So some of you may already be familiar with who Lucian Freud is, um, as he became one of the most notable painters of, in Britain in the 20th century. Um, but like many German Jewish refugees, they did feel that they had to leave Nazi Germany, you know, with anti-Semitism on the rise and the newly enacted Nazi policy meant that Ernst was no longer able to work as an architect. And so in the summer of 1933, Ernst Freud went to London by himself in order to organize a new life for them, such as networking to continue his career in architecture and to find a home and school for his family. Lucy and the children traveled to England in September, and then Ernst returned to Germany in order to arrange the transport of all of their belongings. So these letters were written while the family were separated in these moments of migration. And Dartington Hall was their first stop in Britain. Um, although Lucy did first have reservations about going there, um, she questioned Dartington's experience with the experiment in freedom and its lack of competition among the students. She was worried that their progressive approach to education wasn't strict enough um, to her standards and might therefore have no guidance when the danger of complete slovenliness becomes apparent. 
However, as she also said, that if it would have the desired effect of making the children more active, then any method would do. Lucy saw Dartington as suitable for Lucian, in particular, um, as he would have uh, a very favourable influence on Dartington's outrageous possibilities. Um, although with her other sons, Stephen and Clement, she was much less confident that they would really make use of their years of learning outside a more or less academically minded school. But she did um, find it very intriguing, uh, Dartington's method of learning by doing, with all of the opportunities to learn and work outside of the classroom environment. Um, she did actually tell Ernst one day that um, the description that he observed when he visited the school sounded so wonderful that she would have liked to have gone there with him as students themselves. And because of the famous Freud name, Ernst was able to negotiate a discount for the school fees. But it was Dartington's potential for a supportive community and easy integration for the children that ultimately won her over. Um, she said in a letter, what really attracted me to Mrs. Goetz's report was the humanity and helpfulness of the children there. Her assertion that there is no easier transition for our children than the one there, Limshen, which is Ernst's nickname, I'm anxious and willing not to be selfish in the upbringing of the children. I am prepared to let them go away if it seems better for them that way. But I have to believe in that, otherwise it's too hard. The most important thing for our three children is that they become tougher and more combative, to become different from me, the spoiled one. Being spoiled is not a good thing. And so she notes that Dartington's readiness to admit students with limited English was very essential. The Freud boys, you know, while they had received a few months of English lessons in preparation for migration, they still did struggle with, with the language. She said, very important for the decision is the question of whether there is a person there whom the children can learn, can lean on when they are unhappy. This adult would have to understand and speak German. But in fact, there were no teachers in Darlington at that time who spoke German. And um, so what really affected her own experience as a newly arrived migrant in Britain was that Dartington did allow her to stay there at the estate uh, in order to support her children. She recalls a conversation that she had with Headmaster Curry. He claimed that no mother had ever stayed half as long and been at school so much without the teacher and house mother wiping her away. And that with me, the opposite was true for the first time. Everyone unanimously wanted me to stay, praise me and love me. So a very welcoming environment. Um, and her first impression uh, began uh, on the train journey from London to Totnes. So this is from 1925, it was the closest image I could find. Um, she says, it seems wonderful here, the atmosphere on the London Totnes train, uh, which was so reserved for the pupils, was a delightfully cheerful atmosphere in which our children were already in the midst. Just now, I saw all three of them wandering around together. They're all talking about the holidays, and of course they don't understand a thing, but there is a wonderful little German girl of about Kilio's age with a touching seriousness and cleverness. That first evening that they arrived at Dartington, Lucy says that the children were like stray sheep. But by the end of their first full day, her impression of them had changed. All three were beaming. The revitalizing effect seems entirely due to the geniality and diversity of the children uh, that were the other students. So she regales her husband with their newfound enthusiasm. Um, Gab has spoken to several children, partly in English, partly in French, and mostly in pantomime. They all think alike here, he called out to me. That has a very liberating effect on me. Luxie came crashing down. Mummy, it was wonderful. I spent a whole hour laughing with the Chinaman. And what her Kleshian experienced? A 15-year-old boy asked him to give him German lessons. Lucy goes on to say that she spent most of that Sunday helping unpack and put away belongings from the 25 new students and became acquainted with Stephen's new house mother, a Mrs. Bauman, whom she described as a young and friendly one who doesn't understand a word of German. Of the school and its teachers, Lucy has a lot of opinions, um, but in general, she thinks they are perhaps too young and although morally sound, not strict enough with the students. She thinks Miss Shelley, Clement's teacher, is too messy is he, and she isn't sure what to make of Stephen's teachers, Hunter, Lack and Munro. Of Hunter, she says that he is probably too young, too shy, and perhaps too confused by the principle of kindness to object to boys running in and out during lessons. She says that Munro, um, the French teacher, is a very beautiful man, tall, distinguished, very conscientious. No one prepares his lessons as carefully as he does. Almost every day when he sees her, he asks her for a French vocabulary word. Um, of three, Lack the biologist is her favourite, um, and thankfully Dartington did have a photo of him. Um, she thinks that Bridget Edwards, Lucian's teacher, is the only older and experienced one on the staff. Only in her class is there order and always nice and hard work. She's very skillful in teaching the children many things and, like all of them, wonderfully patient. 
She also speaks very highly of a Mrs Biggs, who is perhaps the wife of Ronald Biggs, Dartington's director of music. She says, Biggs is the best. If Curry had this clever, practical workaholic woman as a teacher in the school, I think I would be all right with a teacher. But it keeps her away. Probably she's too strong a personality and too finished for him. She's a very unwavering, very secure person. And the more you know her, the more you like her. She's a faithful proclaimer of your gifts and works wisely, carefully and persistently to set you up here. For her husband, she's a wonderful woman and this marriage is really beautiful. Him who is very sensitive, very neurotic, but clever, clear and very serious in his work, I value very highly. Now, as students, um, Lucian's experience is particularly interesting. So at first he did really struggle. Um, unlike his brothers, he wasn't as socially successful or as good in his English. She says, Lucian has the hardest time, probably because he is so passionate. He always has conflicts with children in his class, partly because he doesn't understand them. The other night, he didn't quite keep a pony out of the night and Nikki, a gorgeous 10 year old little farmer, was furious because he had told him to do so and wanted to punish Lux. When the good and understanding Tao explained to Nikki that Lux would not have understood him, Nikki said, sobbing, how can a person be so stupid for English when he is so clever for riding? So unfortunately, he is hated by Walter Schwar, who is quite a difficult and perhaps mischievous child. Walter S. had five sweets stolen from him, again it will probably be, and claims that Lux took them from him. Circumstantial evidence, Lux had also once taken seven biscuits, where there were only two for every child, and poor Lux didn't understand that, now that Tag has explained it to him through me. Um, he only takes his second biscuit. And there are always stories like that. I hope in one or two months, the misfortunes caused by his incomplete understanding will no longer be possible. His class contains, for the most part, such splendid children that he will soon have good friends for sure. It is very good and important for him that I'm still here and I'm really useful to him because he believes and follows me and his teacher, house mother and class use me as an interpreter. And so even at this early stage um, of his schooling at Dartington, the progressive approach for education really does seem to be very positive for Lucian Freud. She says, Mrs. Biggs told me that according to the Berlin information the, from his old school that they sent over, um, the school expected him to be the least intelligent and that they think and expect the most from him. Um, so Dartington expected a lot from him. They, so they feel that he is an artistic type and are looking forward to developing his talents. I'm very happy, especially for him. So whereas previous school in Berlin saw Lucian as a very challenging student, Dartington really embraced his differences. He ended up spending a lot of time helping out at the farm with the ponies and he really impressed his art teacher. So in the afternoon, there was drawing with Mr. Kent, a tall, young, warm-hearted man of Lux's own type. Lux drew for three hours in a row and he was supposed to draw nothing but spots of colour next to each other. Then he learned to cut a, a stamp out of a potato, which was dipped in paint and used like a seal. His cheeks were glowing with happiness and eagerness, and Mr. Kent was very pleased with his talented pupil. He paid me a visit to ask me about Lux's nature and how best to deal with him. I also showed him the two pictures Lux took at his previous school, and he seemed really enthusiastic. Um, it seems that being able to focus on his own choice activities, um, writing and art, um, sorry, I don't think this was supposed to be a quote, but uh, it seems that makes Lucian much happier and secure in this new environment. Uh, by his own account, he spent all day riding at the farm because of his inability to speak English. It was a form of escapism and a coping technique as much as it was a joyous activity. And I don't think we can under really underestimate the impact that it had on him as an artist um, to be given this space and support to focus on his art. Um, so her overall impression of Dartington was very positive. She says, the school building is of a refined perfection in every detail of the furnishings. Uh, the food seems to be very modern, immensely plentiful and wonderful quality. It is difficult to know in advance whether these beautiful environs are more beneficial than they are damaging through spoiling. It will all depend on the spirit of these children. Today they played inside all day, it was a rainy day. Classes are due to, st to start tomorrow. How I wish I were a child here. Um, but as an adult at Dartington, Lucy still had a very unique experience. Um, so Lucian Freud's biographer, um, his biography William, by William Fever mentions that his mother stayed with Dorothy and, and Leonard Elmhurst um, at the beginning of his stay there. And Lucy writes about staying with Mrs Biggs, who met them at the station and drove her to Dartington while the children travelled with the other students. So by her second day, uh, Lucy tells Ernst how she is a delightful almost friend, um, even though the newness of the relationship was strained by her necessity to re rely on all of them. She said that they spoil me in every way. I really like old friends, except that I feel so much the impersonal of this relationship and it weighs on me a little. 
Um, but relying on their hospitality during this transitional period was a known and very valued aspect of their move to Darlington. Um, I, I wonder that few German Jewish refugees had the luxury of staying with family or friends in England during this time, and uh, particularly as part of the early wave of refugees uh, to Britain. Um, if you think of the historical context, context of restrictive policies against enemy aliens dating back to World War I, um, you know, it really greatly impacted the social life, stability and employment opportunities of German immigrants. Um, so, for example, like, you know, uh, the German community in London had dwindled from around 60,000 to 6,000 people due to these pressures. Um, but the Dartington community provided Lucy with her own accommodation and social circle. Um, she moved into what she called the Old Parsonage, which I think is maybe one of these buildings. They're both named Old Parsonage and they were both owned by Dartington Hall, um, but I'm not sure exactly which one it could be. Um, she described it as an old vicarage and perhaps rectory, and it is the most enchanting thing you can imagine. A very long, spacious old house in a beautiful park with incredibly large rooms has been completely renovated, furnished and equipped with every comfort for several hundred thousand marks seven years ago. So it did cost more than staying with Mrs. Biggs, I think maybe two guineas a week. Um, but Lucy preferred paying her way rather than relying on charity. Um, Mrs. Biggs was entirely unwilling to accept a penny from her under any circumstances. Um, so Lucy's involvement in Darting's activities did also play a very crucial role in her integration, uh, connecting her with the community there and providing her with personal pursuits beyond her role as an emigre mother. So on the evening of her second day at Dartington, um, she was invited to take part in uh, what she says is a lecture and discussion evening about the timber industry, fruit and cider production, and the poor state of the chicken farm. Lucy says that she didn't understand much, but the image of 80 or so people around a fireplace with dim lighting, a cheerful, often witty discussion involving the beautiful dance students and the estate workers was very impressive. Mrs. Biggs told her affirmatively that this was not typically English, but only possible in this progressive atmosphere. And her social life flourished. Um, she translated a German cookbook for Mrs. Biggs, taught German to Mrs. Curry, the wife of the headmaster, um, and was invited out a lot. She received a request from Dorothy Burlingham to make German conversation with the playwright Barbara King and solved crossword puzzles with the Amherst secretary. By October 18th, she'd forged stronger ban bonds with staff members, uh, particularly the house mother, Tao, and Magda Bauman, who were her confidants. And she also grew closer with Mrs. Biggs. She tells Ernst, Biggs is the best. She's very unwavering, very secure person. And the more you know her, the more you like her. She tells Ernst that after spending her first weeks at Dartington, doing nothing but watching the children and waiting for you, she's finally beginning to live here. She says, but now I finally have to tell you what I mean by beginning to live. Not my function as a mother, nor my time consuming one as a correspondent. I don't like to ask anyone for a typewriter. I don't like to ask at all. And also that I don't mean that everything connected with school just spoils me with kindness. I mean activities as a student. I am enthusiastically learning pottery. I am treated as an authority by adults and seniors in the French circle. And tomorrow I'm starting to learn tap, which is a dance technique in which they use their feet as if the front and back were connected by hinge in the middle of the joint and have to be used accordingly. So these activities are not just open to her um, by the Dartington community, but offered to her for free. And since she landed in England with only 13 pounds, she spent nothing uh, at this time, except for stamps, a telegram, a haircut and a trip. So it seems unlikely um, if the Freud had settled in any other type of community and um, that they would have been able to afford such a diverse range of social and educational activities. And yet it is access to these resources um, that allowed Lucy to find a different sense of, of um, selfhood outside of her role as wife and mother and form the social connections necessary to successfully establish herself as a part of a very unique British community. And I believe that's all I've got time for today. Thank you. Sorry, I'm still muted. That was absolutely delightful. Thank you. Good. All right. So we have time now and I'm going to try and spotlight everybody who's spoken this afternoon, although I seem to be having trouble spotlighting more than two people. I'm not quite sure why. Let me see if we can get Alan back on and the others besides and Marcus. Is this going to work? Yes, hopefully it is. And let's skim through. Um, and Rüdiger. Yes, it's, it's, it's working. And Sigrid and Anna. And have I, who have I left out? Um, let me just go through. 
in the meantime, do uh, summon up your thoughts to uh, uh, fire questions and comments at the wonderful speakers. Um, I'm going to, and Charlie here, yeah, um, I have a feeling Anna, I know she has domestic commitments that uh, make it difficult now. Why am I, hold on, you see Anna, for some reason I can't spotlight her, bother. Okay, um, let's leave that for the moment. Okay, let's let's start with that. I'm going to try try spotlighting the others. Oh, very good. It's it's worked. Have I left? I have left some people out, haven't I? Um, in the meantime, though, while I'm just uh, trying to locate people on the screen, um, yes. Any any comments or, or questions as a way of rounding up today's wonderful uh, proceedings? Perhaps hard. There's been so much interesting material that you've been bombarded with. Can I perhaps just set the ball rolling by? Sigrid, did you want to did you want to say something? Yeah, no, go on. Please un unmute yourselves. Go on. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I know it's not uh, it, it's maybe a very banal question, but many of the artists we talked about today and we we heard about they they made this trip from London to Dartington obviously many times. Now, when I went to to England lately, um, I figured it's it's quite a long trip. So. So how how can we how, how do we look at that? Uh, do, do, is there an easy back and forth all the time, or is there the railroad running, or how is the connection to London uh, in many ways being pursued in a practical level? Or maybe maybe it's a banal question, but I wondered when I when I had been there now that it's quite far away. I think it's a very good question, isn't it? I hadn't really thought of it, but it is. Even today, it's a longish journey, and in those days, it would have taken much, much longer. Any any thoughts on that? Well, I don't know know the answer, but uh, I agree. I think it's an interesting question in terms of the kind of <clears throat> process of understanding the the space in which they're in. Right, that the, if you are not there, the pro, the journey to this kind of like utopian place becomes part of your overall journey there. So I suppose if, you, if you're not there all the time, um, then the actual means of migration, the means of transport there become really important. I don't uh, know, but I've not thought about it like that. So very interesting question. That's a great anyway. Sort of thing that Anna Naima might be able to answer, but sadly she doesn't seem to be with us this afternoon. That, that's a shame, but but no matter. No, no she's not. Um, can I pick up? I mean, one of the sort of threads <laughs> running through this afternoon has been, of course, the reference to the Bauhaus. Uh, and I seem to remember reading, and I can't, I'm afraid, rather embarrassing, remember where it was, but some mention of the fact that the Elmhurst actually financed certain aspects of the Bauhaus in Germany. Rudiger, you're, you're nodding. Do you, do you know any more about this? Because that, of course, is obviously relevant. Do you want to unmute yourself, um, Rudiger? No, you have to unmute yourself again. That little red, the little red logo, the little... It should be at the bottom left of your screen. And there's a line through a little red microphone symbol. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's it's, it. it's oh, yeah. Very good. Yeah, okay. Good. Yes, do, do tell us. I'm intrigued by that. No, as far as I, I know, they gave um, $500 in 1932. They tried to support the Bauhaus at a very, very... Um, difficult time um but i believe that also in the tw early 20s they uh, gave a donation to the bauhaus um that's perhaps something that uh, could be established or, or followed further by documents in the archive but uh, i'm talking about my um knowledge from literature i i've read i've i've not found this out myself mm. i've read it somewhere as well <clears throat> Alan, do you know anything about that? Again, sorry, you have to unmute yourself. Um, yeah, this is new information. Yeah. To me and, and very interesting. I mean, they're not very large sums, but still very generous. Uh, and um, yes, it, it's, it's surprising the news hasn't come. Maybe they did a lot of giving rather quietly. I think they must have. I think in Fiona McCarthy, she may have said something about that as well, because um, that that's a source that I recently looked up again. But 
the the interest in in the Bauhaus, the general interest in the Bauhaus as an experimental school um, that already knew thirty years ago when I was working on on Slutsky and his time in England. That's that's a factor. Yeah. Very interesting, and the fact that you know they may have given money in the twenties, but that they were actually keen to support the project in nineteen thirty-two. That also is significant. It has to be, doesn't it? Really interesting. Okay, well, that's something else to to, to be pursued I mean, quite, quite clearly. Perhaps yeah. one sidelight on that is the fact that Tagore um, was involved. Uh, through Stella Cramrish in putting on uh, an exhibition of Bauhaus works on paper in Calcutta mm -hmm. in, was it 1920 or 21? There's a separate book on that. Mm -hmm. And that's probably how the Elmhursts first heard about the Bauhaus. Interesting. I mean, we haven't focused on Tagore, but he's quite clearly a key figure, in the, particularly in the early days. Is that's he possible, yeah. yeah. Pity that Anna's mm -hmm. not, not, not with us. Um, the other connection I'm intrigued by is the Isocon one, Jack Pritchard, who's been mentioned more than once. And I think Valeria, who again, I think has disappeared uh, in the latter part of the afternoon, she mentioned that there were uh, Marcel Breuer chairs in High Cross. And I immediately thought, well, okay, so how, you know, how does that work? Yes, um, I, the, the more Miss van der Rohe chairs than Breuer ones, I think. Oh, okay, I think she said There Breuer. is one Breuer, okay. uh, the local uh, Vasily chair is there. But these were available on the market. Mm. You didn't have to have particularly no. special knowledge. They were uh, for sale from uh, Tone. Uh, and uh, so, you know, if you were in the know, you knew how to how to procure them. Nevertheless, there's clearly a Pritchard connection, isn't there, Rudiger, with, with uh, Slutsky, for one. So I would be surprised if there weren't more connecting threads than we perhaps know about. It's a shame we haven't got, I might as well say straight away, we were hoping that Magnus Englund and his colleague Leila de Belge, who've actually written about group, well, written about Isocon, but also about Gropius um, more recently, uh, were supposed to be giving a paper, but actually had to withdraw. So they would have been welcome additions to our roster of speakers uh, to answer such questions. But again, I think that's a connection that's worth taking further. Um, any questions from the audience at all? I suspect everybody's beginning to feel a little bit screen we uh, weary, but please do do um, unmute yourselves and perhaps just, just attain. Yes, go ahead. Attain. I'm going back to the more mundane question of mm. the journey. Mm. Uh, I seem to remember the train journey from Totnes to London was almost seven hours in, yeah. in those early days, in the wartime days. It became shorter and shorter, of course, but it was a considerable undertaking going up to London. Mm -hmm. Etienne, perhaps I can ask you the question <laughs> that you may not have heard me ask uh, just before lunch, how it was being a student in those modernist buildings that Valeria was talking about. I mean, were you in fact living in one of those very modern homes? Yes. Sort of, how did it feel? This was a, It wasn't a cozy yeah. environment, presumably. The that very was... first. The first house I lived in when I came from India was in Blackless, the first of the three modern boarding houses at Alla Park. Um, and then later on, and it worked beautifully. Um, we each had a little room, shared bathrooms and, and loos, a big room for the house mother, where we all sat together and had reading at night. Um, and cocoa and so on, and, and the dining room just down below, and the classrooms underneath. Um, I, I was spent quite a bit of time in Bill Curry's house at High Cross, which was, I thought, a beautiful place to live in. Um, and I think Bill Curry always thought of um, modern education requiring modern buildings, at least not requiring, but matching with modern buildings, simplifying and um, clean lines, um, easy and, and rational as it were. Were you aware though of that modernist architecture being very different to the local architecture? Because clearly these buildings must have Arouse suspicion on the part of the locals, or certainly, you know, sort of puzzlement. Well, I think 
I think the locals were pretty amazed yeah. um, when the first mo white modernist buildings went up, yes, and probably rather hostile. Mm. Um, I don't know. I think eventually they came to um, admire them, or at least to accept them as part of Dartington's quirkiness. <laughs> Thank you, Etienne. Um, Charlie, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to uh, say one of the things that's um, struck me about this afternoon, and that mainly from that uh, from that uh, the uh, Freud paper just just now is actually how many absences there are in the in the like, Dartington archive about all these connections and people, and there's only so much you can gain from the actual Dartington Hall archive it's, it, itself. And one of the things that struck me when I first started looking at it was how if you searched up up all of these people individually you'd find the the name of Dartington Hall right but there was nothing Dartington central that kind of links all of these people together in a kind of refugee community that otherwise you wouldn't find it unless you were searched unless you were um really happened to be looking at these plethora of artists and 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 creatives um well, I guess in general the people like 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 in elizabeth's paper i've i've not seen much reference at all to the freud family in the in the in the in the actual dartington archive and yet they obviously play well they're they're quite involved members of the of the communities so i think it's worth just highlighting it uh, i suppose that uh, at, at the end of the, the first day of the absences in the archive as well as what we're going to find out hopefully from more kind of people look, uh, 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 coming forward and noting that they had some sort of involvement with Dartington or that, that so and so was there and we can gradually start to 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 build up a more full database than perhaps we we currently have because evidently there are more people involved than that we all first first thought. Um, I think, Charlie, it also demonstrates the importance of cross-referring between different yeah. archives, some of them in Germany, as we've seen. It's, you know, a single archive can never hold all, all the answers. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Um, I, Ruth, uh, mm. Sorry, Rose is giving us, for those of you, um, just take a look at the chat, lovely reminiscences. Um, I think it was Anna who's going to be doing an oral archive, but uh, Rose, you should definitely be in touch um, about that. Um, the journey took only three hours in the 1980s, just by the way. Um, sorry, I interrupted somebody else. Sigrid, was it you? Or... Well, no? may, may, may I yes, ask? Yes, of course, of course, yeah. May, yes, may please, I... please do. Can I? Speak? Yes, of course, of course. Yes. Okay, I, I, I see you looking at a different side, so I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> now, I have, I have a, a, a question about um, the community of uh, Dartington. I mean, I'm, I'm ever since I've known about Dartington, I'm fascinated by this utopian place, and, um, um, uh, and of, it's quite obvious that people who lived there were very happy. Uh, they were very fort fortunate. Um, to endure, to uh, to live in in such troubled times, and and be cared for, and and even earn some money, and have good company, etc. I mean, it's it's a wonderful, absolutely wonderful place. But um, I, I was trained as a theatre historian, and therefore I'm interested in people and in uh, in sort of um, communication between people. And this afternoon, I've learned from. Um, from uh, from Mr. Um, um, uh, sorry, Williamson about Rene Halkett, um, mm -hmm. who um, I wasn't aware that Halkett was an early Bauhaus student, mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't aware that Sukop, the um, uh, uh, the sculptor, uh, came from Vienna. Now um, Suski must have had a a lot to say to both of them because Halkett he probably knew quite well from because there was only about a hundred a handful of students at the Bauhaus at the time and um, Slutsky had uh, uh, lived up uh, or grown up in, in, in Vienna as a jeweler um, he came to Vienna in 1905 and stayed there until 1919 um, so that's uh, quite a long while and of course they would have had 
intercourse and they would talk about things they had places they had seen and people they had known etc um and i would i'm simply curious um and i mentioned myself secretly Sigurd Leder, and and of course um, yours came to hamburg as well they've met at the künstlerfeste and laban who was who, who, who built up his his big uh, dancing company in hamburg I mean, there were lots of connections, and I wonder, I would like to go through all these um, documents in, um, uh, at Dartingen and see what kind of um, links all these people had together. Um, how many, how many um, meetings uh, could have happened? Uh, what, did they, what they could have told? Where were, were they, the court of what we call in German Schnittmenge, uh, the, the overlapping? Um, mm. of their biographies, the overlapping of their biographies. I mean, it's, I, I don't, any other place where this could be reconstructed in, in such a way. Um, I'm very curious about that. And I wonder whether someone or some, some of them later, uh, people might uh, work about this. And another very short question, does anybody know more about Dartington as a place for practical education? Um, there was not only Slutsky who taught uh, how to do metalwork, but there was at the vicinity of, of, of Dartington, there was also Bernard Leach, one of the greatest potter of the 20th century. Um, though part of it, he, he went with Mark Toby, he went to Japan, at a, but he was also there at some time. Um, was pottery, for example, um, something that was educated at, at, at Dartington, possible, or what, textile. I haven't heard about uh, a, a, a young artist, lady, um, who taught textile design. Um, I'm sure it existed, but um, uh, Dartington should not only be remembered for dance and, and music and, and or for intellectual pursuits or biology or whatever, but also for practical education, because that's really what was felt lacking at those years, in those times, and it's lacking today. There was a fantastic art department when I was there in, eight, in the 80s, okay. and we, we collaborated very, very closely with them. Uh, and... Um, Who is think. speaking now? This is, it's Rose Hawkins again, a former pupil. There. I'm sorry, I should have put my hand up. But ah, it was, it was, it okay, was thank you. very, very rich and active. And a lot of us collaborated between the three departments, music, theatre and art, during those years in the 80s. I don't know how long the art degree was there, but I could think of some names that I could feed via Monica to you about that time. And... Chris, I'm trying to think what the name was of the... Is Jane here? Jane Fitzgerald? She is. Jane, I don't know if you can... Do you remember the name of the head of department, Jane? Chris, somebody? Oh. Maybe we should focus on the nineteen on the 1930s and the war years. I mean, my yeah. impression oh, I is you mean, yeah. Yeah. there was plenty of hands-on activity as an integral part of what the school was all... You know, what the place was all about. I mean, one paper I was hoping to have, and again, the speaker couldn't make it on the day, as it were, is Tim Wilcox talking about Lucy Ree. Yeah, uh, yeah it's a slightly, again, slightly tenuous, a bit like Gropius, a sort of a slightly tenuous connection, but she did actually work with Bernard Leach. They neither of them much admired each other's work, but that's sort of almost by the by the way in this particular context. But there was that sort of practical interaction between the two of them in Dartington. Yeah, so, you know, if there is to be an anthology, I would certainly want to bring in pottery as well. And Etienne, I don't know, do you remember? I mean, was pottery something that you actually did in a practical way? Can I just say something about the pottery? Yes, uh, of course. Sorry, this is me. We had a... Um, just to say, we we had a wonderful pottery teacher called Bernard Forrester. Okay, sorry, I'm not sure who that is talking. Painted. 